Christ the Healer. The book Christ the Healer has been for many years a blessing to thousands of sick and suffering. In recent years, there has been an increasing demand for an audio presentation of this famous book. Here now is Bob Bosworth, son of the late F. F. Bosworth, reading from Christ the Healer. This presentation of Christ the Healer is an audio reproduction of the book written by my father so many years ago. These sermons were first published in response to urgent requests from ministers and others in the cities of the United States and Canada, where Bosworth revival campaigns had been conducted. They were prepared under great pressure and weariness from continuous revivals. Since each chapter was originally a sermon, Certain foundation truths were repeated in various ways to lay a groundwork for deeper truths. It was intended, through such repetition, that the understanding of the reader would become so saturated as to drive out certain erroneous teachings embedded by faithless and impotent traditionalism. My father made no pretense as to literary style, possessing only a limited education, but through a God-given gift of simple presentation, he stated these deep and logical arguments. This is why this book has become the greatest classic on the subject of divine healing, and a textbook in church Bible classes, Bible schools, and seminaries. Realizing that most of his ministry had been given to those living in America, F. F. Bosworth, at the age of 75, went to Africa, determined to spend the rest of his life sharing these marvelous truths with those in foreign lands who had been neglected. It would surprise the world if they could read the continuous stream of wonderful testimonies that have come from around the world. Dad received more than 225,000 letters from radio listeners and friends, most of whom he never saw. The truths discussed in this book, together with the prayer of faith, have brought healing within the grasp of many thousands of sufferers who could not have recovered without the direct action of the Holy Spirit. To God be all the glory. While we rejoice in these miracles, we remember that they are only external manifestations of a thousand times greater and more precious miracle, which has transpired within the sacred chamber of the inner man. The inner cause is so much more precious than the outward effect. Physical results from prayer are like figures in a bank book, which show that you have gold deposited in the bank. The gold is more valuable than the figures. Little did I realize that when I published the first popular paperback edition of the book Christ the Healer, what a surge of new interest would be generated. Many men of God have been aware that the Reformation has never been completed, that God seems to be systematically working toward a return to New Testament faith and simplicity so as to eternally silence man's excuse of ignorance of God's message. Fundamental Christianity has suffered great damage through the efforts of some theologians to excuse their own spiritual impotence through relegating everything supernatural into an imaginary transition period of dispensational truth which cannot be scripturally proven. It can only be substantiated through their own interpretation of isolated passages and is perpetrated through blind traditionalism, not unlike that which Christ himself faced. Yet deep within the hearts of sincere men there is a longing to rescue the book of Acts from becoming nothing more than a historical record, and to put it back in its proper place as a pattern for the modern church, whereby God can continue to confirm his word and give proof of the resurrection of his Son in this day of universal unbelief. When the first simple truths concerning God's attitude toward sickness and human suffering came to my father as a result of intensive study of Scripture, it was like a bright light in traditional darkness. Not only did God illuminate Scripture, but he confirmed his word through Dad's personal ministry, healing those beyond the help of medical science, and producing in their lives a depth and holiness of living that could not be attributed to Satan or to man. I'm sure my father did not realize that the truth received was fifty years ahead of its time, and only after it had been proven through his life and ministry could it be used as a major contribution in God's reformation process of returning supernatural power to his church. Medical science has made great strides in its efforts to alleviate human suffering. 
And yet the accelerated pace of our modern society continues to take its toll on the bodies of men, producing sickness beyond man's ability to help. The demands for sufficient doctors, hospitals, beds, and cures grow with increasing pressure, and many new drugs and medicines are creating new problems. The population explosion has caused problems of poverty, malnutrition, and epidemic disease that can only intensify the message that man needs a healer God. How the Father nature of God must long for man to return to the security and simple faith of pure fellowship with Him, taking His word as fact that can be fully trusted. It is within the context of human need that the greatest message of this book shines forth as a beacon in a faithless world. The Church basically has only one message, that in all things our Heavenly Father can be trusted to honor His Word. Beyond just the message of divine healing, this book clearly presents the principles of faith in a way whereby every Christian can discover and possess, through the benefits of Calvary, all that Adam lost. It is to hungry, needy men everywhere that we present this series, Christ the Healer. Lesson 1. To Those Needing Healing before anyone can have a steadfast faith for the healing of their body, they must be rid of all uncertainty concerning God's will in the matter. Appropriating faith cannot go beyond one's knowledge of the revealed will of God. Before attempting to exercise faith for healing, one needs to know what the scriptures plainly teach, that it is just as much God's will to heal the body as it is to heal the soul. The sermons in this series point out and explain those portions of scripture which will forever settle this point for you. It is only by knowing that God promises what you are seeking that all uncertainty can be removed and a steadfast faith is made possible. His promises are each a revelation of what God is eager to do for us. Until we know what God's will is, there is nothing to base our faith on. It is important that the mind of those seeking healing be renewed so as to be brought into harmony with the mind of God as revealed in the Bible and pointed out in the following lessons. Faith for the appropriation of God's promised blessings is the result of knowing and acting on God's Word. This is what we read in Romans 10, verse 17. The right mental attitude, or the renewed mind, as seen in Romans 12, too, makes steadfast faith possible to all. There is a constant stream of testimonies coming from those who, though prayed for repeatedly without success, are afterwards wonderfully healed while studying these lessons. Many have also been happily converted while hearing these instructions. The truths discussed in this series, together with the prayer of faith, have brought healing within the grasp of many thousands of sufferers who could not have recovered without the direct action of the Holy Spirit. To God be all the glory. While we rejoice in these miracles, we remember that they are only external manifestations of a thousand times greater and more precious miracle which has transpired within the sacred chamber of the inner soul. The inner cause is so much more precious than the outward effect. External results from prayer are like figures in a bank book which show that you have gold deposited in the bank. The gold is more valuable than the figures. Jesus said, the word is the seed. It is the seed of the divine life. Until the person seeking healing is sure from God's word that it is God's will to heal him, he is trying to reap a harvest where there is no seed planted. It would be impossible for a farmer to have faith for a harvest before he was sure the seed had been planted. It is not God's will that there shall be a harvest without the planting of the seed without his will being known and acted upon. Jesus said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Freedom from sickness comes from knowing the truth. God does nothing without his word. He sent his word, and it healed him, are the words of the Holy Spirit in Psalm 107, verse 20. All his work is done in faithfulness to his promises. For each sick person to know that it is God's will to heal him 
is the seed which is to be planted in his mind and heart. It is not planted until it is known and received and trusted. No sinner can become a Christian before he knows that it is God's will to save him. It is the word of God planted and watered and steadfastly trusted, which heals both soul and body. The seed must remain planted and be kept watered before it can produce its harvest. For one to say, I believe the Lord is able to heal me, before he knows from God's word that he is willing to heal him, is like a farmer saying, I believe God is able to give me a harvest without any seed being planted and watered. God can't save the soul of a man before the man himself knows God's will in the matter, because salvation is by faith, that is, by trusting the known will of God. Being healed is being saved in a physical sense. Praying for healing with the faith-destroying words, if it be thy will, is not planting the seed, it's destroying the seed. The prayer of faith which heals the sick is to follow and not precede the planting of the seed, or the word upon which alone faith is based. It is the gospel which the Holy Spirit says is the power of God unto salvation, in all its phases, both physical and spiritual. And all the gospel is for every creature and for all nations. The gospel does not leave a man in uncertainty, praying with an if it be thy will. It tells him what God's will is. The Holy Spirit's words, Himself bear our sicknesses, Matthew 8, verse 17, are just as truly a part of the gospel as His words, Who His own self bear our sins on His own body on the tree, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Neither the spiritual nor the physical phase of the gospel is to be applied by prayer alone. Seed is powerless until it is planted. Many, instead of saying, pray for me, should first say, teach me God's word, so that I can intelligently cooperate for my recovery. We must know what the benefits of Calvary are before we can appropriate them by faith. David specifies, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. After being sufficiently enlightened, our attitude towards sickness should be the same as our attitude towards sin. Our purpose to have our body healed should be as definite as our purpose to have our soul healed. We should not ignore any part of the gospel. Our substitute bore both our sins and our sicknesses, that we might be delivered from them. Christ's bearing our sins and sicknesses is surely a valid reason for trusting Him for deliverance from both. When in prayer we definitely commit to God the forgiveness of our sins, we are to believe on the authority of His Word that our prayer is heard. We are to do the same when praying for healing. First, we must be sufficiently enlightened by the promises of God. Secondly, as commanded by Jesus in Mark 11:24, we simply believe our prayer is heard before we have yet experienced the answer. Thirdly, we can always bring to pass the fulfillment of any divine promise by the observance of Hebrews 10, verse 35 and 36. That is, cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. It says in Hebrews 6, verse 11 and 12, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. It is God's will for every Christian to successfully practice this. Between the time we definitely commit to God the healing of our body, the actual completion of our healing, we can and should learn one of the most valuable lessons of our Christian life, and that is how to observe Hebrews 10, verse 35 and 36 that we just quoted. Only divine promises can make our faith steadfast. After Jonah had prayed for mercy, he did not cast away his confidence, just because there was yet no visible proof that his prayer was answered. No, he held fast his confidence and added to it, in advance, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Jonah chapter 2, verse 9. In Hebrews 13, 15, the Holy Spirit commands us all to do this continually. God's promises work their wonders while we see and act on eternal realities, on His faithfulness, 
and refuse to be affected by temporal things to the contrary. God always fulfills His promises when He can get the right cooperation. He always accepts us and undertakes for us when we observe Hebrews 10, 35, and 36, and Mark 11, 24, where it says, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. With long life will I satisfy him as God's promise to be appropriated by all, according to Psalm 91, verse 16. In the fourth chapter of Proverbs, from the 20th to the 22nd verses, we have most comprehensive instructions as to how to receive healing. Listen to it. Attend to my words. Incline thy ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. The word of God cannot be health to either soul or body before it is heard, received, and attended to. Notice here that the words of God are life only to those that find them. If you want to receive life and healing from God, take time to find the words of Scripture which promise these results. When God's Word becomes health to all your flesh, your cancer will be gone, your tumor will be gone, your goiter will be gone. The Word, when received and acted upon, will produce these results again and again. The flesh of thousands today is not healthy flesh because they have failed to find and attend to that part of God's Word which produces healing. This is the divine method of receiving the blessings which God has provided for us. Many have failed to receive healing simply because they have not followed this method. God says that when we do, as we are told in Scripture, His words are made health to all our flesh. It does not matter what particular kind of unhealthy flesh, whether cancer, goiter, tumor, or any, anything else. God says, health to all their flesh. Whose flesh? To those who find and attend to the words of God on the subject. This is exactly the same way that the word of God becomes health to the soul. We cannot look two ways at once. In this comprehensive passage, God tells us exactly how to attend to his words. He says, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Instead of having your eyes on your symptoms and being occupied with them, let not God's words depart from thine eyes. That is, look at them continually. Like Abraham, wax strong in faith by looking at the promises of God and at nothing else. As the only way seed can do its work is by being kept in the ground, so the only way that God's imperishable seed can effectively work in us is by its being kept in the midst of our hearts. This does not mean occasionally, but continuously. The reason why many have failed is because they have not done this. We must do as farmers do. When we attend unto God's word, not by letting them depart from before our eyes and by keeping them in the midst of our hearts, the seed is in good ground, the kind of ground in which Jesus says, it bringeth forth fruit, and where Paul says, it effectually worketh. When the farmer gets his seed into the ground, he doesn't dig it up every day to see how it's doing, but says, I'm glad that's settled, and believes that the seed has begun its work. Why not have the same faith in the imperishable seed, Christ's words, which he says are spirit and life? Believe that they are already doing their work without waiting to see. If the farmer, without any definite promise, can have faith in nature, why can't the Christian have faith in the God of nature? The psalmist says, Thy word hath quickened me. Paul says that it is the word which effectually worketh in them that believeth. Every word of God is spirit and life, and will work in us when we receive and attend to it. When we receive and obey the word of God, we can say with Paul, The power of God worketh in me mightily. In this way, the Word of God becomes the power of God. It is spirit and life. If a field in which the seed has been sown could talk to us, it would say, The seed worketh in me mightily. This passage in Proverbs shows us three essential things as the method of obtaining results from the promises of God's Word. First, there must be the attentive ear. Incline thy ear 
unto my sayings. There must be the steadfast look. Let them not depart from thine eyes. There must be the enshrining heart. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. When your eyes are upon your symptoms and your mind is occupied with them more than with God's words, you have in the ground the wrong kind of seed for the harvest that you desire. You have in the ground the seed of doubt. You're trying to raise one kind of crop with another kind of seed. It is impossible to sow tares and reap wheat. Your symptoms may point you to death, but God's word points you to life. You just cannot look in these opposite directions at the same time. The question is, which kind of seed do you have in the ground? Let not God's word depart from thy eyes. Keep it in the midst of thine heart. That is, look steadfastly and continuously, and only at the evidence God gives for your faith. God says to all incurables, Every one that looketh shall live. The word looketh is the continuous present tense. It does not mean a mere glance, but it means, Let his words not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. The motives that call for our attention are exceedingly powerful. It is our Heavenly Father who speaks. All heaven is behind His words. The things which are spoken are of quickening and invigorating virtue. They are life to such as find them in health, not only to the soul but to the body, not to a particular part of it, but to all their flesh. An effective medicine to cure a single part of the body might make the research scientist wealthy. Here's a medicine for all the flesh, from your head to your feet. Here's a physician of infinite ability who healeth all thy diseases. After you have planted your seed, you believe it is growing before you see it grow. This is faith which is the evidence of things not seen. In Christ we have perfect evidence for faith. Any man or woman can get rid of their doubts by looking steadfastly and only at the evidence which God has given for our faith. Seeing only what God says will produce and increase faith. This will make it easier to believe than to doubt. For the evidences for faith are so much stronger than those for doubting. Listen, don't doubt your faith. Doubt your doubts, for they are unreliable. What a blessing it is to look steadfastly to Christ. There is life and liberty, love, joy, guidance, wisdom, understanding, perfect health, in fact, everything. In a steadfast look at the crucified one, no one ever looks in vain to the great physician. Every one that looketh at the brazen serpent, the type of Christ, lived, and their faces were not ashamed, says the psalmist. They were all, humanly speaking, incurable but they were both forgiven and healed by looking. He who trusts Christ has no need to be ashamed of his confidence. Time and eternity will both justify his faith. These studies will show those needing healing just what part of the word of God they are to receive and to attend to. Some have miraculously been healed while hearing the next message in this series. Lesson 2 answers this question. Did Jesus redeem us from our diseases when he atoned for our sins? Before we start this lesson, please note, if you have been taught to regard sickness as a thorn in the flesh, which must remain, we would urge you to listen to the lesson on Paul's thorn before you hear any other message. Otherwise, you'll likely miss the force of the scriptural arguments presented in other parts of this series. Before answering the question in our title, From the Word of God, I invite your attention to a few facts taught in the Scriptures which bear on this subject. The Scripture declares in Romans 5.12 that by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. Here it is plainly stated that death entered the world by sin. Therefore it is clear that disease, which is the beginning of death, entered into the world by sin. Now, since disease entered by sin, its true remedy must be found in the redemption of Christ. Since all sickness is the oppression of the devil, according to Acts 10, verse 38, what power, when nature fails,
can remove it but the power of the Son of God. As soon as disease has advanced beyond the power of nature to renew us, it will result in death in every case unless removed by the power of God. This all honest physicians will admit, for they can only claim the power to assist nature, not to heal it. In this event, anything that would hinder the power of God thus supplementing nature would make recovery impossible. Accordingly, James says, Confess your faults one to another, that ye may be healed. This means that otherwise you cannot be healed. When disease has advanced beyond the power of nature to renew, neither nature nor the physician, nor even prayer, can save the sufferer until he confesses his sins, unless God, for some sovereign purpose of his own, removes the disease. Since disease is a part of the curse, its true remedy must be the cross, for who can remove the curse but God, and how can God justly do it, except by substitution? The Bible teaches, as one writer puts it, that disease is the physical penalty of iniquity, but that Christ has borne in His body all our physical liabilities on account of sin, and that therefore our bodies are released judicially from disease. Through Christ's redemption, we may all have, as a part of the earnest of our inheritance, the life also of Jesus, made manifest in our mortal flesh, to supplement nature until our work is finished. In the same way that we may receive the first fruits of our spiritual salvation, we can receive the first fruits of our physical salvation. Now, to the question, did Jesus redeem us from our diseases when He atoned for our sins? If, as some teach, healing is not in the atonement, why were types of the atonement given in connection with bodily healing throughout the Old Testament? In the twelfth chapter of Exodus, why were the Israelites required to eat the flesh of the Passover lamb for physical strength, unless we can receive physical life or strength from Christ, who Paul says is our Passover, sacrificed for us? 765 years after the institution of the Passover, we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 20, that the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people when they kept the Passover. Accordingly, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11.30, speaks of the failure of the Corinthians to rightly estimate the body of Christ our Passover as the reason why many among them were weak and sickly. I've quoted mainly from Weymouth's translation. The Lord's Supper is more than an ordinance, because we may partake of Christ while we are partaking of the emblems of His death and its benefits. In Christ there is both bodily and spiritual life, and surely there is no better time for availing ourselves of the privilege of having the life also of Jesus made manifest in our mortal flesh, according to 2 Corinthians 4.11. Healing is taught in the Old Testament types. In Leviticus 14, verse 18, we read, of the priest making atonement for the cleansing of the leper. Why an atonement for the leper's healing, if healing for us is not in the atonement of Christ? The types in Leviticus, 14th and 15th chapters, show us that it was invariably through atonement that sickness was healed. This, to our mind, is a complete and sufficient answer to the question we are discussing because all of these typical atonements point to and prefigure Calvary. Again, Jesus tells us in Luke 4, verse 19, that He was anointed to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, referring to the Old Testament type of, of the year of Jubilee. This shows us that the year of Jubilee is strikingly typical of gospel blessings, for here He Himself applies the year of Jubilee to the gospel era. Leviticus 25, verse 9, shows us that no blessing of the year of Jubilee was to be announced by the sounding of the trumpet until the Day of Atonement. On this day a bullock was slain as a sin offering, and the mercy seat sprinkled with blood. No mercy was offered until the blood of the Atonement sprinkled the mercy seat, because it would be a judgment seat if not sprinkled with blood. This teaches us that no mercy or blessing of the gospel is offered to us irrespective of Christ's atonement. Through the fall we lost everything. Jesus recovered all through His atonement. 
It was on the Day of Atonement that God said, Ye shall return every man to his possession. The order in the year of Jubilee is first the atonement, then the sounding of the trumpet of the Jubilee, with the glad tidings, Ye shall return every man to his possession. So now the order is the same, first Calvary, then the gospel trumpet, that he bear our sins and bear our sicknesses and so forth, to be sounded to every creature, showing us that we may return every man to his possession. God's seven redemptive names, one of which is Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that healeth thee, shows us what lost possessions every man may return to during his dispensation. The two outstanding possessions to be restored during the gospel era are health for the soul and body. Therefore, forgiveness and healing were offered universally whenever Christ preached the acceptable year of the, of the Lord in order that the inner and outer man might be whole and ready for the service of God, thoroughly furnished unto every good work, so they could finish their course. Some of the fundamentalists who attack Christian scientists for believing we can be saved irrespective of Calvary make exactly the same blunder when they say they believe in healing but that it is offered irrespective of Calvary. It is to me, as well as to them, a mystery how anyone can say that the blood of Christ was just as efficacious flowing in his veins as it was shed, especially in the face of every bleeding sacrifice of the Old Testament to the contrary, and the statement, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Adopt a bloodless religion, and you have a religion of ideas, and nothing but a human thrill. Joy unspeakable and full of glory can never be known except by those who have been saved through the blood of Christ. It is just as great a mystery to me how these fundamentalists can say that healing is bestowed without reference to Christ's death. The salvation of any part of man without sacrifice is unknown in Scripture. If bodily healing is offered and is to be preached irrespective of Calvary, why was it that no blessing of the year of Jubilee was to be announced by the sounding of the trumpet until the Day of Atonement? Paul tells us that it is in him that all the promises of God are yea and amen, which is another way of saying that all the promises of God, including His promise to heal, owe their existence and power exclusively to the redeeming work of Christ. Now, healing is not deferred until the millennium. Some ministers are trying to relegate bodily healing to the millennial day, but Je Jesus said, This day, not the millennial day, is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. It was in the church, not the millennium, that God set or established teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, and so forth. None in the church will need healing during the millennium, because they will receive glorified bodies before the millennium, when they are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, when this mortal puts on immortality. If we're going to relegate healing to the millennium, we shall have to do the same with teachers, and so forth, that God set in the church with the gifts of healing. To say that healing is only for the millennium is synonymous with saying that we are now in the millennium, because God is healing many thousands in this day. God's all-inclusive promise is to pour His Spirit upon all flesh during the acceptable year of the Lord, which is the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. He comes as Christ's executive to execute for us all the blessings of redemption, to bring to us the earnest or first fruits of our spiritual and physical inheritance until the last enemy, which is death, is destroyed, thus admitting us to our full inheritance. Faith comes by hearing. The reason why many of the sick in our day have not returned to their physical possessions is that they have not heard the trumpet sound on this truth. Faith cometh by hearing, and they have not heard because many ministers had their gospel trumpet put out of order while in the theological seminary. They remind me of a man who played a trombone in a brass band. At the beginning of a rehearsal, the boys put a small nail into the mouthpiece of his horn, so that when he blew, his breath went against the head of the nail, making it impossible for him to produce much sound out of the horn. But he went through the whole rehearsal without discovering what was wrong. Some preachers, like this man, think that they are blowing their gospel trumpet all right and have not discovered that there is not half as much coming out of it as there ought to be. They are not, like Paul, declaring the whole counsel of God. As here in Leviticus, the types show that healing 
was invariably through atonement. So Matthew 8.17 definitely states that Christ healed all diseases on the ground of the atonement. The atonement was his reason for making no exceptions while healing the sick. He healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Since it is our sicknesses he bore, his atonement embraces us all. It would require the healing of all to fulfill this prophecy. Jesus is still healing all who come to him with living faith, that it might be fulfilled. Since in the darker age of the types they all had the privilege of being healed, surely in this better dispensation with its better covenant and better promises, God has not withdrawn this Old Testament mercy. If so, we are robbed that much by the coming and the atonement of Christ. In Numbers 16, verses 46 through 50, after 14,700 had died of the plague, Aaron, as priest, in his mediatorial office, stood for the people between the dead and the living and made it an atonement for the removal of the plague, the healing of the body. So Christ, our mediator, by his atonement, redeemed us from the plague of sin and sickness. Again, in Numbers 21, verse 9, we read of the Israelites, all healed by looking at the brazen serpent which was lifted up as a type of the atonement. If healing was not to be in the atonement, why were these dying Israelites required to look at the type of the atonement for bodily healing? Since both healing and forgiveness came through the type of the atonement, why not to us through Christ, the antitype? As their curse was removed by the lifting up of the brazen serpent, so Paul tells us in Galatians 3.13 that ours is removed by the lifting up of Christ. Again, in Job 33, verses 24 and 25, we read, I have found a ransom for atonement. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. Here we see Job's flesh was healed through an atonement. Why not ours? Again, David opens the 103rd Psalm by calling upon his soul to bless the Lord and to forget not all his benefits. Then he specifies, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. How does God forgive sin? Of course, through the atonement of Christ. He heals disease in the same way, because the atonement of Jesus Christ is the only ground for any benefit to fallen man. How can God save any part of man except through the atonement? In 1 Corinthians 10.11, Paul tells us, All these things happen unto them for examples, or types, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world or ages are come. In Galatians 3, verse 7, going down to verse 16, and then going on to verse 29, the Holy Spirit shows us clearly these things are for Gentiles as well as for Israel. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And if ye Gentiles be Christ's, ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and with the household of God. The Reverend Daniel Bryant in his book, Christ Among Our Sick, says, The church then learned what the church needs. It seems to learn again, namely, that there is no difference to the compassionate Christ between a sick Gentile and a sick Israelite. To me, another unanswerable argument that healing is in the atonement is to be found in the seven redemptive names of Jehovah, on pages 6 and 7 of the Schofield Bible, Mr. Schofield, in his footnote on the redemptive name, says that the name Jehovah is distinctly the redemptive name of deity and means the self-existent one who reveals himself. These seven redemptive names, he says, point to a continuous and increasing self-revelation. He then says, In his redemptive relation to man, Jehovah has seven compound names which reveal him as meeting every need of man for his lost estate to the end. Since it is his redemptive relation to us, 
that these names reveal, they must each point to Calvary where we were redeemed, and the blessing that each name reveals must be provided by the atonement. This the Scripture clearly teaches. The following are the seven redemptive names. First, Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is there or present, revealing to us the redemptive privilege of enjoying His presence. He says, Lo, I am with you always. That this blessing is provided by the atonement is proven by the fact that we are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Second, Jehovah Shalem, the Lord our peace, reveals to us the redemptive privilege of having His peace. Accordingly, Jesus says, My peace I give unto thee. This blessing is in the atonement, because the chastisement of our peace was upon Him when He made peace by the blood of His cross. Jehovah Rea is translated, The Lord is my shepherd. He became our shepherd by giving His life for the sheep. Therefore, this privilege is a redemptive privilege purchased by the atonement. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide an offering, and Christ was the offering provided for our complete redemption. Jehovah Nissi means the Lord is our banner or victor or captain. It was when by the cross Christ triumphed over principalities and powers that He provided for us through the atonement the redemptive privilege of saying, Thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jehovah Tzedkenu is translated, The Lord our righteousness. He becomes our righteousness by bearing our sins on the cross. Therefore, our redemptive privilege of receiving the gift of righteousness is an atonement blessing. Jehovah Rapha is translated, I am the Lord thy physician, or I am the Lord that healeth thee. This name is given to reveal to us our redemptive privilege of being healed. This privilege is purchased by the atonement, for Isaiah in the redemptive chapter declares, Surely he hath borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. For the sake of the argument, I have reserved this name for the last. The fact is that the very first covenant that God gave after the passage of the Red Sea, which was so distinctively typical of our redemption, was the covenant of healing. It was at this time that God revealed Himself as our physician by the first redemptive and covenant name, Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that healeth thee. This is not only a promise, it's a statute and an ordinance. And so, corresponding to this ancient ordinance, we have in the command of James 5.14 a positive ordinance of healing in Christ's name as sacred and binding upon every church today same as the ordinances of the Lord's Supper and of Christian baptism. Since Jehovah Rapha is one of His redemptive names, sealing the covenant of healing, Christ, during His exaltation, could no more abandon His office of healer than that revealed by each of His other six redemptive names. Have any of the other blessings which His redemptive names reveal been withdrawn from this better dispensation? Having considered some of the types which teach healing, let us now consider the antitype, the atonement itself, as it is described in the great redemptive chapter of the 53rd of Isaiah. This is the greatest chapter of the greatest of the prophets, in which is fully stated the doctrine of the atonement. Since the types of the Old Testament taught healing, it is certainly unwarranted and illogical to place the antitype on lower ground. Before quoting from this chapter, may I state that the Hebrew words choli and makob have been incorrectly translated griefs and sorrows. All who have taken the time to examine the original text have found what is everywhere acknowledged that these two words, respectively, mean sickness and pains, everywhere else throughout the whole of the Old Testament. This word choli is interpreted disease and sickness in Deuteronomy 7, verse 15, in the 28th chapter, verse 61, in 1 Kings 17, verse 17, in 2 Kings 1, verse 2, also in the 8th chapter, verse 8, in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 12, in the 21st chapter, verse 15, in other text. The word makob is rendered pain in Job 14, verse 22, in the 33rd chapter, in verse 19, and so forth. Therefore, the prophet is saying 
in this fourth verse, Surely he hath borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. The reader is referred to any standard commentary for additional testimony on this point. But there is no better commentary than the Bible itself. Matthew chapter 8 verse 17 is the inspired commentary. That Isaiah 53 verse 4 cannot refer to disease of the soul, and that neither the words translated sickness and pain have any reference to spiritual matters but to bodily sickness alone, is proven by Matthew 8, verses 16 and 17. And he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities, and bare our sicknesses. This is an inspired commentary on this fourth verse of Isaiah 53, plainly declaring that the prophet refers to bodily ailments, and therefore the word sickness, choli, must be read literally in Isaiah. The same Holy Spirit who inspired this verse quotes it in Matthew as the explanation of the universal application by Christ of His power to heal the body. To take any other view is equal to accusing the Holy Spirit of making a mistake in quoting His own prediction. I will here quote the learned translator Dr. Young in his translation of the Bible. Isaiah 53, verse 3, He is despised and left of men, a man of pains, here the Hebrew word is makob, and acquainted with sickness, the word is choli, and as one hiding the face from us. He is despised and we esteemed him not. Surely our sicknesses, choli, hath he borne, and our pains, makob, he hath carried them, and we have esteemed him plagued, smitten of God and afflicted. And he is pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is on him, and by his bruise there is healing to us. All of us like sheep have wandered, each to his own way we have turned. And Jehovah hath caused to meet on him the punishment of us all. And Jehovah hath delighted to bruise him. He hath made him sick, the word choli. If his soul doth make an offering for guilt, he seeth seed, he prolongeth days. With transgressors he was numbered, and he the sin of many hath borne, and for transgressors he intercedeth. Dr. Isaac Lesser, the able translator of the Hebrew-English Bible, renders these verses as follows. Verse 3, He was despised and shunned of men, a man of pains and acquainted with disease. But only our diseases did he bear himself, and our pains he carried. And through his bruises was healing granted to us. But the Lord was pleased to crush him through disease. Rotherham's translation of the tenth verse is, He hath laid on him sickness. In the fourth verse, the word born, or the Hebrew word nasa, means to lift up, to bear away, to convey, or to remove to a distance. It is a Levitical word and is applied to the scapegoat that bear away the sins of the people. Leviticus 16 verse 22 says, The goat shall bear, that's the word nasa, Upon him all our iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. So Jesus bore our sins and our sicknesses away, without the camp, to the cross. Sin and sickness have passed from me to Calvary. Salvation and health have passed from Calvary to me. Again in this fourth verse of the redemptive chapter, the Hebrew verbs for born and carried or should I say Nasa and Sabal, are both the same as they are used in the 11th and 12th verses for the substitutionary bearing of sin. He shall bear, or carry, our iniquities, and he shall bear the sin of many. Both words mean a heavy burden and denote actual substitution and a complete removal of the thing born. When Jesus bore our sins, our sicknesses and pains, he bore them away or removed them. 
Both these words mean substitution, one bearing another's load. On this point, permit me to quote from Jesus Our Healer, a splendid track written by the Reverend W.C. Stevens. He says, This prophecy presents healing as an integral part of the vicarious atonement. Now, whatever be the sense of these two Hebrew verbs, nasa and sabal, the same sense must be applied in both cases, namely of sin-bearing and sickness-bearing. To pervert the sense in one case would give liberty to pervert it in the other. And let the sense of the verbs as relating to sin, not only here in this prophecy, but everywhere else in the Old Testament, is strictly vicarious and expiatory. No evangelical student disputes this. This prophecy, therefore, gives the same substitutionary and expiatory character to Christ's connection with sickness that is everywhere else given to his assumption of our sins. We are accordingly shut up by the Spirit to the redemptive sense of Christ's bearing of sickness. This interpretation is fully sustained by Professor Delich's exposition of Isaiah 53, verse 4. Freely but faithful does the Gospel of Matthew translate this text. Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. The help which Jesus rendered in all kinds of bodily sickness is taken in Matthew to be a fulfillment of what in Isaiah is prophesied of the servant of Jehovah. The Hebrew verbs of the text, when used of sin, signify to assume as a heavy burden and bear away the guilt of sin as one's own, that is, to bear sin mediatorily in order to atone for it. But here, where not sins but our sicknesses and our pains are the object, the mediatorial sense remains the same. It is not meant that the servant of Jehovah merely entered into fellowship with our sufferings, but that he took upon himself the sufferings which we had to bear and deserve to bear. And therefore, he not only bore them away, but also in his own person endured them in order to discharge us from them. Now, when one takes sufferings upon himself, which another had to bear, and does this not merely in fellowship with him, but in his stead, we call it substitution. Here, then, the best results of the rigid exegesis show that the bearing and removal of human disease is an integral part of redeeming work, a provision of the atonement, a part of the doctrine of Christ crucified, that Jesus is the Savior of the body as well as of the Spirit, and that He comes to make His blessings flow far as the curse is found. Bodily healing by direct divine agency becomes a boon for every believer in every period of gospel history. It settles the question of a preacher's duty to preach it. A Canadian writer objects that Matthew 8, verse 17 cannot refer to the atonement, because since Christ had not yet been crucified, this would be making Christ live an atoning life. This, to me, is no argument at all, since Christ was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. He not only healed disease before Calvary, but He also forgave sins. And yet both of these miracles were bestowed on the grounds of the atonement yet future. A prominent New York clergyman raises practically the same objection. He argues that the fact that Christ in Matthew is fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy by healing the sick proves that Jesus bore our sicknesses not on the cross, but when he was alive in the city of Capernaum. In answering this, I have only to ask, did Jesus bear our iniquities in Capernaum or on the cross? His forgiving of sins as well as our healing of the sick are both done with respect to his coming atonement, because without the shedding of blood there is no remission. The prophecy states that he hath borne our sicknesses. This includes all other as well as those at Capernaum. In verses 4 and 5 of this redemptive chapter, we see him dying for, first, our sicknesses, our pain, our transgressions, our iniquities, our peace, our healing, and by his stripes we are healed. We would have to misquote to exclude ourselves from any of these blessings. The only surely in the redemptive chapter prefaces his provision for our healing. There could be no stronger statement of our complete redemption from pain and sickness by his atoning death. If Christ, as some think, is unwilling to heal as universally during his exaltation, 
as he did during his humiliation. Then he would have to break his promise in John 14, verses 12 and 13, where it says, He that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he shall do also, and greater works. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. He just would not be Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. The fact of healing in the atonement necessitates the continuation of his healing ministry during his exaltation, because his redeeming work embraced all who live on earth while he is with the Father. Accordingly, he gives the promise to do the same, the greater works, in answer to our prayers from the position at God's right hand. As long as the church remained under the control of the Spirit, the same works continued. History reveals, as Dr. A.J. Gordon puts it, that whenever we find a revival of primitive faith and apostolic simplicity, there we find evangelical miracles that surely characterize the apostolic age. The apostle tells us, He was made sin for us who knew no sin, that is, no sin of his own. Likewise, he hath made him sick for us, who knew no sickness of his own. Peter writes, Who his own self bare our sins on his own body in the tree. Isaiah declares, Surely our sicknesses he hath borne, and our pains he hath carried them. But as Leeser translates, Only our sicknesses did he bear, having none of his own. Again, in the fourth verse of Dr. Young's translation, we read, And Jehovah hath caused to meet on him the punishment of us all. One person asked on this point, What are the punishments of sin? And then says, in substance, All will admit that sin is punished by soul condemnation, remorse, mental anxiety, and frequently by sickness. And they believe these are remitted because of vicarious atonement. By what rule of scripture or reason is the last mentioned punishment severed from the rest? Mark the prophet's words, Jehovah hath caused to meet on him the punishment of us all. Since sickness is a part of that punishment, it is demonstrated by the immutable word of God that sickness is included in the atonement. He then asks, Is it true that God will give deliverance from every penalty and consequence of sin except one, and that this one sickness must inevitably remain to the bitter end? Away with such a thought. Isaiah affirms that the entire punishment of us all was caused to meet on him. He testified, It is finished. There was nothing incomplete about the work of our mighty Jesus. I might add to this that, were it otherwise, the prophet would have said, Jehovah hath caused to meet on him only a part of the punishment of us all. The cross is a perfect remedy for the whole man. Jesus went to the cross, spirit, soul, and body, to redeem man, spirit, soul, and body. Every form of sickness and disease known to man was included, and many of them even mentioned in the curse of the law, Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 62, and other scriptures. Now in Galatians 3.13, we have the positive statement that Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on the tree. What plainer declaration could we have than that Christ, who was born under the law to redeem us, bore its curse, and therefore did redeem us from all sickness and disease? Here it is stated that it was on the cross that Jesus redeemed us from the law's curse. In other words, he redeemed us from the following diseases specified in Deuteronomy, consumption or tuberculosis, fever, inflammation, the botch of Egypt, plagues, all the diseases of Egypt, and every disease and every plague which is not written in the book of this law. This would include cancer, influenza, mumps, measles, and every modern disease. If Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law and sickness is included in the curse, surely he redeemed us from sickness. Redemption is synonymous with Calvary. Therefore, we are redeemed from the entire curse, body, soul, and spirit, solely through His atonement. Now, since disease is a part of the curse, how could God justly remove this part of the curse by healing the sick without first redeeming us from it? Again, since Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, how can God justify us and at the same time require us to remain under the law's curse, when, as the Apostle says, 
you're not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6, verse 14. In short, why should anyone remain under the law's curse who is not under the law? To do so would be the same as putting a man in prison for life after he had been proven innocent and the court had justified him from the charge of murder. Paul argues in Romans, the third chapter, that God hath set forth Christ to be a propitiation, that he might be just, and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. In other words, were it not for the atonement, God would be unjust in justifying the sinner. And likewise, he would be unjust in healing the sick without first redeeming them from the sickness. The fact that God ever healed anyone is to me the best proof that healing was provided by the atonement. If healing was not provided for all in redemption, how did all the whole multitude obtain from Christ the healing that God did not provide? The Word says He healed them all. Now there's an important question. If the body were not included in redemption, how can there be a resurrection? How can corruption put on incorruption or mortal put on immortality? If we have not been redeemed from sickness, would we not be subject to disease in heaven if it were possible to be resurrected irrespective of redemption? Someone has well remarked, man's future destiny being both spiritual and bodily, his redemption must be both spiritual and bodily. Why should not the last Adam take away all that the first Adam brought upon us? Now let us consider a few gospel parallels. Let us mentally draw two parallel columns. First, Adam, by his fall, brought sin into our souls. Adam, by his fall, brought disease into our bodies. Sin is therefore the work of the devil. Disease is therefore the work of the devil. Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil in the soul. Jesus was manifested to destroy the works of the devil in the body. The redemptive name Jehovah said Kenyu reveals his redemptive provision for our souls. The redemptive name Jehovah Rapha reveals his redemptive provision for our bodies. On Calvary, Jesus bare our sins. On Calvary, Jesus bare our sicknesses. He was made sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5.21, when he bare our sins, 1 Peter 2, verse 24. He was made a curse for us, Galatians 3.13, when he bare our sicknesses, Matthew 8.17, who his own self bare our sins in his body on the tree, by whose stripes ye were healed. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? Who healeth all thy diseases? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your spirit. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 6.20 The spirit is bought with a price. The body is bought with a price. Is remaining in sin the way to glorify God in your spirits? Is remaining sick the way to glorify God in your body. Since he bare our sins, how many must it be God's will to save when they came to him? Whosoever believeth. Since he bare our sicknesses, how many must it be God's will to heal when they come to him? He healed them all. In the Lord's Supper, the wine is taken in remembrance of his death for our souls, 1 Corinthians 11.25. In the Lord's Supper, the bread is eaten in remembrance of his death for our bodies, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 and 24. The sinner is to repent before believing the gospel unto righteousness. James 5, 16 says, Confess therefore your sins, that ye may be healed. Water baptism stands for total surrender and obedience. Anointing with oil as a symbol of the sign of consecration. The sinner must accept God's promise as true before he can feel the joy of salvation. The sick must accept God's promise as true before he can feel well. As many as received him were born of God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. As many as touched him were made whole. Mark chapter 6, verse 56. 
I'll now cite one of many of hundreds of cases of sickness and affliction that have been healed while the sufferers listened to the preaching on the subject of healing in the atonement. Their healing came through their own faith while having an opportunity of being anointed. When but a child of eight, Mrs. Clara Rupert of Lima, Ohio, had such a severe case of whooping cough that she ruptured the muscles of one eye, leaving it entirely blind, and so dead that during all the years that followed she could rub her finger on the bare eyeball without pain. She said that on a windy day, when particles would blow into the eye, it caused her no suffering. While listening to a sermon on the atonement during a revival in Lima, Ohio, she said in her heart, If that is true, it is because the Bible says so. Then I am just as sure of receiving sight in my blind eye tonight when I go to the altar as I was sure of salvation when I went to the Methodist altar several years ago and was saved. Accordingly, with this logical reasoning, she came to the altar and while others were being prayed for, she asked God to heal her. Before there was a chance to anoint her, she was on her feet weeping and walked back and threw her arms around her father's neck. The audience wondered why she left the altar without being anointed. Her father said, What is the matter, daughter? And she replied, My eye. He said, Why, is it paining you? She said, No, I can see perfectly. A few months later, this woman and her husband were attending Bible school, preparing for the work of the Master. Her husband wanted to preach the gospel of Christ, who had so graciously healed his wife. Many of the most godly and able teachers of the church have seen and taught them. In addition to those teachers already quoted, I will add a few words from Dr. Torrey and others. Dr. R. A. Torrey, in his book on divine healing, declares, The atoning death of Jesus Christ secured for us not only physical healing, but the resurrection and perfecting and glorifying of our bodies. The gospel of Christ has salvation for the body as well as for the soul. Just as one gets the first fruits of his spiritual salvation in the life that now is, so we get the first fruits of our physical salvation in the life that now is. Individual believers, whether elders or not, have the privilege and the duty to pray one for another in the case of sickness with the expectation that God will hear and heal. Dr. R. E. Stanton, the former moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, gives the following in his Gospel Paralysms. It is my aim to show that the atonement of Christ lays the foundation equally for deliverance from sin and for deliverance from disease. That complete provision has been made for both, that in the exercise of faith under the conditions prescribed, we have the same reason to believe that the body may be delivered from sickness, that we have that the soul shall be delivered from sin. In short, that both branches of the deliverance stand on the same ground, and that it is necessary to include both in any true conception of what the gospel offers to mankind. The atoning sacrifice of Christ covers the physical as well as the spiritual needs of the race. Healing of the body is not, therefore, a side issue as some represent it. It is no more this than the healing of the soul is a side issue. They are both parts of the same gospel based equally upon the same great atonement." Unquote. In the report of the Commission on Spiritual Healing appointed by the Episcopal Church is the following statement, quote, The healing of the body is an essential element of the gospel and must be preached and practiced. God wills our health, that the Church, the body of Christ, has the same commission and the same power as the head, that we churchmen, with this true conception of God as creative love, must now give a sinning and suffering world this full gospel of salvation from sin and its inevitable consequences." Unquote. These conclusions were arrived at by this scholarly commission after three years of study and research. Bishop Charles H. Brent of the Episcopal Church, who was head of all chaplains in France, led the religious life of United States armies overseas, and he affirms, He who waves away the healing power of Christ as belonging only to the New Testament times is not preaching the whole gospel. God was and is the Savior of the body as well as of the soul. James Moore Hickson pleads, quote, A living church is one in which the living Christ lives and walks, doing through its members what he did in the days of his flesh. 
it must therefore be a healing church as well as a soul-saving church. Spiritual healing is sacramental. It is the extension through the members of his mystical body of his own incarnate life. Unquote. The late able writers, Dr. A. B. Simpson, Andrew Murray, A. T. Pearson, Dr. A. J. Gordon, and many uh, present writers whom we might quote, have been teachers of healing in the atonement. An unknown writer has said, On the cross of Calvary, Jesus has nailed the proclamation, Deliver from going down to the pit or the grave, for I have found an atonement. Job 33, verse 24. Isaiah begins the redemption chapter with the question, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And the report follows that he bore our sins and sicknesses. The answer to the question is, Only those that have heard the report could believe it, because faith cometh by hearing. Since Jesus died to save and to heal, it is surely worth reporting. The purpose of this message is to prove that healing is provided by the atonement and is therefore a part of the gospel which Christ commanded to be preached to all of the world, to all nations, to every creature, with all power, throughout all the days, even until the end of the present age. Lesson 3 asks this question. Is healing for all? Is it still the will of God, as in the past, to heal all who have need of healing? and to fulfill the number of their days. The greatest barrier to the faith of many seeking bodily healing in our day is the uncertainty in their minds as to it being the will of God to heal all. Nearly everyone knows that God does heal some, but there is much in modern theology that keeps the people from knowing what the Bible clearly teaches, that healing is provided for all. It is impossible to boldly claim by faith a blessing which we are not sure God offers because the power of God can be claimed only where the will of God is known. It would be next to impossible to get a sinner to believe unto righteousness before you had fully convinced him that it was God's will to save him. Faith begins where the will of God is known. If it is God's will to heal only some of those who need healing, then none have any basis for faith unless they have a specific revelation that they are among the favored ones. Faith must rest on the will of God alone, not on our desires or wishes. Appropriating faith is not believing that God can, but that God will. Because of not knowing it to be a redemptive privilege for all, most of those in our day when seeking healing add to their petition the phrase, If it be thy will. Among all those who sought healing from Christ during his earthly ministry, we read of only one who had this kind of theology. This was the leper who said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. The first thing Christ did was to correct his theology by saying, I will, be thou clean. Christ's I will cancel his if, adding to his faith that Christ could heal him the faith that he would. The theology of this leper before Christ enlightened him is almost universal today because this part of the gospel is so seldom and so fragmentarily preached. We see from almost every conceivable angle throughout the scriptures that there is no doctrine more clearly taught than that it is God's will to heal all who have need of healing and that they may fulfill the number of their days according to his promise. Of course, we mean all who are properly taught and who meet the conditions prescribed in the Word. Now I hear someone say, If healing is for all, then we shall never die. Why not? Divine healing goes no farther than the promise of God. He does not promise that we shall never die, but he says, I will take sickness away from the midst of them. The number of thy days will I fulfill. Exodus 23, verse 25 and 26. Psalm 90, verse 10 says, the days of our years are threescore years and ten. Psalm 102, verse 24 says, Take me not away in the midst of my days. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 17 says, Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Then someone may ask, Well, how is a man going to die? 
Psalm 104, verse 29 says this, Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. The Reverend P. Gavin Duffy writes on this point, quote, He has allotted to a man a certain span of life, and his will is that life shall be lived out. I want you to recall that all those he carried back from the dead were young people who had not lived out their fullness of years. And in that very fact we may see his protest against premature death. Of course, we must not expect that the old shall be physically young. But if the allotted span has not been spent, we have a right to claim God's gift of health. And even though it be past, if it is his will that we should continue here for a time longer, it is equally his will that we should do so in good health. The poet Douglas Maylock writes, Death comes, and then we blame our God, and weakly say, Thy will be done. But never underneath the sod has God imprisoned anyone. God does not send disease, or crime, or carelessness, or fighting clans. And when we die before our time, the fault is man's. He is a God of life, not death. He is one God that gives us birth. He is not shortened by a breath the life of any on the earth. And he would have us dwell within the world our full allotted years. So blame not God, for our sin makes our own tears. If we would know what is in a will, let us read the will. If we want to know God's will on any subject, let us read his will. Suppose a lady should say, My husband, who was very rich, has passed away. Now I wish I knew whether he left me anything in his will. I would say to her, why don't you read the will and see? The word testament, legally speaking, means a person's will. The Bible contains God's last will and testament in which he bequeaths to us all the blessings of redemption. And since it is his last will and testament, anything later is a forgery. A man never writes a will after he's dead. If healing is in God's will for us, then to say that the age of miracles is past is virtually saying what is the opposite of the truth that a will is no good after the death of the testator. Jesus is not only the testator who died, he was resurrected and is also the mediator of the will. He's our lawyer, so to speak, and he will not beat us out of the will, as some earthly lawyers would do. He's our representative at the right hand of God. For the answer to the question under consideration, let us look away from modern tradition and go to the word of God, which is a revelation of his will. In the fifteenth chapter of Exodus, just after the passage of the Red Sea, which typified our redemption and was written for our admonition, God gave his first promise to heal. This promise was for all. God named the conditions. The conditions were met, and we read, He brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among all their tribes. It is here that God gave the covenant of healing, revealed by and sealed with his first covenant in redemptive name, Jehovah Rapha, translated, I am the Lord that healeth thee. This is God's word, settled in heaven, a never-changing fact concerning God. Who is authorized to change God's will? To say that this privilege of health is not for God's people today is to change God's I am to I was Jehovah Rapha who has the authority to change God's redemptive names. Instead of abandoning his office as healer, he is Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, under this first covenant name as well as under the other six. The blessings revealed by his redemptive names, as we have seen in the preceding study, were provided by the atonement when he tasted death for every man. Therefore they cannot be confined to Israel. This fifteenth chapter of Exodus shows us that at least in the age of the world, 3,500 years ago, God did not leave people in doubt concerning his willingness to heal them all. Israel was a nation without one feeble person. This universal state of health continued as long as God's conditions were met. Then, 20 years later, according to Numbers 16, verse 46 to 50, when, because of sin, the plague destroyed 14,700, they again met the conditions. The plague was stayed, and he was still Jehovah Rapha, the healer, not to some, but to all. It would not be true that the plague was stayed 
if it remained on even one of them. This state of health remained uninterrupted until 19 years later, when the people, not satisfied with God's way for them, that had been chosen in love and mercy, spake against God and against Moses, and they were cursed with the fiery serpents. When they again met God's conditions by confessing their sins, His word through Moses to them was, It shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, the brazen type of Calvary, shall live. The scriptures show us that it was God's will to heal not some, but all. Every one that was bitten lived by beholding the brazen serpent, which was a typical foreshadowing of the coming sacrifice upon Calvary in our behalf. The psalmist David, in his time, understood healing to be a universal privilege. In the 86th Psalm, he says, For thou, Lord, art good, plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. We shall see in the following lesson that healing was one of the most prominent mercies throughout the Scriptures, and that the sick in the New Testament ask for mercy when seeking healing from Christ. God's mercy covers man's physical as well as spiritual nature. Therefore, Jesus, according to the Old Testament promise, showed that he was plenteous in mercy by healing not some, but all who came to him. Again, in the 103rd Psalm, we see that David believed that the mercy of healing was as universal a privilege as the mercy of forgiveness. He calls upon his soul to bless the Lord, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Who healeth all is as permanent as who forgiveth all. For the identical language is used with reference to both mercies. In the 91st Psalm, God says concerning the man that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High, With long life will I satisfy him. Is the privilege of dwelling in the secret place only for a few or for all? If it is for all, then God's promise to all is, With long life will I satisfy him. God would have to break this promise to be unwilling to heal his obedient children in middle life. If dwelling in the secret place was possible in a darker age of the world, surely it is in this better age of grace during which he is able to make all grace abound toward each of his children. The holy prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of the grace that should come to us. Calvary meets all man's needs. We have seen in the great redemption chapter, the 53rd of Isaiah, that it is our sickness as well as our sins that Jesus bore making one privilege as universal as the other. What Jesus did for individuals who came to him for blessings was for them, but what he did on Calvary was for all. It is clear that in all of these statements cited from the Old Testament that it was God's will to heal all who met the conditions. Wherever forgiveness was offered, healing was also offered. Let those who teach the people that God's will in the matter is not the same today answer the question, why should God withdraw this Old Testament mercy from this better dispensation? Is it not to be expected that he who hath reserved better things for us, and who is the same yesterday and today and forever, should continue these same mercies throughout this better dispensation? Let us now look in the New Testament and see Christ, the expression of God's will. There is no better way of ascertaining the proper answer to the question before us than by reading the Gospels. They record the teachings and works of Christ. He was the expression of the Father's will. His life was both a revelation and a manifestation of the unchanging love and will of God. He literally acted out the will of God for Adam's race. He said, I came down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me, and that the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. He also said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Therefore, when he healed the multitudes who thronged him day after day, we see the Father revealing his will. When he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them, he was doing and revealing the will of God for their bodies. Perhaps no one would be more conservative than the scholars of the Episcopalian Church. And yet the commission appointed to study the subject of spiritual healing and report back to the church after three years of study and research in both the Bible and history, say in their report, 
The healing of the sick by Jesus was done as a revelation of God's will for man. Because they discovered that his will is fully revealed, they further say, No longer can the church pray for the sick with the faith-destroying qualifying phrase, If it be thy will. The message everywhere taught in the gospel is one of complete healing for souls and bodies, for all who come to him. Many today say, I believe in healing, but I do not believe it is for everyone. If it is not, how could we pray the prayer of faith for any, or even for one, whom it is God's will to heal until we have a revelation by the Spirit that we are praying for the right one? If it is not God's will to heal all, then no man can ascertain the will of God for himself from the Bible. Are we to understand from these teachers that we must close our Bibles and get our revelation direct from the Spirit before we can pray for the sick because the will of God cannot be ascertained from the Scriptures? This would be virtually teaching that the whole of divine activity on the line of healing would have to be governed by the direct revelation of the Spirit instead of by the Scriptures. How are the sick to be healed if there is no gospel or good news of healing to proclaim to them as a basis for their faith? Or, since faith is expecting God to keep His promise, how can there be faith for healing if there is no promise in the Bible that the sick person can apply to himself? The Scriptures tell us how God heals the sick. Psalm 107, verse 20 says, He sendeth His word and healeth them, and delivereth them from their graves. The Bible says, The word of God which effectually worketh in them that believe, and is health to their flesh. See 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 12, and Proverbs 4, verse 22. Faith rests on more than mere ability. If a millionaire were to appear before an audience of a thousand people with the announcement that he was able to give each a thousand dollars, this would be no basis for faith for any uh, to have the thousand dollars. Faith cannot rest on ability. If he should go further and say, I will give fifty of you a thousand dollars each, even then there is no basis for anyone in the audience to have faith for the thousand dollars. Were you to ask one of them if he or she were fully assured of receiving a thousand dollars from the millionaire, the answer would be, I need the money, I hope I'm among the lucky ones, but I cannot be sure. But should the millionaire say, it is my will to give all a thousand dollars each, then everyone in the audience would have a ground for faith, and would undoubtedly say to the rich man, thank you, I'll take my money. Now supposing God were a respecter of persons, and that it was his will to heal only some of those who need healing. Let us take a glance through the Gospels and see how the friends of the sick decided which of the sick to bring to him for healing. Quote, now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with divers diseases brought them unto him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Luke 4, verse 40. Here the unlucky ones, if there were any, were brought and all healed the same as the others. Surely it was God doing and revealing his own will. If you had been there and were sick, you would have been brought and would have been healed with the rest because they brought them all. Matthew in his record of the same instance tells why Jesus made no exceptions. He healed them all that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of Isaiah the prophet saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. The word are means everybody in the sacrifice of Calvary, and it therefore requires the healing of all to fulfill the prophecy. Not only on this occasion, but on every occasion, down until today, he heals the sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Let the sick go through the Gospels and note the alls and the everies, and they will see that the redemptive blessing of healing was for all, and that no one ever appealed in vain to Jesus for healing. There never was a multitude large enough to have in it one that Jesus wanted to remain sick and would not heal. Listen to the message of God's Word. Matthew 4, verse 23 to 25 says, from Moffat's translation, And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching and preaching the gospel, and healing all manner of diseases, and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils. 
and those which were lunatic, and those that had palsy, and he healed them all. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee, and from Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond Jordan. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching and preaching the gospel, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Matthew 9, verse 35 to Matthew 10, verse 1. Note here that it was the multitudes coming for healing that necessitated the thrusting forth of new laborers into his harvest to preach and to heal. It was not long until seventy more were needed and were sent forth to heal as well as to preach. Matthew 17:15 says, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and healed their sick. Matthew 14, verse 14. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round about, and brought unto him all that were diseased, and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Matthew 14, verse 34 to 36. And a great multitude of the people, out of all Judea and Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and they that were vexed with unclean spirits. And they were healed, and the whole multitude sought to touch him. For there went virtue out of him, and healed them all. Luke 6, verse 17 to 19. We see throughout the Gospels that in bringing the sick to Christ for healing, it was repeatedly stated that they brought them all, which included all the unlucky ones, if there were any. If, according to modern tradition, it is God's will for the sick to patiently remain sick for His glory. Is it not strange that there should not be even one in this class in all these multitudes brought to Christ for healing? By healing the epileptic, Mark 9, verses 14 to 29, Jesus proved it to be the Father's will to heal even this one whom the disciples, divinely commissioned to cast out demons, failed to deliver. We see by this verse that it would have been wrong to call in question and to teach God's unwillingness to heal because of this failure on the part of the disciples. Jesus, by healing him, shows them that the failure proved nothing but unbelief. Peter, after three years of constant association with the Lord, describes his earthly ministry in this one brief statement. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Acts 10, verse 38. So in these and many other scriptures, which show he healed them all, we have the will of God revealed for our bodies, and the answer to the question, is healing for all? Compassionate love was Jesus' ruling motive. Many in our day have been taught that Christ performed miracles of healing just to show his power and to prove his deity. This may be true, but it is far from being all the truth. He would not have had to heal all to show his power. A few outstanding cases would prove this. But the scriptures show that he healed because of his compassion and to fulfill prophecy. Others teach that he healed the sick to make himself known. But in Matthew 12, verse 15 and 16, we read, Great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all, and charged them that they should not make him known. Some who have to admit that Jesus healed all who came to him hold that Isaiah's prophecy concerning his bearing our sicknesses refers only to his earthly ministry, that this universal manifestation of his compassion was special and not a revelation of the unchanging will of God. But the Bible clearly teaches that he only began to do and teach what was not only to be continued but augmented after his ascension. After Christ, for three years, had healed all that came to him, he said, it is expedient or profitable for you that I go away. How could this be true if his going away would modify his ministry to the afflicted? Anticipating the unbelief with which this wonderful promise would be regarded, 
he prefaced his promise to continue the same and greater works in answer to our prayers after his exaltation with the words, Verily, 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 I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. And how are we to do them? Whatsoever ye ask the Father in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14, verse 12 and 13. In other words, we are to do them by asking the Father in his name, so that he can do them. He did not say less works, but the works and greater works. To me, this promise from the lips of Christ is a complete answer to all opposers and to all their books and articles against divine healing. It is written was Christ's policy when resisting the devil. William Jennings Bryan well asked, Since Christ said it is written, and the devil said it is written, why can't the preacher say it's written? The Bible reveals the wisdom of the early church. The early church took Christ at his word and prayed unitedly for signs and wonders of healing until the place was shaken where they were assembled, and then they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folk, and they which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. All that Jesus began to do and to teach, he was here continuing from the right hand of God through his body, the church, according to his promise. Some say, oh, that was only in the beginning of the Acts for the purpose of confirming their word regarding Christ's resurrection. Let us then turn to the last chapter of Acts and read how, thirty years later, after Paul on the island of Melita had healed the father of Publius, all the other sick people on the island came and were cured. So we see again, at this time, in the very last chapter of the Acts of the Holy Ghost, which is the only unfinished book of the New Testament, that it is still the will of God to heal, not some, but all. The Holy Spirit, whom Christ sent as his successor and executive, took possession of the church, which is the body of Christ, and showed the same healing power after Pentecost that Christ had displayed before. Vast multitudes were healed. As in the Gospels, so in the Acts. We never read of any asking for healing and being denied. Men have named this book the Acts of the Apostles. A better and a truer name for this book would be the Acts of the Holy Ghost, because it records the Acts of the Holy Spirit through others as well as the Apostles. Philip and Stephen, who were not Apostles, were as gloriously used as Peter and John. The Holy Spirit came to execute for us all the blessings purchased by Christ's redemption and pledged by the seven redemptive names. He has never lost any of his interest in the work he came to do. If you wish to know how he wants to act today, read how he did act. The book of Acts shows us how he wants to act throughout all the days, even until the end of the age. It was the Holy Spirit who worked all the miracles of healing at the hands of Christ. Jesus never undertook a miracle until, in answer to his prayer, the Holy Spirit, the miracle worker, came upon him. Then, in full reliance upon the Spirit, he cast out devils and healed the sick. The miracles of Christ were all done by the Spirit in advance of the Spirit's own dispensation, or before he had yet entered officially into office. Why would the Holy Spirit, who healed all the sick before his dispensation began, do less after he entered office? Did the miracle worker enter office to do away with miracles during his own dispensation? Is the teaching and the practice of the church in the matter of healing in this Laodicean or lukewarm period of her history a truer expression of the will of God than the teaching and practice of the early church while under the full sway of the Spirit? Decidedly not. I do not hesitate to say that modern theology has robbed the Holy Spirit of a part of his ministry. Now in summing up what we have studied this far, we have a revelation from many angles of Christ's merciful attitude toward our sicknesses and infirmities since his exaltation at the right hand of God. We deal now not with the past, but only with Christ's present attitude toward sickness and disease. First, Christ's present attitude is fully revealed by his redemptive name Jehovah Rapha. His redemptive names cannot change. All will admit that his other six redemptive names 
are a revelation of his present attitude in the matter of bestowing the blessing that each name was given to reveal. By what logic, then, can we suppose that he has abandoned his office as healer, revealed by the name Jehovah Rapha? Second, his present attitude is again fully revealed by his own definite promise to continue and augment his healing ministry in answer to the prayer of believers while he is at the right hand of God. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go to my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Third, his present attitude is revealed by his own fulfillment of the promise that we've just mentioned recorded in the book of Acts. Even in the last chapter, thirty years after his ascension, we read, All the other sick people in the island came and were cured. Acts 28, verse 9, from Weymouth's translation. Fourth, his present attitude is revealed by the fact that healing is a part of the gospel that Christ commanded to be preached to all the world, to all nations, to every creature, throughout all the days, even unto the end of the present age. This commission is followed by the promise, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Fifth, his present attitude is revealed by the fact that his substitutionary work on Calvary was on behalf of all those who live now on earth during his exaltation at the right hand of the Father. We have seen in the preceding message that as in Leviticus it is recorded that all disease was healed on the ground of the atonement. So Matthew tells us that the atonement was Christ's reason for making no exceptions in healing the sick who came to him. Sixth, his present attitude is revealed by the plain command to any sick in the church while he is with the Father to ask for anointing and prayer with the promise, the Lord shall raise him up, James 5.14. Does he mean we shall pray with faith or without it? How can we pray the prayer of faith unless it is his will to heal? Or does he command us to pray for a thing he will not do? Right here, even laymen are commanded to confess their faults one to another and pray one for the other for healing, with the determination that Elijah prayed for rain, James 5, verses 16 through 18. Would God command us to thus persevere in prayer for that which is not His will? Certainly not. Seventh, His present attitude is revealed by the fact that it is since His exaltation that He set or established in the church teachers, miracles, gifts of healings, and so forth, for the continuance of the same works and greater works, which He promised He would continue from God's right hand. History records the manifestation of these miraculous gifts since the days of the apostles right down to the present time. Eighth, his present attitude toward sickness is wonderfully revealed by the fact that since his exaltation, his compassion has neither been withdrawn nor modified. In a following message on the subject of the Lord's compassion, we shall see that during the earthly ministry of our Lord, he was everywhere moved with compassion and healed all that had need of healing. The same Greek word that is translated mercy is also repeatedly translated compassion, for they are the same. When two blind men asked for mercy, Jesus was moved with compassion and healed them. Since bodily healing in the New Testament is everywhere a mercy, that is, it being a mercy or compassion that moved him to heal all that came to him, is not the promise still true that he is plenteous in mercy to all that call upon him? Does not this glorious gospel dispensation offer as much mercy and compassion to its sufferers as did the darker dispensation? The Reverend Kenneth Mackenzie, a noted teacher and writer of the Episcopal Church, asks on this point, quote, Could the loving heart of the Son of God who had compassion upon the sick and healed all that had need of healing cease to regard the sufferings of his own when he had been exalted at the right hand of the Father? Unquote. There is an absurd feature of modern theology. Is it not strange that anyone in this better age of grace should take a position that would be synonymous with saying that the manifestation of Christ's compassion to the afflicted has been withdrawn or even modified 
since his glorification? If God is not as willing to show the mercy of healing to his worshipers as he is to show the mercy of forgiveness to his enemies, then he is more willing to show mercy to the devil's children than to his own. The scriptures deny this by saying the mercy or compassion of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, not upon the sinner alone, but upon them that fear him. For he loves his own sick and suffering child even more than he loves the sinner. Thank God his mercy or compassion is unto all generations. Ninth, his present attitude is revealed by the fact that in the Old Testament year of Jubilee, which Jesus, in the fourth chapter of Luke, applies to the Gospel era, it was every man who was told to return to his possession. As in the year of Jubilee, its blessings were for every man. So in the Gospel era, its blessings are for every creature. This is more fully developed in the preceding message. Tenth, his present attitude is also revealed by the fact that he hath redeemed us, and that means all of us, from the curse of the law, Galatians 3, verse 13. We have seen in the preceding lesson that this curse included all the diseases known to history. How can God justify us and at the same time require us to remain under the curse from which he redeemed us? 11. His present attitude is revealed by the fact that the Holy Spirit and His work in us is the earnest or interest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, Ephesians 1.14. We have already pointed out that because our eternal destiny is both spiritual and bodily, our redemption also must be. Therefore, we cannot receive our full inheritance until the coming day of redemption, but thank God by being filled with the Spirit we now have the earnest of it. Paul tells us we have the first fruits of the Spirit, and these are manifested both spiritually and physically. The first fruits of the Spirit include the earnest of immortality, which is a foretaste of the resurrection. Since our bodies are members of Christ, His glorified bodily life is as truly linked with our bodies as His spiritual life is linked with our spirits. The same life that is in the vine is in its branches. And in Christ, the true vine, there is both spiritual and bodily life. It is only by bringing into our bodies some of the same life that he is to bring at the resurrection that the Spirit can be the interest on our inheritance to the body. Since our inheritance includes a glorified body, what must the earnest be? Thank God the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our mortal flesh immortal life touching our mortal bodies with a foretaste of redemption to enable us to finish our course so that we may receive a full reward. 12. Does not nature itself reveal the present attitude of Christ toward the healing of our bodies? Nature everywhere is healing, or at least doing her best to heal. As soon as diseased germs enter our bodies, nature begins to expel them, break a bone or cut a finger, and nature will do her utmost to heal and usually succeeds. Now, has God commanded nature to rebel against His own will? If sickness is the will of God for His children, would it not seem that He has done this? If sickness, as some think, is the will of God for His faithful children, then it is sin for them to even desire to be well, to say nothing of spending thousands of dollars to defeat His purpose. I truly thank God for all the help that has ever come to sufferers through the physician, through the surgeon, the hospital, and the trained nurse. But if sickness is the will of God, then to quote one writer, every physician is a lawbreaker, every trained nurse is defying the Almighty, every hospital is a house of rebellion instead of a house of mercy, and instead of supporting hospitals, we ought to do our best to close every one of them. If the modern theology of those who teach that God wants some of his worshipers to remain sick for his glory is true, then Jesus, during his earthly ministry, never hesitated to rob the Father of all the glory he could by healing all who came to him. The Holy Spirit, likewise, robbed him of all the glory he could by healing all the sick in the streets of Jerusalem. And Paul, too, robbed God of all the glory he could by healing all the sick on the island of Melita, Many today hold that God afflicts even the obedient because He loves them, making sickness a love token from our Heavenly Father. 
If this is true, why do they try to get rid of his love token? Why does not the one suffering with a cancer pray for the second blessing for themselves and also ask him to bl thus bless his wife, his children, his father, his mother, neighbors, and so forth? Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Does not God sometimes chasten his people through sickness? Decidedly, yes. When we disobey God, sickness may be permitted through the Father's loving discipline. But God has told us just how it may be avoided and averted. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31 and 32. These chastenings come to save us from final judgment. But when we see the cause of our chastening and turn from it, God promises it shall be withdrawn. As soon as we judge ourselves or learn our lesson, the absolute promise is we shall not be judged. By self-judgment we may avoid chastening. Divine healing is not unconditionally promised to all Christians regardless of their conduct. It is for those who believe and obey. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimony. Psalm 25, verse 10. 13. Christ's attitude now is shown by the fact that he was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. Think of his leaving heaven and making the awful transition of becoming a man, and of all the suffering and sacrifice that followed. What was the purpose that moved him in all this? The scripture gives the answer. For this purpose that he might destroy the works of the devil. This purpose includes the healing of all that were oppressed of the devil. Acts 10, verse 38. Since he was glorified, has he relinquished this purpose, which he retained even during the bloody sweat of Gethsemane and the awful tortures of Calvary? Does he want the works of the devil that he formerly wanted to destroy to remain in our bodies? Can it be that he now wants a cancer, a plague, a curse, the works of the devil, in the members of Christ, the temples of the Holy Ghost? If not, why has he commanded any sick in it to be anointed in his name for healing? Since the body is for the Lord, a living sacrifice unto God, would he not rather have a well body than one that is a wreck? If not, how can he make us perfect in every good work to do his will? Is God's express will that we may abound unto every good work that we may be prepared unto every good work, thoroughly furnished unto every good works, zealous of good works, and careful to maintain good works only for well men and women? If for all, he would have to heal the sick to make this possible, because no man can abound unto every good work while confined to a sick room. 14. His present attitude is revealed in the very meaning of the word salvation. The word soteria, which is the Greek word for salvation, implies deliverance, preservation, healing, health, soundness, and in the New Testament is applied sometimes to the soul and at other times to the body only. The Greek word sozo, translated saved, also means healed, made sound, made whole. In Romans 10 verse 9 it is translated saved. In Acts 14.9, the same word is translated healed in referring to the healing of the man lame from birth. Both Greek words for salvation and saved both mean spiritual and physical salvation or, in other words, spiritual and physical healing. Paul in Ephesians 5 verse 23 states, He is the Savior of the body. Is this for some or for all? Dr. Schofield, in his footnote on the word salvation, says, Salvation is the great inclusive word of the gospel, gathering into itself all the redemptive acts and processes. The word, therefore, includes our possession and enjoyment of all the blessings revealed by his seven redemptive names. In fact, these names were given to show that our, what our salvation includes. It is, therefore, the gospel of healing for the body as well as for the soul which is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. In lesson four, we are discussing the Lord's compassion. I'd like to read from Psalm 145, verse eight and nine. 
The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. In the study of the Lord's compassion, we have, to my mind, a complete revelation of the Lord's willingness to heal. During His earthly ministry, He was everywhere moved with compassion and healed all them that had need of healing. It is this same Jesus who, after saying, It is expedient for you that I go away, is now seated at the right hand of God, that he might be merciful or compassionate and faithful high priest for us. In the scriptures, compassion and mercy mean the same. The Hebrew noun, rechamin, is translated both mercy and compassion. The Greek verb, eleio, is translated have mercy and have compassion. And likewise, the Greek adjective, eleemon, is defined merciful and compassionate. To have compassion is to love tenderly, to pity, to show mercy, to be full of eager yearning. The text we quoted begins with, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. These sentiments concerning the nature of God are expressed over and over throughout the Scriptures. More than anything else, God is love. The most conspicuous statements in the Scriptures about our Heavenly Father are the declarations concerning His love, His mercy, and His compassion. There is no note that can be sounded concerning God's character that will so inspire faith as this one. In revivals, faith rises mountain high when the truth of God's present love and compassion begins to dawn upon the minds and the hearts of the people. It is not what God can do, but what we know He yearns to do that inspires faith. By showing His compassion everywhere in the healing of the sick, Jesus unveiled the compassionate heart of God to the people, and the multitudes came to Him for help. Oh, how treacherously Satan has worked to hide this glorious fact from the people. He has broadcasted the unscriptural, illogical, and worn-out statement that the age of miracles is past, until he has almost succeeded in eclipsing the compassion of God from the eyes of the world. Modern theology magnifies the power of God more than it magnifies His compassion. His power more than it does the great fact that the exceeding greatness of His power is to usward. But the Bible reverses this and magnifies His willingness to use His power more than it does the power itself. In no place does the Bible say that God is power, but it does say God is love. It is not faith in God's power that secures His blessings, but faith in His love and in His will. God's love has been veiled by modern theology. The first statement in our text is, The Lord is gracious, meaning He is disposed to show favors. This glorious fact that shines with such brilliancy throughout the Scriptures has been so eclipsed by modern theology that we hear everywhere the Lord is able instead of the Lord is gracious. Hundreds needing healing have come or written, saying concerning their need of deliverance, The Lord is able. But their teachings, as well as their lack of teaching, has kept them from knowing that the Lord is willing. How much faith does it take to say the Lord is able? The devil knows God is able, and he knows he's willing, but he has kept the people from knowing the latter fact. Satan is willing that we magnify the Lord's power because he knows that this is not sufficient basis for faith. But he knows the Lord's compassion and willingness is. Before praying for the healing of people, we have to first teach them the Word of God until they can say, The Lord is gracious, instead of the Lord is willing. This is exactly what Jesus had to do before healing the leper, who said, If thou wilt, thou can. He showed his willingness so that the man could really expect healing. In the preceding message, we have presented many scriptural proofs of the Lord's present willingness to heal. But even when we can advance from saying He is able to saying He is willing, this is still not enough. The word willing is too tame to express God's merciful attitude toward us. Micah 7.18 says, He delighteth in mercy. We have His attitude more fully expressed in 2 Chronicles 16.9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward Him. This text exhibits our Lord as not only being willing, but eager to pour His blessings 
in great profusion upon all who make it possible for him to do so. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, or, in other words, he is ever hunting for opportunities to gratify his benevolent heart, because he delighteth in mercy. Benevolence is the great attribute of God. Therefore, if you want to please him, remove the obstacles out of the way of the exercise of his benevolence. He is infinitely good, and he exists forever in the state of entire consecration to pour forth blessings upon his creatures whenever they make it possible. Suppose the vast Pacific Ocean were elevated high above us. Then conceive of its pressure into every crevice to find an outlet through which it might pour its ocean tides over the earth. And you have a picture of God's benevolent attitude toward us. After being first properly enlightened, I challenge you to place yourself where God's mercy can reach you without his having to violate the glorious principles of his moral government. Then, wait and see if you don't experience the most overwhelming demonstration of his love and mercy. The blessing will flow until you have reached the limit of your expectation. Cornelius placed himself where God's mercy could reach him by saying to Peter, We are all here present before God to hear all the things that are commanded thee of God. He found God's goodness so great that he could not wait for Peter to finish his sermon. Just as soon as Peter had spoken enough to be a basis for their faith, down came the blessing. Not only is God able, but he is also willing to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. His love is so great that it could not be fully gratified by blessing all the holy beings in the universe. Therefore, it is extended to his enemies throughout the whole earth. It seems to me that God would rather we should doubt his ability than doubt his willingness. I would rather have a man who is in trouble say to me, Brother Bosworth, I know you would help me if you could, doubting my ability, than to say, I know you can, but I have no confidence in your disposition to help me. Again, our text further states that the Lord is full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. When I think of how the Lord so floods our hearts with his tender love until, in intercession for other, our hearts are too full of yearning to utter our feelings, or as the Bible says, yearnings that cannot be uttered, I stand in awe and I wonder what his compassion must be. A mother's compassion for her suffering child makes her not only willing to relieve the child, but to suffer if she cannot. The Greek word sympathes, translated compassion, means to suffer with another. Accordingly, Isaiah says, in all their affliction he was afflicted. Is it not strange that this wonderful fact of his mercy toward the sick, so clearly seen and applied during the darker ages of the Old Testament, should be overlooked and set aside in this better age, where the way is open for the fullest possible manifestations of his mercy toward every phase of human need? The benevolent heart of God reaches all. Our text, after showing the greatness of his compassion, closes with the logical conclusion, The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. In other words, he is so full of compassion that he cannot be a respecter of persons in the bestowal of his mercies. How could he, who being unable to fully gratify his benevolent heart by blessing holy beings, extend his mercies to the wicked of the earth? and withhold the common blessing of healing from any of his own obedient children. What a strange doctrine that the sick are not to look for as much mercy during this age of grace, which prophets and kings desired to see and angels desired to look into, as sufferers did during the darker ages. Is God now more willing to show the mercy of forgiveness to the devil's children than he is the mercy of healing to his own? The fact is, he loves his own sick, and suffering child even more than he loves the sinner. And the mercy for compassion of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Not upon sinners alone, but upon them that fear him. Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. As the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him, as well as to the sinner. The sick Christian can say with Solomon, There is no God like thee which keepeth covenant and showeth mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee with all their hearts. Second Chronicles 6.14 Not some, but all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth 
not just unto his enemies, but unto such as keep his covenant and his testimony, Psalm 25.10. Now let us look at a few passages from the gospel showing the Lord's compassion. Mark 1, verses 40 to 45 says, And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And they came forth to him from every quarter. Here it was compassion that moved Christ to heal this leper. Matthew 14, verses 13 and 14 says, He departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. He, and he healed their sick. Here, as elsewhere, he was plenteous in mercy to all that had need of healing. It was his compassion that moved him. Matthew 20, verses 29 to 34 reads, And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou Son of David. And Jesus said, What will ye that I shall do unto you? They say unto him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. Here these blind men asked for the mercy of having their eyes open. Jesus granted unto them the mercy of healing, proving that healing is a mercy as well as forgiveness. The sick in those days, when seeking healing, asked for mercy. In our day, most people think of mercy as applied only to the sinner, not knowing that his mercy is also extended to the sick. Paul, who calls God the Father of mercies, proves it by healing all the sick on the island of Melita. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful or compassionate, for they shall obtain mercy. Job was healed when he prayed for his friends. According to one of the Beatitudes, he obtained mercy by showing it. Referring to and accounting for Job's healing, James 5.11 says, The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy, and follows with the direction to the church. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. In other words, because the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy, let any sick in the church today, as well as Job, obtain their healing also. Having provided all we need, Jesus is still saying, as he did to the two blind men, What will ye that I should do unto you? Jesus had compassion on the man in the tombs, so possessed with a legion of demons that he cut himself with stones and broke the chains with which they had often tried to bind him. When he was clothed and in his right mind, he was so glad he besought the Lord that he might remain with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Mark chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Now let us read Matthew 15, verses 30 to 31, and see the results of this one man's testimony given to advertise the Lord's compassion. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many other, and cast them down at Jesus' feet. And he healed them, insomuch that the multitudes wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, and the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see. And they glorified the God of Israel, it was not their being sick, as some teach today, but their being healed that caused these great multitudes to glorify the God of Israel. Oh, how much glory would come to God as well as blessings to the world if every minister today would present clearly the Bible promises for healing to the sick, and then as soon as each one was healed, he would in his turn publish the Lord's compassion 
throughout his Decapolis. In a short time, thousands upon thousands everywhere who are now sick would obtain faith in Christ for healing. It would then again be said of the multitudes that they glorified the God of Israel. The higher critic and the modernist would soon be unpopular, and the false healing cults would not draw away from the church the multitudes who are now being ensnared. It is not a crime to publish God's goodness. It is stated that this man published the Lord's compassion. Some oppose and write articles against those who publish the testimonies of those who are miraculously healed. What's the matter? Is there anything wrong in obeying the Lord's command to make known His deeds among the people? Since Jesus died to open the way for His mercies to reach all the needs of men, we surely ought to be willing for them to know it. One would think to read some of the books and articles that are being written that it's a crime to let people know about the Lord's compassion. You will notice what the scriptures quoted as the result of miracles of healing. His fame was spread abroad, and they came to him from every quarter. And they followed him on foot out of the cities, and great multitudes came to him. Multitudes, multitudes, great multitudes everywhere. It's the same today. Just as soon as it is known in any city that this same Jesus is actually healing the sick, as soon as the command is obeyed to make known his deeds among the people, and his compassion is published. The people come from every quarter. There is nothing that would so break down all the barriers and bring the people from every quarter as the manifestation of the Lord's compassion in healing the sick. In revivals today, it is found that as soon as the public find out that this same Jesus is doing what he did before, they come from the Methodist quarter, from the Baptist quarter, from the Catholic quarter, from the Christian Science quarter, from the Unity quarter, from the Spiritualist quarter, from the Jewish quarter from the poor man's quarter, from the rich man's quarter, from every quarter. And multitudes hear the gospel and give their lives to God who would never even attend the meetings if there were no healing miracles to reveal his compassion. If Christ and his apostles could not draw the multitudes without miracles, does he expect more from us? Instead of the ministry of healing diverting from the more important matter of salvation for the soul, Many evangelists have seen more happy conversions in a single week than they ever saw in a whole year of evangelistic work during the years before the Lord led them to preach this part of the gospel in a bolder and more public way. As soon as their revivals get underway, hundreds nightly crowd forward to give their hearts and lives to God, and whole cities are put to talking about Jesus. In a revival conducted in Ottawa, Canada, during the seven weeks of the meeting, 6,000 came for healing, and about 12,000 for salvation. I doubt if there would have been even more than 1,000 for salvation had it not been for the miracles of healing which displayed the compassion of the Lord. The city and the country were stirred as never before in its history. The largest crowds up to that time that ever gathered under one roof for the religious meetings in this capital city of Canada filled the largest building in the city. The attendance ran as high as 10,000 in a single night. Before leaving the city, many Hundreds of written testimonies were received from those healed or who were being healed from almost every kind of disease and affliction. To God be all the glory. Healing is a mighty evangelistic agency. One Baptist evangelist who, amongst other evangelists, proved this to be true, wrote in one of ten pamphlets he published on the subject that healing is the greatest evangelizing agency that the Lord ever used and that he would not return to the old way for all the money in America. Now let us look at another passage concerning the Lord's compassion. Matthew 9, verse 35 to 10, verse 8 reads, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And when he had called unto him the twelve, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease, and commanded them, saying, Go, preach, heal the sick. Hear his compassion toward the sick, 
is now becoming so well known that the harvest has become too great for the one reaper. His compassionate heart is full of yearning over the increasing numbers who could not reach him because of the press. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. It is as though he was able to personally minister but to a portion of them, and his compassion for the rest of the rapidly growing multitudes is now moving him to thrust forth other laborers to heal as well as preach. His harvest is not only the same in character in our day, but it is also much greater than when he was here. And because his compassion is still the same, he wants the same kind of reapers to reap the same harvest or results by preaching and healing in all the cities and villages. His compassion manifested through these twelve new laborers soon necessitated the thrusting forth of seventy more, empowered to preach and to heal. Laborers of this kind are few today, while the harvest truly is plenteous beyond what it was then. What he was beginning to do and to teach is exactly what he once done and taught everywhere. Instead of ending something, according to the modern idea, he was starting something, which he promised to continue and increase. Not the twentieth century gospel, but this gospel that he proclaimed, he said, shall be preached in all the world. There has been strange reversal of Christ's promise. Jesus in John 14, verse 12 and 13 emphatically taught and promised that the same mercy and compassion could reach the people through our prayers while he is a, our high priest in heaven. In fact, his departure was to open the way for his compassion to be manifested on a much larger scale. Isaiah prophesied of him, Therefore will he be exalted, that he may have mercy. Jesus said, It is expedient or profitable for you that I go away. This could not be true if his going away would withdraw or even modify the manifestation of his compassion in healing the sick. Is it not strange that many ministers today exactly reverse Christ's promise, that the same and greater work shall be done by teaching that the age of miracles is past? Others do the same by teaching that God wants some of his devout children to remain sick for his glory and many other traditional unscriptural ideas. Every man who teaches that healing is not for all who need it today, as it was in the past, is virtually teaching that Christ's compassion toward the sick has been at least modified since his exaltation. Worse yet, others teach that his compassion in healing the sick has been entirely withdrawn. To me, it is a mystery how any minister can take a position that veils and interferes with the manifestation of the greatest attribute of deity, God's compassion, which is divine love in action. When Paul would make the greatest possible appeal for consecration, he said, I beseech you by the mercies of God, which is the manifestation of his greatest attribute. Two important questions. Jesus said, When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he shall glorify me. Could the Spirit glorify Christ to the sick by telling them that the age of miracles is past, or that Jesus, since his exaltation, has withdrawn or modified his ministry to the sick after he himself promised to do the works and greater works during this age? Has the Spirit come to magnify Christ by modifying his ministry to his sick and suffering brethren while he is their high priest? This is directly contrary to the glorifying of the God of Israel in Decapolis, occasioned by the healing of the multitudes. If so, then the common practice of praying for the sick to have fortitude and patience to bear their affliction, instead of praying the prayer of faith for their healings, is right. It is since he became our high priest that he speaks from heaven seven times, saying, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Men are saying much today which the Spirit has never said, and which is the opposite of what He does say. The following are a few of the things the Spirit says for the purpose of glorifying Christ. Wherefore in all things it behooved Him to be made like unto His brethren, that He might be a merciful or compassionate and faithful high priest. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17. We have fully shown that both the words merciful and compassionate are given as the meaning of the Greek adjective eleemon, translated merciful in this passage. This verse has no reference to Christ's compassion as manifested during His earthly ministry, 
It refers only to His ministry from heaven and to the fact that His incarnation was to end, that He might show compassion as our high priest after His return to heaven. All that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day He was taken up is what, because of His unchanging compassion, He promised would continue and be greater after He went away. The Spirit further glorifies Christ by saying that He is now touched. Greek? Sympatheo with the feeling of our infirmities. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34. That he still can have compassion. Hebrews 5, verse 2. And that he is Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let us worship him, because his compassion is the same today. Because as he looks down upon our infirmities, he still moved with compassion and yearns to help us. Of course, we recognize and thank God that many who do not believe in divine healing do cooperate with the Spirit in these glorious sentiments as pertaining to the more important work of soul-saving. But how wonderful it would be if all ministers and Christians, instead of saying that the age of miracles is past, would cooperate with the Spirit by proclaiming to sufferers these glorious sentiments which the Spirit expresses while fulfilling His office of glorifying the exalted Christ. Instead of being priests and Levites, passing on the other side, the church in James 5 is commanded to be a good Samaritan, with compassion ministering to the physical needs of the sick and afflicted, binding up their wounds, pouring in the healing balm of wine and oil, that is, the Word of God and the Spirit of God. He sendeth His Word and healeth them by the power of the Spirit. Jesus pronounced woe upon the scribes and Pharisees for having omitted the weightier matter of mercy and faith. In the fifth chapter of Acts, we have another wonderful proof that Christ's compassion toward the sick is now the same. We read concerning the multitudes brought into the streets of Jerusalem in the days after He had ascended to the Father, that they were healed every one. Here it was, again as our high priest in heaven, that Jesus did exactly what he did before going away. From heaven he was moved with compassion and healed all who had need of healing. Even in the last chapter of Acts we find his compassion manifested from heaven by the healing of all on the island of Melita. While he is our high priest, his compassion is so great that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Again. His compassion for the sick, since he was glorified, moved him to set or establish in the church the gifts of faith, of miracles, and of healing for the recovery of the sick, while he is our high priest through the centuries. After Christ's exaltation, to express it in the words of Reverend W. C. Stevens, we find, as a matter of course and of necessity, gifts of healing, taking just such rank and prominence as they did in our Lord's personal ministry on earth. Again, it is His present compassion for the sick that caused Him as our High Priest and Head of the Church to command the elders and even the laymen to pray the prayer of faith for the healing of any sick during the church age. James 5, verse 14. Reverend W. C. Stevens on this point remarks, All preachers, teachers, writers, and others who hand out the word of life to people should keep this direction, that is, James 5, 14, as continuously before the people as sickness itself constantly confronts them. Even during His earthly ministry, our Lord would make any sacrifice and suffer even the curse itself in order to open the way for His compassion to reach the most unworthy and the most provoking of His enemies. Both the bloody sweat of Gethsemane and the horrible tortures of Calvary were but the manifestations of His infinite compassion. He went to Calvary with his face set like a flint. After he had been betrayed by the kiss of Judas into the hands of his crucifiers and Peter had cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest, Jesus heals the ear of his enemy and tells Peter to put up his sword. He sheathed, as it were, his own sword by holding in check the most natural impulse of his holy soul in refusing to pray when by praying he could have instantly more than twelve legions of angels to enable him to escape the agony of the cross. But then, 
there would have been only a judgment seat and no mercy seat for fallen man with all his needs of body, soul, and spirit. In his substitutionary work for us, he anticipated every possible need of Adam's race and opened the way for mercy to reach every phase of human need. He was then and is now moved with compassion toward all who need his presence as provider, peace, victory, shepherd, righteousness, and physician. These are the seven blessings secured by the tragedy of His cross and revealed to us by His redemptive names. His covenants, including the covenant of healing, are given because of His mercy, and He keepeth covenant and mercy with all who love Him to a thousand generations, according to Deuteronomy 7.9. Doubting or ignoring His love and compassion grieves the heart of Jesus. It made Him weep over Jerusalem. So many times have ministers said in these days that we do not need miracles now, thinking of miracles only as signs to prove the Lord's deity and so forth. I have said to them, if you had a cancer eating your head off, you would need a miracle, would you not? Most people today are so in the dark on this subject that it never occurs to them that there is mercy also for the sick. They never think of the gifts of healing and miracles as being the manifestation of Christ's compassion. Hour after hour and day after day, for three years, He healed all who came to Him because of His compassion. Are not the needs of sufferers today the same as they were in that day? And do they not need as much compassion as ever in the past? We think of the countless numbers in despair, suffering from such intense agony that death would be a mercy. The physicians, after doing their best, have been obliged to say, I can do no more for you. How precious it is to know that Christ's compassion every moment is still precisely as when it was manifested during the three years of His earthly ministry of love, a fact upon which we may absolutely rely. We have shown that bodily healing is a mercy which Christ who was the expression of the Father's will everywhere bestowed upon all who sought it. We have the plain declarations, the Lord is plenteous in mercy unto all, including the sick, that call upon Him, because His mercy endureth forever, and is from everlasting to everlasting. He is full of mercy over all His works. Do not these scriptures settle the matter? Instead of saying that the age of miracles is past, say, it is written. It is written. In Lesson 5, we discuss this subject, how to appropriate the redemptive and covenant blessing of bodily healing. Please note this. In this message, we are repeating a few of the statements made in our previous lesson in order that this one message shall contain enough to lay a complete foundation for faith. This is done for the benefit of some who may need the prayer of faith for their healing before they have time to listen to the entire series. The first step toward being healed is the same as the first step toward salvation or any other blessing that God promises. The sick person must know what the Bible clearly teaches, that it is God's will to heal until one has lived out the allotted span of life. Each individual sufferer must be convinced by the Word of God that his or her healing is the will of God. It is impossible to have real faith for healing as long as there is the slightest doubt as its being God's will. It is impossible to boldly claim by faith a blessing which we are not certain that God offers, because the power of God can be claimed only where the will of God is known. For instance, it would be next to impossible to get a sinner to believe unto righteousness before you had fully convinced him that it was God's will to save him. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Faith must rest on the will of God alone, not on our desires or wishes. Appropriating faith is not believing that God can, but that He will. Those who claim to believe in healing, but say one word in favor of it and ten words against it, cannot produce faith for healing. When God commands us to pray for the sick, He means us to pray with faith. We could not do this if we did not know His will in the matter. Until a person knows God's will, 
they have no basis for faith because faith is expecting God to do what we know it is His will to do. It is not hard when we have faith to get God to do His own will. When we know it is His will, it is not difficult for us to believe that He will do what we are sure He wants to do. It is in this way that every saved person has experienced the still greater miracle of the new birth. There can be no appropriation by faith until we are made to know by the gospel what God has provided for us. There is no doctrine more emphatically taught throughout the Word of God than that through the atonement of Christ both salvation and bodily healing were provided. It is God's will to take away sickness of His own people and to fulfill the number of their days according to His promise in Exodus 23, verses 25 and 26. As the types in Leviticus 14 and 15 show that it was invariably through the atonement that sickness was healed under the law of Moses, so Matthew 8.17 definitely states that Jesus healed all diseases on the ground of atonement. This scripture shows us that Christ's reason for making no exceptions while healing the sick who thronged him was his atonement, which he made for all of Adam's race, including you. As multitude after multitude pressed upon him to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, it is repeatedly stated throughout the Gospels, he healed them all. This can be seen through the following references. Matthew 4, verse 24, chapter 12, verse 15, chapter 14, verse 14, Luke, chapter 4, verse 40, Acts, chapter 10, verse 38. He could make no exceptions. Why? Because in His coming atonement, He Himself took our infirmities. Since it is our infirmities He bore, it requires the healing of all to fulfill this prophecy. God carefully put this in such language that we would have to misquote it to leave ourselves out. God's way of saving the soul, of healing the body, and of doing everything else He wants to do is to send His Word, His promise, and then keep the promise wherever it produces faith. The divine procedure in healing is stated in the text. He sendeth his word, and healeth them, and delivereth them from their graves. Psalm 107, verse 20. It is the word of God which effectually worketh in them that believeth, and is health to all their flesh. Take a look at 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 12, also at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 22. Just as a little girl's faith for a new dress comes by hearing the promise of her mother to buy it next Saturday, so faith for healing comes by hearing God's word or promise to do it. Both the little girl's faith and ours cometh by hearing. Now the little girl could not and would not be expected to have faith for the new dress until her mother promised it. So we cannot, nor are we expected to have faith for healing or salvation or any other blessing until the faith comes by hearing the word or the promise of what God wants to do. How could anyone find justification by faith until it was preached unto him? And how could anyone find healing by faith until it was preached to him? It is the scriptures which are able to make men wise unto salvation. We must see that the creator and redeemer of the body is also its physician before we have reason to expect healing. Now since he heals us by sending his word, what can be more his word than his redemptive and covenant names, which were given, all seven of them, for the specific purpose of revealing to every man in Adam's race his redemptive attitude toward them. When Christ commands us to preach the gospel to every creature, he means that we shall tell the good news of redemption. His seven redemptive names reveal what our redemption includes. He has many other names, but only seven redemptive names. And these seven names are never used in the Scripture except in His dealings with man. Not six, not eight, but seven, the perfect number, because He's a perfect Savior, His redemption covering the whole scope of human need. The blessings revealed by each of these names are all in the atonement. For instance, Jehovah Shammah means the Lord is present, made nigh by the blood of His cross. Jehovah Shalem is translated, The Lord is our peace. This is in the atonement because the chastisement of our peace was upon Him. 
Jehovah Rea is translated, The Lord is my shepherd. He became our shepherd by giving his life for the sheep. So you see, this privilege is in the atonement. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide an offering, Christ himself being the offering provided on Calvary. He became Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner or victor, by spoiling principalities and powers on the cross. He bore our sins and became Jehovah Tzitkenu, the Lord our righteousness, opening the way for every sinner to receive the gift of righteousness. Jehovah Rapha is translated, I am the Lord that healeth thee, or I am the Lord thy physician. This also is in the atonement, for himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. This completes the list of seven names which were given for the purpose of revealing God's relationship toward us, all under each of these seven titles. These seven names all belong abidingly to Christ. It is under each of these seven titles that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus says to all who come to Him for any of these seven blessings, He that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. This is the good news that God once preached to every creature so that every creature may have the privilege of enjoying the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. I say again that nothing is more God's word settled in heaven than his redemptive name Jehovah Rapha. No one has a right to change God's I am Jehovah Rapha to I was because the word of the Lord endureth forever. Since Jehovah Shalem, the Lord our peace, is one of Christ's redemptive names, has not every man a redemption right to obtain peace from him? Has not every man a redemptive right to obtain victory from Jehovah Nissi? Has not every man a redemptive right to obtain the gift of righteousness from Jehovah Tzidkenu? If so, why has not every man a redemptive right to obtain healing from Jehovah Rapha? This name Jehovah Rapha was so accepted and believed by those to whom it was first sent that there was not one feeble person among all their tribes. Whenever this state of health was interfered with by their transgressions, as soon as they repented, typical atonements were made, and God was still Jehovah Rapha, the healer, not to some, but to all. God wants this name, as well as all others, to be sent to every creature, with the promise, They shall recover, for the Lord shall raise them up. The brazen serpent was a type of Christ, God ratified this word to the dying Israelites by sending them the added word, Every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it, the type of Calvary, shall live. If bodily healing is not provided in the atonement, why were these dying Israelites required to look at the type of the atonement for bodily healing? As their curse was removed by the lifting up of the type of Christ, so ours is removed by the lifting up of Christ the antitype. Since the Spirit is given to us to make Christ real, why should we not look to Christ himself with as much expectation as they did to the type? It will be well to note that they could not look at the brass snake and their symptoms at the same time. Abraham's faith waxed strong while he looked unto the promise of God. Some people reverse this, and their faith waxes weak while they look at their symptoms, forgetting the promise. Since God healed by sending His Word, which is the only basis for our faith, we will miss healing if we allow our symptoms to hinder us from expecting what His Word promises. The second step is to be sure that you are right with God, because our redemptive blessings are conditional. After we hear the gospel and know what it offers, Jesus says, Repent and believe the gospel. Only those who are right with God can follow these instructions. When seeking healing for our bodies, there should be no compromise with the adversary of our souls. It is He who is the author of our diseases. Jesus has not promised to destroy the works of the devil in our bodies while we're clinging to the work of the devil in our souls. It is hard to exercise faith for the removal of one part of the devil's work while we allow a worse part to remain. Until a man squarely faces and settles the question of obedience to God, he is not on believing ground. James says, Confess your faults one to another, that ye may be healed. 
It is God's will that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It is when our hearts do not condemn us that we have confidence toward God. The command for the sick to send for the elders was first written to Christians who had been filled with the Spirit. There is something wrong when a man desires the blessing but not the blesser, his mercy but not himself. It is not proper to seek his mercy while rejecting his will. Do not ask for a little blessing while rejecting the big one. It is impossible to receive and reject divine blessings at the same time. God is waiting to say to Satan and disease what he said to Pharaoh, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Our first consideration in all things, even in asking for the restoration of bodily health, should be the glory of God. Strength for service to God is the only proper basis to approach when seeking healing at His hand. The anointing with oil for healing is itself a symbol and a sign of consecration. We must desire our health for God's glory. What then does the anointing mean? Turn to Leviticus chapter 8 verses 10 to 12 and you get God's answer to the question. And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein and sanctified them. That is, he set them apart for God. The anointing with oil in the name of the Lord was an act of dedication and consecration, implying on the part of one anointed a full surrender to God of his hands to work for him and for him alone, of his feet to walk for him and him alone, his eyes to see, his lips to speak, his ears to hear for him and him alone, and his whole body to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. 3 John verse 2 The Holy Spirit tells us to submit ourselves to God before he says, Resist the devil. No one can successfully resist the devil until he submits himself to God. When the devil is thus resisted, he will not merely walk away, he will literally run or flee from you. James chapter 4 verse 7. The curse, including the different diseases cataloged in Deuteronomy in the 28th chapter, came upon the people because their obedience and their service was not with gladness and joyfulness of heart. The condition of heart that was responsible for the coming of those diseases mentioned in that chapter was not acceptable to God. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, It is those who will delight themselves in the Lord to whom He gives the desires of their heart. God has not lowered the standard for this day of grace. It is only to the obedient, those who will diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord and do that which is right in His sight, that it is said, the Lord will take away from thee all sickness. Take a look at Deuteronomy 7, verse 15, also Exodus 15, verse 26. Faith, you see, is the union of our hearts and wills with God's will and purpose. And where this unity is lacking, results are impossible. This is a very important spiritual law, to which in our times we have been woefully blind. God says, of fearing the Lord and departing from evil, it shall itself be health, the Hebrew means medicine, to thy navel, and marrow, the Hebrew here means moistening, to thy bones. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Faith always implies obedience. Paul wrote to the Ephesians to obey the first commandment, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Ephesians 6, 3. Naaman's surrender and obedience to the Word of God was complete before he was healed. It is to those who walk uprightly that it is said, No good thing will he withhold. Psalm 84, verse 11. Therefore, before seeking anything from God, we should yield ourselves to the first and great commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. God says in Psalm 91, verse 4, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, He keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Therefore, like the leper, 
Let us come and worship him when asking for healing. Length of days is in her, that is, wisdom's right hand, and her left hand, riches and honor. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 16. Marry wisdom, and you get her possessions. Wisdom is here represented as a bountiful queen, holding forth blessings with both hands to all who will become subject to her government. It is for them whose heart is perfect toward him that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. See 2 Chronicles 16, verse 30. Proverbs 14, verse 30 says, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. An unsound heart is worse than an unsound stomach. A diseased soul is worse than a diseased body. A disordered will is worse than a disordered liver. Paul said, the body for the Lord, before he said, the Lord for the body. The Bible teaches that the body is bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 20. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, present your body to him if you want to be healed. It is not until after it becomes his property that he promises to repair it. Bryant said, The sure way for the sick is first the cross for cleansing, then to the upper room for the gift of the Spirit, then to the mount appointed for a life commission, and lastly, to the great physician for strength for service. If the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Romans 8, verse 11. In Christ, the true vine, there is all the life for our souls and bodies that we need. But how are we to possess and enjoy this except by our union with the vine? It is not apart from him, but in him, that ye are complete, according to Colossians 2, verse 10. Substitution without union is not sufficient for our possession and enjoyment of the life of the vine. If you need a miracle, get in tune with the miracle worker. We enjoy the life of the vine by our perfect union with the vine. Asking for healing while refusing to be led by the Spirit is like asking a carpenter to repair the house while refusing to let him in the house. Matthew 14, verse 36 says, As many as touched him were made perfectly whole. You cannot touch him with a reservation. Like the woman who pressed through the throng and touched him, you must elbow your way and press beyond selfishness, disobedience, unconfessed sins, lukewarmness, public opinion, traditions of men and articles written against divine healing. Sometimes you must press beyond your own pastor, who may be unenlightened in this particular part of the gospel. Press beyond doubts, double-mindedness, symptoms, feelings, and the lying serpent. The Holy Spirit, who is sent to execute for us the blessings of redemption, is our paraclete, or helper, and is ready to help us press through and beyond all of these obstacles to the place where we can touch Him for our needs. God is waiting to pour out the Holy Spirit in fullness upon us. He comes as Christ's executive to execute for us all the blessings provided by Calvary and pledged to us in His seven redemptive and covenant names. It is still true that as many as touch Him are made whole. How do we touch Him? By believing His promise. This is an infallible way of touching Christ for anything He has promised. We touch Him by asking and believing that He hears our prayers when we pray. When the woman touched Him, it was her faith that made her whole, not a mere physical touch. The flesh profiteth nothing, the Spirit giveth life. Millions of sinners have in this way touched Him for the yet greater miracle of the new birth. As the sick touched him and were made whole when Christ walked upon the earth, so now it is the privilege of all to actually touch him. The touch now unites us to Christ in a closer union than it did then. 
not mere contact, but union, as real as the branch and the vine. All that is in the vine, including both spiritual and physical life, belongs to us, the branches. The touch by faith can now bring us under the full control of the Holy Spirit, who is the miracle worker, as it could not do during Christ's earthly ministry, for the Spirit was not yet given. Jesus is not less a Savior and healer since being glorified. He's greater. The privilege of touching Him now is much greater than it was when He was here in person because more can now be received by the touch. From God's right hand, He has more to give. He said, It is expedient or profitable for you that I go away. Since the Spirit comes to reveal Christ, as He could not be revealed before He went away, to send the Spirit... Why cannot we approach Him for healing with at least as much faith as those who thronged Him in that day? These concepts show the great importance of being right with God before asking for healing. The blessing of being right with God is a thousand times more desirable and enjoyable than the healing itself. I have seen the afflicted in body radiantly happy, but sinners in perfect health have been so unhappy as to commit suicide. We will now endeavor to make plain the third step in how to appropriate healing. Getting things from God is like playing checkers. After one person moves, he has nothing to do until the other player moves. Each man moves in his own turn. So when God has provided healing or any other blessing and sent us His word, it is our move before He will move again. Our move is to expect what He promises when we pray, which will cause us to act our faith before we see the healing. The healing comes in the next move, which is God's move. God never moves out of His turn, but He always moves when it is His turn. When Noah was warned of God of things not seen as yet, his move was to believe that the flood was coming and act his faith by building the ship on dry land. So when God says to the sick, the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up, you, like Noah, are informed of God, of things not seen as yet. Your move is the same as Noah's, which is to believe and act accordingly. Fallen nature is governed by what it sees, by its senses, but faith is governed by the pure word of God. It is nothing less than expecting God to do what He promises, treating Him like an honest being. By expectation, I do not mean hope. One writer has well said, we hope for what may be possible, but we expect what must be possible. With that expectancy that shuts out doubt or fear of failure and shows unshakable confidence. Faith never waits to see before it believes, because it cometh by hearing about things not seen as yet, and is the evidence of things not seen. All that a man of faith needs is to know that God has spoken. This imparts perfect certainty to the soul. Thus saith the Lord, settles everything. It is written, is all that faith needs. Faith always blows the ram's horn before, not after, the walls are down. Faith never judges according to the sight of the eyes, because it is the evidence of things not seen but promised. Faith rests on far more solid ground than the evidence of the senses and that is the word of God which abideth forever. Our senses may deceive us, but God's word never. When the little girl is promised a new dress next Saturday, faith is the actual expectation which she has and manifests between now and Saturday. When Saturday comes and she sees the new dress, faith for the new dress stops. Now real faith always has corresponding actions. The little girl, because of her faith, claps her hands and says, Goody, goody! I'm going to have a new dress next Saturday and runs to tell her playmates that she has the answer to her request. God cannot lie. Jesus at the grave of Lazarus looked up and said, I thank thee, Father, that thou hast heard me, though Lazarus was still dead. The little girl is not afraid to testify in advance that she is to have a new dress. When her playmates say, How do you know you are? She confidently replies, Why, Mama promised it. Now you have a better reason for expecting healing than the little girl has, for expecting a new dress, because the mother may die before Saturday, but God cannot. The mother can lie, but God cannot. The house may burn down with the mother's money, 
Every case of faith in history has a well-grounded assurance produced by the promise of God alone and acted on it before there was anything visible to encourage the assurance, as with the little girl between now and Saturday. Faith looks not at the things that are seen. There was no flood in sight when Noah built his ark. Stone walls had never before fallen down at the blowing of the ram's horn and shouting. They were merely expecting what God promised, and when they acted their faith by blowing the ram's horn while the walls were still up, this was their move. Then, of course, God moved in His turn, and down came the walls. The whole eleventh chapter of Hebrews is written to show how each one who had faith acted between now and Saturday. God is so well pleased with the actings of faith that He has listed in detail many cases as recorded in the eleventh chapter of Hebrews. By faith, Noah acted so-and-so. By faith, Jacob acted so-and-so. By faith, Joseph acted, and so on. By faith, Moses acted, and so on. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. By faith, Abraham acted so and so. And when everything seemed contrary to what God had promised, it was by considering the promise of God, not her barrenness, that Sarah received strength to become a mother when she was past age. These all acted with nothing but the Word of God as their reason for expecting the thing He had promised. It's the same with every case of faith in history. Jonah's symptoms were very real when he was inside the fish, and he did not deny them, but he called them lying vanities. In other words, any symptoms that make us doubt the fact that God is plenteous in mercy to all that call upon Him should be regarded as lying vanities. Jonah said, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Instead of listening to Satan and watching our symptoms, we must be workers together with God, who heals by sending His Word and keeping it. We must cooperate with Him by being occupied, not with what the devil says, but with the Word He sends for our healing. Even when we do act our faith, symptoms do not always disappear instantly. After Hezekiah was healed, it was three days before he was strong enough to go up to the house of the Lord. In John 4, verses 50 to 52, the nobleman believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and when he met his servants, he inquired of them the hour when his dying son began to amend. The Bible differentiates between the gifts of healing and the gifts of miracles. Christ could do no miracle in Nazareth because of their unbelief, but he healed a few sick ones. If everyone were to be made perfectly whole instantly, there would be no place for the gifts of healing. It would all be miracles. Many people miss healing by trying to confine God to performing a miracle. Christ's promise is that they shall recover, but He does not say instantly. The symptoms of life in a tree remain for a time even after the tree is cut down. Faith means we are confident of what we hope for, convinced of what we do not see. Hebrews 11, verse 1, Moffat's translation. Convinced, of course, because God, who cannot lie, has spoken. How all-sufficient is this reason for believing? Faith is, therefore, most rational. It is not, as many unthinking persons suppose, believing without evidence, but believing because of the very highest possible evidence, God's Word, which is settled in heaven. The Apostle James says, I will show you by my action what faith is. Again, Moffat's translation. Faith, therefore, is being so convinced of the absolute truth of the declarations of God which are recorded in the Bible that we act on them. Faith is both rational and safe. What can be more rational and what can be more safe and certain? Faith is to receive the written promise of God as His direct message to us. His promise means the same as if He appeared and said to us, I've heard your prayer. The Word of God has made life to our bodies in exactly the same way that it has made life to our souls, which is by believing His promise. Some have prayed for healing for as long as forty years without receiving it, and then, as soon as they were told how to appropriate, the healing has come sometimes in a moment. We do not have to pray for forty years or for one week 
for the blessing that Christ is eager to bestow. His compassionate heart yearns to heal us more than we have the capacity to desire it. We keep Him waiting until we have the faith that cometh by hearing, and act that faith. God will not cheat and move out of His turn. After seeing that Jesus bore our diseases as well as our sins on the cross, and therefore that we need not bear them, our next step is to appropriate by faith which is the only scriptural way. The truth of the matter is, God gave us this part of our inheritance nearly two thousand years ago, and He is the waiting one. He is waiting for us to appropriate the blessing by faith. Two thousand years ago God put away sin. Two thousand years ago God laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. Two thousand years ago He took on Himself our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. God is the waiting party, waiting for us to be shown how to appropriate the blessing He has already given. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slack or slow concerning His promises, but He is long-suffering to usward. Or, as Weymouth translates, The Lord is not slow in fulfilling His promises, but He bears patiently with you. In other words, He is not slow concerning His promises, but we are slow, and He is patient with us. Most of us could have been saved five years earlier than we were. God was not making us wait, but we were making Him wait. It's the same way with our healing. Now in Mark 11.24, Jesus tells us exactly how to appropriate any of the blessings purchased for us by His death. Having promised all that we need, He says, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, notice, not after you pray twenty years, but not after you get well, but while you are sick, when ye pray, believe, ye receive them, and ye shall have them. The condition of receiving what we ask God for is to believe that He answers our prayers when we pray, that we shall recover according to His promise. In other words, when you pray for healing, Christ authorizes you to consider your prayer answered, as when He stood at the grave of Lazarus and said, I thank Thee, Father, that Thou hast heard me, before He saw Lazarus come forth from the grave. When we ask for healing, Christ bids us to say with faith, I thank Thee, Father, that Thou hast heard me, before we have seen the answer to our prayer. God's Word alone is our reason for believing that our prayer is answered, before we see or feel. This is faith. Jesus declared, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John says, The Word is God. To receive the written words of Christ as the direct message to us is faith. This is the way the Word of God becomes life to us, both in our healing and in our salvation. For instance, the act of believing and receiving Christ according to John 1.12 is synonymous with the act of God which gives us, by His power, the new birth. By this same process also is divine healing imparted to our bodies. Another has said that with the woman who touched his garment, faith, fact, feeling is the order of healing that God never departs from. If we depart from this order, neither faith or fact nor feeling will be as we desire, because they will not be as God desires. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 says, It is the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. When His Word convinces us that our prayer is answered, before we have yet seen the answer, the Word begins to effectually work in us. God's Word never fails to work in those who accept it as such, because they are not entertaining doubts as to its being fulfilled in their own experiences. God has given all His blessings to faith, and has none left to bestow upon unbelief. When people say to me, I do not know that it is God's will to heal me. I ask them, Is it God's will to keep His promise? If we are right with God, we should not consider ourselves any more than we would when men make promises to us. Not have I faith enough, but is He honest? It's not a question of how we feel, but what are the facts? Should the little girl get sick the next day and feel badly, it has nothing to do with her mother buying her a new dress on Saturday. The Scriptures say, If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. Is this true or is it not? Does God answer prayer? If you will 
steadfastly believe that ye receive the answer to your prayer and act your faith, every one of you will be healed, though not always instantly. God always moves after our move. This is the acting out of a full assurance, produced alone by His promise before we see the answer to our prayer. Since healing is by faith and faith without works is dead, it is when we begin to act our faith that God begins to heal. Our faith makes God act. Our work of faith sets God to working. No, we cannot all act in the same way. As the ten lepers went, they were healed. Jonah, when inside the fish, could not go anywhere, but he did act his faith by saying while still in the fish, I will sacrifice with the voice of thanksgiving. And so acting our faith by praising and thanking God in advance has been throughout history His appointed way for our appropriation of all His blessings. Hebrews 13.15 teaches us that our thank offering, our sacrifice of praise, is to be offered in advance for the blessing God has promised. Psalms 50, verse 14 and 15 says, Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Here as elsewhere we are required to offer thanksgiving while we are still in trouble, as Jonah did. Perhaps this was the very promise he claimed. Let the needy praise thy name, that is, praise God in advance while you are still in need. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving does not mean to get healed and then go from His presence thanking Him. We should come to Him with thanksgiving for healing before being healed. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. We should also go away with thanksgiving, but this is not faith. Faith is what we have done before we are healed. They shall praise the Lord that seek Him. Thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. Without praise we are up against a solid wall with no gate. But when we begin praising and appropriating, we hang our own gate and walk through. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. They were continually in the temple praising and blessing God, not after, but before they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was when they lifted up their voice and praised the Lord that the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. They believed His words, not their symptoms, not the father of lies, and sang His praises. Make Satan listen to your praises. Instead of your listening to the father of lies, make him listen to your praising God for His promise. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. The sick man has breath. In other words, while you are still sick, praise Him because you are going to recover according to His promise. Let not your heart be troubled. In nothing be anxious or distracted, but with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Every sick Christian, while sick, has a thousand times more to be happy over than the most cheerful sinner in perfect health. Praise God, because faith without works is dead. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Since everything that hath breath is commanded to praise the Lord, the only scriptural excuse for not praising Him is to be out of breath. <laughs> By Him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Praise Him, because it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. Praise Him, because to withhold praise will show either unbelief or ingratitude. Praise Him, because praise is comely for the upright. Praise Him because God inhabits the praises of His people. Paul and Silas sang praises at midnight, with their backs bleeding and their feet in the stocks, and God sang bass with an earthquake, which set them free. Real faith rejoices in the promises of God, as if it saw the deliverance and was enjoying it. With three great armies against Jehoshaphat, which, humanly speaking, would mean annihilation, they praised the Lord with a loud voice on high. The only evidence that their prayer was answered was the naked word of God, and that only through human lips. The next day, when they went out to the battle and began to sing the praise, the Lord in His turn moved and set ambushments against the enemy, 
and the victory was won, 2 Chronicles 20, verses 18 and 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. For holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. As in Eden, the enemy succeeded in making void God's testimony as to the results of eating the forbidden fruit. So now he seeks to make void God's testimony as to the results of believing the gospel. After God said, In the day thou eatest, thereof thou shalt surely die, the serpent said, Thou shalt not surely die. Now when God's word plainly says, They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover, the same serpent seeks to persuade them that they shall not recover. Is it rational to believe the father of lies in preference to the Son of God, who is incarnate truth? When coming to God for salvation or healing, it is essential for each one to decide whether he shall allow the hiss of the serpent to rise above the voice of God. Thomas Akempis said, Blessed are the ears that hear the pulses of the divine whisper, and give no heed to the many whisperings of the world. When after you have been anointed for healing, Satan tells you that you will not recover, like Jesus, say to him, It is written, they shall recover. The Lord shall raise him up. James 5, verse 14. Also in the same passage, in the name of the Lord means the same as if the Lord himself anointed you. Expect him to honor his own ordinance and his own promise. Why listen to the devil? All the devil heard from the lips of Christ when tempting him was, It is written. It is written. It is written. Then the devil leaveth him. But all we hear from some people is, the devil says, the devil says, as though God's words were of less consequence than those of the devil. This was Christ's way, and it is the most successful way of resisting the devil. Let us not try another way. Neither give place to the devil, Ephesians 4.27. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you, James 4.7. There's just one way of resisting the devil, and that is by steadfastly believing and acting upon God's word. Whenever we are affected by another voice more than the voice of God, we have forsaken the Lord's way for our healing. What reason have you for doubting? You have no more reason for doubting than the sinner has when he repents and asks forgiveness for his sins. You have exactly the same reason for expecting to be healed that you had for expecting to be saved. You have his word for it, and if you cannot accept that to the point of acting upon it, then your faith is still very far from what it should be. The Lord's compassion is our greatest basis for faith. Since Christ has redeemed us from sickness, surely His love and faithfulness may be trusted. The cross is like a sure foundation and a perfect reason for the exercise of faith. Let us put our sickness away by faith as we would put away sin. The consecrated Christian will not consciously tolerate sin for a moment. And yet how tolerant some are toward sickness. They'll even pet and indulge their aches and pains, instead of resisting them as the works of the devil. The Lord Jesus has declared concerning the sin, sorrow, and physical misery of Adam's race, it is finished, and has offered unto each one of us the gift of the Holy Spirit to enable us to realize and fully enjoy the great salvation He purchased for us. To believe without doubt that Christ's words, it is finished, is a literal statement of an unchangeable fact, invariably brings deliverance. The serpent is still denying this great saying of Christ to our great loss, just as he caused Eve to forget and disregard words which God had plainly spoken to her. It is by realizing that our redemption from sickness was actually accomplished in the body of our crucified Lord, and by wholeheartedly believing and receiving what God declares in his written word about this matter, that the Holy Spirit gives us the personal experience of Christ, our physician. Following these instructions has brought soundness upon thousands who had before been taught that the age of miracles was past, and that God wanted people to remain sick for his glory. Those born blind are now seeing. Deaf and dumb mutes from birth are now hearing and speaking. Cripples from birth are now perfectly whole. 
Epileptics for years are now free and rejoicing. Many who were dying with cancers are now well, and praying the prayer of faith for the healing of others. And God is no respecter of persons. God's new covenant provides that each shall be made perfect in every good work to do His will. This cannot be while we are sick. This shows His willingness to make us well, in fact, His eagerness. He cannot keep His covenant with us without taking away our sicknesses and fulfilling the number of our days according to His promise. Since it is by His stripes we are healed, let us not forget what our healing cost. With gratitude and love and consecrated service to God, let us stand on His promise and blow the ram's horn of faith and thanksgiving until the walls of our affliction fall down flat. Faith does not wait for the walls to fall down. Faith shouts them down. In Lesson 6, we'll be talking about this subject, Appropriating Faith. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, tells us exactly how God works miracles. He, and in this particular instance, he's speaking about God himself, that ministereth to you the Spirit. Here he's speaking about the Spirit, who is the miracle worker and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing, or the message of faith, even as Abraham believed God. Galatians 3, verse 5. Moffat translates this passage, When he supplies you with the Spirit, and works miracles among you, is it because you do what the law commands, or because you believe the gospel message? It is as with Abraham he had faith. In this passage, God tells us that He works miracles upon our bodies in exactly the same way as upon our souls, and that is, by having us hear and believe the gospel message. In fact, God's way of doing everything is by making promises and then by fulfilling them wherever they produce faith. He says it is with us as with Abraham. How was it with Abraham? Note carefully. He simply believed the word of God. He had faith that God would do exactly as he promised. He was fully persuaded by the word of God alone. He held fast the beginning of his confidence when his faith was tested. He was wholly occupied with the word of God in this matter. He refused to cast away his confidence when God, by telling him to offer Isaac, was apparently removing the visible encouragement of his faith. He considered not his own body or the fact that he was about a hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb as any barrier or any reason for doubting that Isaac would be born. Romans chapter 4, verse 19. These things, which according to nature made the birth of Isaac impossible, were not considered by Abraham as the slightest reason for doubting. He knew his age. He recognized the barrenness of Sarah. He weighed the difficulties, but ignoring the impossible, he believed God. Under utterly hopeless circumstances, by looking unto the promise of God, he waxed strong in faith, being fully persuaded or absolutely certain that God would fulfill his promise. Note well, it was by looking unto the promises of God that Abraham waxed strong in faith. Everyone that looketh upon it, that is, God's remedy and God's promise, was likewise the condition God required for the healing of the dying Israelites in Numbers 21, verse 8. When coming to God for healing, be sure that this is your attitude, because there is no healing promised except on this condition. We often base faith on our improvement. We are affected by our symptoms, or by what we see or feel, instead of by the Word of God alone. To that extent, ours is not real faith. To be concerned with what we see or feel is to exactly reverse the condition God lays down for us to follow. Everyone that looketh at it shall live simply means that everyone who, like Abraham, so occupies himself with God's promise that he is no longer affected by symptoms shall recover. It means the word of God, not what we see or feel, shall be the basis of our faith. Our looking unto the promise of God is a good reason for looking to God for mercy. There is no time to stop looking until God withdraws his word. Note, 
It was by continuing to look unto the promise of God that Abraham experienced the miracle. To be occupied with symptoms and be influenced by them, instead of God's word, is to question the veracity of God. Instead of making God a liar, Jonah, from within the fish, gave the name lying vanities to the symptoms and circumstances which seemed to stand in the way of his experiencing God's mercy. Realizing that it was symptoms and not God that was lying to him, he said, They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. God never refuses mercy, but many forsake it by observing their symptoms, which are real, but which are lying vanities, when they say to us that God is not plenteous in mercy to all that call upon him. Abraham's faith was not based on anything he saw, and you must see to it that yours is not. All that Abraham could see was contrary to what he was expecting. After Isaac was born, Abraham had a prop for his faith, that through Isaac all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. With his eyes upon Isaac, the channel through which God was to fulfill the rest of his promise, it was easy to believe. So God tested his faith, telling him by offering Isaac to destroy the channel. This did not daunt Abraham. Real faith thrives on a test. Since he still had God's word for it, he was ready to remove every visible encouragement to his expectation and yet continue to be fully persuaded. God had to halt him or he would have offered Isaac. This test was God's way of perfecting his faith, not of destroying it. If after coming to God for healing, he finds you more encouraged by your improvement than by his word, he may find it necessary to test your faith in order to teach you the glorious lesson of believing his word when every sense contradicts him. Faith has to do only with the word of God. In Hebrews 10, verses 35 and 36, God says to all those whose faith is based on his word, Cast not therefore away your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For we are made partakers, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. Directly contrary to this, after being anointed and prayed for, instead of rejoicing in the promise of God, some say in disappointment, I thought I was going to be healed. They never catch the idea of what faith is. Their idea is to get well first and then to believe that God has heard their prayer. If God's word is the sole reason for their expectation, they will hold fast the beginning of their confidence. It's never proper or reasonable to cast away your confidence as long as you have the word of God as its basis. It is promised that we shall be partakers only on the condition that we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast. During the interim between God's promise and its fulfillment, instead of watching symptoms and casting away his confidence because he had nothing visible to encourage him, Abraham did exactly the reverse. By looking unto the promise of God, he wavered not through unbelief but waxed strong in faith, giving glory to God. After Jonah, from within the fish, prayed for mercy, he did not cast away his confidence because there was no visible proof that his prayer was heard. He held fast his confidence and added to it in advance the sacrifice of thanksgiving. After marching around the walls of Jericho, Joshua and the children of Israel did not cast away their confidence because the walls of the city were still up. Their faith was based on God's word. I have delivered Jericho into thy hands. If none of these cast away their confidence, why should you? Your state of mind should be the same as Noah's when he was building a ship on dry land and putting pitch into the cracks to keep the water out. In his mind the fact of a coming flood was fully settled, and the word of God was the sole reason for this state of mind. Your state of mind should be the same as Abraham's. With him, the matter of Isaac being born was fully settled, even though all the symptoms were to the contrary. God's word to you concerning your healing is just as clear and explicit as it was to Abraham. In Mark chapter 11, verse 24, Jesus tells us exactly the conditions he requires for our appropriation of any of the blessings he has promised. 
He says, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. That is, ye shall have them after you believe he has heard your prayer. As Jesus said, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, while Lazarus was still dead. We should be able to say, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, while we are still sick. Ye shall have them is your answer from Jesus, and is also your proof that your prayer has been heard. To faith, the word of God is the voice of God. He has not promised us that our healing shall begin until after we believe that he has heard our prayer. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. If this is true, then believe your prayer has been heard when you really pray. You must be able to say, We know we have the petition we desire of him, not because we see the answer, but because God is faithful, who also will do it. It is never proper to base faith on our improvement after prayer. Some say with great delight, Oh, I am so much better since I was prayed for. Now I know I will get well. This means that in the place of God's promise they have some other reason for expecting to get well. There is no reason for faith as good as the word of God. Suppose as soon as I pray for a man's healing, he could know he was just 50% improved. This improvement in his condition is not near as good a reason for knowing he will entirely recover as is the promise of God, even though after prayer he should become 50% worse. Suppose you promise your child a certain thing, and the next day you find that she is expecting exactly what you promised, not because you promised it. She has some other reason for expecting it. This would grieve you, for it would prove that she did not trust your word. It honors God to believe him, even while every sense contradicts him. He promises to honor those who honor him. God has promised to respond only to the faith that is produced by and rests in his word or promise. Some expect to believe they have been heard as soon as they feel better. He did not say he sent better feelings to produce faith and then heal them. He sent his word and healed them. God himself sent his word. We did not worm it out of him. How absurd then to doubt it. Is it not more rational to expect God to keep his promise? than to expect him to break it? Really, nothing can be more ridiculous or absurd than to allow symptoms or feelings to cause us to doubt the fulfillment of God's promises. Suppose your child, after being promised a new dress, should sprain her ankle and cast away her confidence for the dress because the ankle was painful. You say to her, My dear child, I promised to get you the new dress. Can you not believe my word? She answers, But mother, my ankle still hurts. It doesn't feel a bit better. It seems to be getting worse. How absurd is such reasoning? Now, if it's absurd to doubt one promise because of pain, then it's equally ridiculous to doubt any promise. Suppose again that after you promise her the new dress, she runs to the mirror to see if she looks any more dressed up and then says, I cannot see any difference. I do not look a bit better and then gives up the idea of having a new dress. To learn how to believe that God hears us when we pray is a much greater blessing than is the healing itself. Then the prayer of faith can be repeated 10,000 times for ourselves and for others. In this way, our whole life will be spent in obtaining the fulfillment of divine promises. We have seen how Abraham experienced a miracle. And God says it is with us as with Abraham. In this same way, we can all receive the fulfillment of God's promises. We who also walk in the same steps of that faith of our father Abraham. Romans chapter 4, verse 12. Lesson 7 answers this question, how to receive healing from Christ. In the case of the lifting up of the brazen serpent in the wilderness, Numbers 21, verse 8 says, It shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. This was a type of the atonement that Christ adopted and applied to himself. It was a requirement that had to be met if the dying Israelites wanted to be healed. If, as some teach, healing is not provided by Christ's atonement, 
then why were these dying Israelites required to look at the type of the atonement for bodily healing? And since both forgiveness and healing came to them all by an expectant look at the type of Calvary, why can't we all receive as much from Christ, the antitype? If we cannot, then the type is placed in a higher ground than Christ himself, and the type becomes a false prophecy. But notice that none were to receive healing except on this condition, every one that looketh. Looking means to be occupied in influence with what we're looking at. It is the equivalent of Abraham's refusing to consider his own body and waxing strong in faith by looking unto the promises of God. Being concerned and influenced by our feelings or symptoms is reversing the conditions which God requires. Looking means attention. After God gave the covenant of healing and revealed himself as our healer by the redemptive name Jehovah Rapha, the condition he laid down was that they should hearken diligently and do all. This means attention and heed to his word. Jesus in Mark chapter 4 verse 24 also taught us that it is by our attention and heed to God's word that we measure to ourselves his blessings. The word of God is the seed. Like all seed, when it is put into good ground, it has the power to do its own work. The attention and heed to the word of God is the way to get it into good ground and to keep it there. Satan cannot hinder the seed from doing its work unless we assist him to get the seed out of the ground. He can only do this by getting you to turn your attention away from the word of God to your symptoms. Jonah called his symptoms lying vanities and said, while still in the great fish, I will look again toward thy holy temple. Then we hear him offering the sacrifice of thanksgiving. This shows what looking means. Looking also means expectation. To look unto God for salvation means to expect salvation from him. He says to all of us, Look unto me, all ye ends of the earth, and be ye saved. Since God has provided in promised healing, we should dismiss from our minds the slightest thought of failing to be healed. The word looketh is also translated consider. We read that Sarah considered that she could rely upon him who had promised. Instead of considering her age, she received faith by considering the word of God. The word looketh is in the continuous present tense. It's not just a mere glance, but a continuous stare until you are well. It was a steadfast faith that brought the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. The healing process goes on while we are looking to the promise. We are to think faith, speak faith, act faith, and to keep it until the promise is fulfilled. By being occupied with symptoms or feelings, we violate the conditions and thereby turn off the switch to His power. We read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23 to 27, that Moses endured by seeing Him who is invisible. As far as the optic nerve is concerned, faith is the evidence of things not seen. But as far as the enlightened eyes of our understanding are concerned, faith is the evidence of things seen. Walking by faith is walking by sight of a better kind. We are to spend our lives looking at the far better things than can be seen with the optic nerve. We see with the eye of faith the glorious things that are invisible to the natural eye. After all, it is the mind and not the optic nerve that sees. You cannot see your money in the bank except with your mind. When you draw a check, it is by faith in what you see, not with your eyes, but with your mind. Faith is the most rational thing in the world because it is based on the greatest of facts and realities. It sees God. It sees Calvary where disease and sin were canceled. It sees the promises of God in His faithfulness, which is more certain than the foundations of a mountain. Faith sees the health and the strength given on the cross as already belonging to us. It receives the words, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, and acts accordingly. What the eye of faith sees, the hand of faith appropriates, saying, 
This is mine by virtue of the promise of God. Faith refuses to see anything but God in what he says. It is a great mistake to suppose a thing is not real because it cannot be seen with natural eyes. Suppose you should trust me to blindfold your eyes and to lead you down the street. The pavement under your feet is just as real as though you could see it. Every time you take a step, you are acting a faith, which is the evidence of things not seen by natural eyes. You see only with your mind what I see with my eyes and describe to you. The great spiritual realities and facts which God sees and tells us about are just as real as though we could see them with natural eyes. Because of God, His faithfulness and His promises, faith is the surest ground that it's possible to stand on. To the man who is not enlightened or who does not see the promise of God, it's like stepping out into space. But to those who have faith in God's word, it's like walking on the foundations of the universe. By merely standing on the naked word of God, millions of sinners have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Millions have also been taken from this world to heaven. The promise of God has been better to them than a stone ladder reaching from this world to heaven, which could be seen with the natural eye. Jesus tells us that he came that they that see not, that is, with the natural eye, might see with the eyes of faith. After ascending to heaven where he could no longer be seen with the natural eye, he counseled us to anoint our spiritual eyes with eye salve that we might see. By doing this, Peter was made to rejoice more over what he saw with his new sight than he ever had over what he saw with the optic nerve. Walking by this better kind of sight is the happiest life possible on earth because of the superiority of what we are constantly beholding, the best things, the joy-producing realities. Supernatural joy is always the result of using our better pair of eyes. It is important to see that real faith is occupied with God's power and mercy, not with human weakness. God invites us to take hold of His strength. He says, To them that have no might, He increaseth strength. He says also, Let the weak say, I am strong. It is as we obey Him and do this, believing on the authority of His word, that we have His strength, even when we feel weak that His strength is made perfect in our weakness. We must believe what God says in spite of how we feel. One reason why some fail to receive healing is because they believe what their five senses tell them in place of believing the Word of God. We should realize that the five senses belong to the natural man, that they were given to us to be used for the things of this world. But the things of God cannot be discerned, appropriated, or known by the natural senses. No kind of physical sensation such as pain, weakness, or sickness can ever be a good reason for doubting the fulfillment of any divine promise. How foolish it would be for me to doubt the promise of God's second coming because I felt sick or weak or had a pain. And if a pain is not a good reason for doubting one promise, it is not a good reason for doubting any promise. God is just as faithful to one promise as to another. Therefore, it is equally as foolish to doubt God's promise to heal because of pain or any disagreeable feeling as it is to question Christ's second coming because of these things. The ground upon which we claim the forgiveness of sins is the fact that Christ bore them in His own body on the tree, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And we must believe that we are forgiven before our feelings can be any different. It is in exactly the same way, on the same ground, that we are to appropriate physical healing from the great physician. The healing of both our souls and bodies is based upon the unchangeable truth of Christ's finished work, not on feelings. When God gives you the redemptive name, Jehovah Rapha, thereby saying to you, I am the Lord that healeth thee, he wants you to answer with faith, Yes, Lord, thou art the Lord that healeth me. He wants exactly what he says to be true in your experience. You can make no mistake in saying and steadfastly believing what He says, that He, at the present moment, is actually healing you and will continue working until you are perfectly whole. Faith is saying and believing what God says and acting accordingly. 
the blessings we take by a steadfast faith in God's promise will always materialize. When appropriating the healing Christ has provided, we must not be double-minded. James says in chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. We must, as it were, behead ourselves and put on the mind of Christ, which means to see only what he says and to act accordingly. This is implied in our asking in faith. Paul tells us to put off the old man with his deeds. This includes the old man's habit of thinking only according to the evidence of the five senses. Putting on the new man and having the mind of Christ includes our thinking and believing what is written, and saying as he did, it is written. Remember, the new man is not governed by the evidence of the senses. The word of God is very powerful. The Bible tells us that there is no word of God without power. Psalm 120 verse 7 tells us, He sent his word and healed them. This is his way of healing both our souls and our bodies. Many have been healed after reading the words in Isaiah 53 verse 5, By whose stripes we are healed. And by then saying, God says I'm healed, and I'm going to believe God and not my feelings. By saying and repeating what he says and acting accordingly, even cancers have disappeared. When we steadfastly believe and act our faith in God's word, nothing can keep the power in the word from making all things to become exactly as the word says. All we have to do is firmly believe what the word says and resolutely refuse to see, believe, or think of the things that contradict the word. We're to take sides with God and believe that all we need for spirit, soul, and body is already ours. God said to Abraham, I have made thee the father of a multitude. By taking the new name Abraham, which means the father of a multitude, the patriarch in faith continually repeated God's word after him. I am the father of a multitude. By counting the things that are not as though they were and giving glory to God in advance, exactly what God said became true. As you believe that God has done and given all he says he has done and given, as you constantly obey his word, God makes all the old things leave you and makes all that is of Christ appear in you. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 tells us that God has already given us all the things that pertain to life and godliness. This includes all we need for spirit, soul, and body, for this life and for the life to come. Jesus purchased all this for us, and God tells us he has already given it to us. Isaiah 53, verse 5, and 1 Peter 2, verse 24, tell us that God has healed us. Colossians 1, 13 says, God has delivered us from the power of darkness. In Luke 10, verse 19, Jesus said, Behold, I give you the power over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Romans 6.18 tells us that we are free. When appropriating all this, God warns us in the case of Peter to never look at our circumstances and feelings. The waves were just as high when Peter walked perfectly on the water as when he sank. While he did not look at them, they could not hinder him. But the minute he looked at them, he doubted and went down. The wind also was just as great when Peter walked perfectly as when he sank. When he did not pay any attention to it, it could not hinder him. God here teaches us that if we are occupied with looking and feeling instead of with him and his word, we will lose all he offers us. On the other hand, by steadfastly refusing to see anything but God and what he says, we shall have and keep everything that he says he has given to us. Satan is busy trying to take from us what we take from God, and so God bids us, Hold fast that thou hast. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Jesus gave Peter power to walk on the water, but the devil took it away from him by getting him to fix his attention on the wind, representing things we feel, and on the waves, representing things we see. Peter had the power and used it, but lost it by doubting. How many lose the manifestation of healing already in operation, 
by turning their attention from Christ and the Word of God to their feelings. Before taking the step of faith for healing, get this matter fully settled, that after taking the step, you are going to see nothing but God and what He says. From that moment, doubt should be regarded as out of the question and out of reason, because the evidence upon which you have planted your feet is the Word of God. To watch your feelings or symptoms would be like a farmer digging up his seed to see if it's growing. This would kill the seed at the root. When the true farmer gets his seed into the ground, he says with satisfaction, I'm glad that's settled. He believes that the seed has begun its work before he sees it grow. Why not the same faith in the imperishable seed, the Word of God? Believe that it's already doing its work without waiting to see. In receiving supernatural healing, the first thing to learn is to cease to be anxious about the condition of the body. Because you have committed it to the Lord and He has taken the responsibility for your healing, you are to be happy and restful in the matter because you know from His Word that He takes the responsibility for every case committed to Him. When receiving healing by faith, the body and its sensations are lost sight of. Only the Lord and His promises are in view. Before being conscious of any physical change, faith rejoices and says, It is written. Jesus won His great victories by saying, It is written, and believing that it was written. Any unfavorable feeling should be regarded as a warning not to consider the body, but to consider all the more the Lord's promise, to be occupied with Him. How much better to be in communion with God and rejoicing in His faithfulness than to be occupied with a sick body? In this way, multitudes have made great spiritual advancement. Others have forfeited sweet communion with God by being occupied with their feelings and symptoms. In Mark 9, verse 24, we read that the father seeking healing for his child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. By asking Christ to help him, he received the needed help, thereby rising to a place of power above the apostles and succeeding where they had failed. In the Greek, the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete, which means helper. Thank God, the Christian can always have his help whenever it is needed. The Holy Spirit is always ready to work in us that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And this, in a special sense, includes faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Since faith is especially pleasing in his sight, he wants to produce it in our hearts by his word and by his spirit. The Holy Spirit is always ready to help every Christian to exercise faith for any blessing God has promised them in His Word. The Bible tells us that Christ is able to save us to the uttermost, and this includes particularly His saving us from our unbelief. This is the sin of which the Holy Spirit came to convict us. Therefore, with a resolute purpose to hearken only to His Word, confess to God your unbelief and count on Him for deliverance from it, the same as from any other sin. His grace is always sufficient to cause faith to triumph for the appropriation of any mercy He has provided. The Holy Spirit is always ready to execute for us the fulfillment of any promise God has given. What is it that makes a man righteous? Over and over again we are told that Abraham was accounted righteous. How? He believed God and acted accordingly. He so believed and acted as to receive from God the fulfillment of His promise. To do this is the sum total of righteousness. Nothing can ever be so important and such a privilege as this, because it is in this way alone that God's glorious program for the individual and for the church can be carried out. In no other way can the will and the work of God be done by anyone. When Christ was asked the question, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? His answer was, This is the work of God, that ye believe. It is only where he finds the exercise of living faith for the fulfillment of his promises that God can work. Since it is by thus believing God that we are accounted righteous, it is unbelief that constitutes us unrighteous. Unbelief is wicked and unrighteous because it hinders and sets aside the divine program which consists of all that God has promised to do in response to faith. No wonder that it was the sin of unbelief of which God sent the Spirit to convict the world. 
anything short of our having a living faith for the will and work of God to be done, even though we may call it religion, is something else in the place of His righteousness. Therefore, it is unrighteous. Christ's ability to save us unto the uttermost consists in His ability to save us from our unbelief, which is so deadly to the glorious divine program. The Holy Spirit is given to guide us into all truth so that we might believe it. This is so that the whole program of God may be carried out. How many there are who believe in God, but who do not believe God as Abraham did. A steadfast faith for what God has revealed to be His will for us is our whole duty, and from every standpoint our greatest privilege. How God would sweep the world with His mighty power if all who professed His name were set out to discover all divine truth, to believe it with an appropriating faith and to act accordingly. Faith in God has a much stronger foundation and a much stronger helper, the Holy Spirit, than either doubt or sin or disease has. The Holy Spirit will free your mind of all doubt if you will rely on Him to do it, if you'll keep your attention on the Word of God. The glorious and lasting realities which God has provided for the eye of faith to behold, when really and steadfastly beheld, always become stronger than the cancer or the disease which the optic nerve sees. Doubt, sin, and disease can always be destroyed by the right use of the eyes of our understanding. This is the infallible method for our appropriation of all of God's blessings. All the glorious victories of faith recorded in the eleventh chapter of Hebrews were the result of the proper and persistent use of their better sight. The law of the spirit of life which heals our souls and bodies is much stronger than the law of sin and death. This law, when not hindered by us, will win every time in a million. Every one who sets himself to obtain the benefits of the atonement has an infinitely capable helper whose power, when relied upon, can never fail. As God's grace is stronger than sin, so is Christ's healing virtue much more powerful than the strength of any disease. And the evidence God gives us for faith, His own word, when it occupies the mind, is much stronger than any evidence Satan can give us to make us doubt. What is the exercise of faith? Jesus said to the man with the withered hand, Stretch forth thy hand. Christ first gives faith, then calls for it to be exercised. The man stretched forth his hand in reliance upon divine strength, and it was made whole. As we put forth effort in reliance upon God to do what without Him is impossible, God meets us with divine power. The thing is done independent of nature. Concerning anything that God calls us to do, all things are possible, not to him that feels able in himself, but to him that believes. We see this man's ability not in himself, but in Christ, in whom every part of salvation is contained. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Through our union with Christ, the true vine, the strength is already ours, but must be put to use. It was the effort to put forth his hand which opened the way for the healing touch to be given and the divine life to flow. This act of faith, begun in the natural, became a way of entrance for the supernatural, to meet the man's need. It led at once to an action wholly supernatural, by virtue of the divine power that was imparted to him, to an exercise of the body not possible according to former conditions, an act independent of natural forces and wholly dependent upon God. The act of faith is not only a physical act, it includes the exercise of the heart and mind toward God. The full exercise of faith means that we think faith, speak faith, and act faith. This brings the manifestation of all that faith takes according to the promise of the Word. You may be asking, how can one exercise faith for healing of blindness or of an affliction which does not interfere with the motion of the body? To the blind man, Jesus said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. This act gave the man an opportunity to exercise faith in heart, mind, and body. It was the same with Naaman, with the ten lepers, and with the centurion. In each case they went relying upon the word of Christ and believing the healing was theirs before it was manifested to their sight. 
Should you deposit a thousand dollars in the bank and come and tell me that you have made me a present of that amount? If I believe you, I would act my faith, draw checks on the bank as I needed the money. I've not seen the money in the bank, but it's just as much mine as though I saw it and had it in my hands. Just so, healing for our souls and bodies is in Christ, whom God has made the treasury of all he is. Sickness from which I have been redeemed does not belong to me, but healing does. Therefore I begin to check on healing. How? By attempting in his name what I cannot do without him. This is acting faith, checking health and strength from the bank of God. It is counting on something we do not see or feel, but which we know from God's own word is ours, in the same way that the money in the bank is ours, although we do not see or feel it. Someone may say, how can I say that I'm healed when I see disease in the body and I'm conscious of pain? There's an illustration in nature sometimes given which makes the truth clearer. One method of killing a tree is to girdle it. When we see a tree girdled, we think of it as a dead tree. Still its foliage is fresh and green for a while and gives evidence of life. The natural eye sees life. The mind's eye, which has knowledge beyond what nature beholds, sees death. In time the leaves wither and fall, and death, which the mind's eye saw from the first, becomes manifest to the senses. So it is when we take healing for the body. As we claim the word of promise and faith, receiving the finished work, the sword of the Spirit strikes the death blow to disease. For a little time symptoms may remain, but the eye of faith, which beholds the crucified one, sees disease canceled and health given. Calling the things which be not as though they were, the new life is manifested in the body. That which the eye of faith saw from the first as the truth becomes manifest to the senses. Faith sees God in His love and omnipotence making good the word. Being governed by natural sight is unscientific because it does not take into account all the facts. It overlooks the greatest and best of facts. Healing by natural means is unscientific because it overlooks important facts, the supernatural agency in disease as well as the privilege of the supernatural in its recovery. We thank God for the thousands who have made great spiritual advancement while receiving healing in this way. The process of faith which brings the healing is a far greater blessing than the healing itself. Many throughout the scriptures became famous for faith as a result of seeking God for what we call temporal blessings. When we have learned the process of faith for receiving healing, we have learned how to receive everything else God promises us in His Word. The church could win millions for the service of God and make them fighters of the good fight of faith by offering to them the healing of Christ purchased for them. May you, by learning to be healed in this way, advance into a life of faith and usefulness in the kingdom of God. It is important for those who are seeking for the mercies of God to see that appropriating faith is taking and using what God offers to us. Hope is expecting a blessing sometime in the future, but faith is taking it right now, taking what God offers. We are to believe what God says He has done for us and act upon it, taking our blood-bought liberty just as the slaves of the South did after the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. The Gospel is a worldwide Emancipation Proclamation of liberty from service and bondage to the old tyrant master of sin and sickness, the devil. When Jesus said, It is finished, he meant that the work was done, completed as God sees it. God expects us to reckon as done what Jesus said was done. The past tenses of God's word mean a settled, sealed, and final decision of his will. In Galatians 3.13 we read, Christ hath Notice the tense, past tense. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. God has put our redemption from the curse of the law in the past tense, and we receive our deliverance when we do the same. In Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, we see that the curse of the law includes all diseases. In God's word we read, Surely he hath, 
past tense, borne our sicknesses and carried our pain. Himself took, past tense, our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, by whose stripes ye were healed. God wants us all to appropriate the past tenses of his word regarding his redemption of our souls and bodies from sickness and disease. He wants us to go forth in obedience, acting as if we believed him. When God puts a promise in the past tense, he thus authorizes and expects us to do the same. Nothing short of this is appropriating faith. In Mark 11.24, Jesus authorizes us and commands us to put the receipt of the blessing we pray for in the past tense. He says, when we ask for what he offers, Believe that ye have received them and ye shall have them. We are to continue to believe that God gave us what we asked for when we prayed, and continue to praise and thank Him for what He has given us. It is after we believe we have received what we ask for, after we believe He has heard our prayer, that God goes to work. Then the imperishable seed, His word, begins to grow. The farmer has to get the sowing of his seed into the past tense before it's possible to reap a harvest. The receiving of God's word, the imperishable seed, must be in the good ground of our heart, thus getting it into the past tense before the seed can begin its work. Believing that God has already heard our prayer before the blessing is manifested is the soil in which the imperishable seed, his word, grows and bears fruit. Believing that God has heard our prayer gets the seed into the ground, and then, and not before, it goes to work. Jesus at the grave of Lazarus said while Lazarus was still dead, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. The sick who pray for healing are to say before the healing materializes, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. The prayer of faith is believing our prayer is heard before the answer materializes, before the answer is manifested. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire of him. It is before having experienced or being conscious of any change whatsoever that faith rejoices and says, It is written. When we ask for healing, we are to say on the authority of God's word, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Faith refuses to see as reason for doubting anything contrary to the word of God. It sees health and strength bequeathed to us, already belonging to us because of the death of the testator. By his death, the will is in force. Jesus says to us, As thou hast believed, past tense, so be it unto thee. With our natural eyes, we see only the temporal and inferior things of earth. But with the enlightened eyes of our understanding, we behold the superior, satisfying, and lasting realities of God's spiritual and eternal kingdom. God said to Abraham, A father of many nations, have I made thee? Notice it's in the past tense. Since God put this promise in the past tense, Abraham did the same. He acted his faith by taking his new name, Abraham, which means the father of a multitude. A man put a certain amount of money in the pocket of his wife's coat, telling her he had done so and asking her if she believed him. She replied, Certainly I do, and began to plan how she would spend it. She actually had this money before she saw it. Why should we believe the bare word of others and demand proof from God? If someone should deed you a home that you have never seen, you actually have a home before you see it. Faith is the evidence or title deed of things not yet seen. A deed makes a home so much yours that you can sell it without ever seeing it. Faith is believing you have what God says you have and acting accordingly before you either feel or see that you have it. God said to Joshua, See, I have delivered into thy hand Jericho. Joshua and his men put this victory in the past tense as God had done. The walls of Jericho fell flat while they were acting their faith. Jesus said to the ten lepers who asked for mercy, Go show thyselves unto the priest. His words unto them were as much as to say, I have given you my word, that it is done. 
They knew the law of the leper, and therefore what his command meant. And so they put their healing in the past tense before seeing it, and it was manifested while they were acting their faith. Jonah put his deliverance in the past tense, called his symptoms lying vanities, and sacrificed with the voice of thanksgiving while he was still in the stomach of the great fish. It worked. The reason thousands are not getting what they pray for is that they are keeping their blessing in the future tense, which is only hope. Faith takes the blessings now. Were the gifts of God for soul and body merely promised gifts, we would have to wait for the promiser to fulfill his promises. The responsibility would be on him. But all of God's blessings are offered gifts, as well as promised, and therefore need to be accepted. The responsibility for their transfer is ours. This clears God of all responsibility for any failures. The only reason you were not saved a year earlier than you were is that you did not take what God had provided and was offering to you. God was not making you wait. You were making Him wait. Some say, God will heal me in His own good time. This is only hope and not faith. Faith takes what God offers right now. Lesson 9 deals with the faith that takes. I'd like to read a passage of Scripture from Mark chapter 11, verse 24. What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye have received them, and ye shall have them. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the evidence, or title deed, to things not seen. In Jeremiah, a title deed is repeatedly spoken of as the evidence. Your deed is the evidence or proof that you own your home. So faith is the title deed to what you have not yet seen. When you have been given a deed to a home which you have not yet seen, you already have a home before you see it. Jesus repeatedly said, He that believeth hath. Moffat's translation of Hebrews 11.1 1 reads, Faith means we are convinced that we have what we do not see. In Mark 11.24, Jesus commands us to believe we have received the things we pray for at the time we pray, without waiting to see or feel them. He promises, ye shall have them. Faith for the healing of your body, the same as faith for forgiveness, is to be believed on the authority of God's word, that you were forgiven before you feel forgiven. Nothing else is faith, for faith is the evidence of things not seen. As soon as the blessing we take by faith is manifested, faith for that blessing ends. If you are the beneficiary of a rich man's will, you are already wealthy the moment the rich man dies, though you have not seen any of the money. In the same way, everything bequeathed to us in our Lord's last will and testament is already ours by virtue of the death of Jesus, the testator. Faith is simply using what belongs to us. In connection with healing, the same as with forgiveness, to believe we have received healing at the time we pray before seeing or feeling it is the confidence of Hebrews 10, verse 35 and 36. The Holy Spirit tells us not to cast it away for the reason that it hath great recompense of reward. Peter tells us that it is the testing of this faith, the faith that we have received, which is more precious than gold. Believing that our prayer is granted at the time we pray, that we already have what we prayed for before we see it, is the confidence referred to in 1 John 5, verses 15 and 16. We know that we have the petition that we desire of him. The fig tree which Jesus cursed dried up, not from the leaves which could be seen, but from the roots which were out of sight. The death of the tree could not be detected at first by looking at the leaves. Calvary was our emancipation proclamation from everything outside the will of God. We are simply to believe what God says he has done for us and act upon it. We take our blood-bought liberty, just as the slaves of the South did after the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln. Suppose the slaves had judged by the evidence of the census, saying, I don't feel different. I can't see any change. All my surroundings are just the same as they were. Would that be faith? It was faith only when they acted on the freedom which was already theirs. In the same way, by believing and acting on the Word of God, Everything that belongs to us in Christ becomes available at once. 
To accept any contrary physical evidence in preference to the word of God is to nullify the word as far as you are concerned. Faith is believing what God says in the face of contrary evidence to the senses. We are to be steadfast in resisting everything contrary to the word of God. Faith means that we have left the sense realm. If a friend should deposit in the bank a hundred thousand dollars to your credit and bring you the passbook and a checkbook, you wouldn't examine your empty pocketbook to see how much money you have. You would examine your passbook. The Bible is the Christian's passbook. God has deposited in Christ all I need. It's already mine. To neglect it is not a proper attitude toward God. A right attitude toward God and His promises will bring about their fulfillment. You have to receive Christ before experiencing any of the wonderful results of receiving Him. Christ first, afterwards the results. We receive healing, divine life and strength and every other promised blessing in exactly the same way we receive Christ and forgiveness. Since forgiveness is invisible, how do you receive it? Answer, by faith in God's word. Why not receive divine healing and life and strength in the same way? Any blessing which is received by faith you must have before you see it, before it is manifested. Otherwise it would not be received by faith, which is the evidence of things not seen. The ten lepers already had healing in its unmanifested form when they started on their way to show the priests that they were healed. Their healing was manifested while they were acting their faith. God's announcement, I am the Lord that healeth thee, is to be received as the voice of God, believed as a present tense fact, and evaluated according to its cost. As perfume is non-existent to the sense of hearing, so what we take by faith, according to Mark 11.24, is at first non-existent to the five natural senses. You do not doubt the existence of what you see because you can't smell, taste, or hear it. Then why doubt the existence of what you have taken by faith, the sixth sense, because you can't see or feel it? The five natural senses belong to the natural man, who Paul tells us cannot know the things of God. It is only by our sixth sense, faith, that we can see and take and hold on to the blessings God offers to us until they are fully manifested. To consult our natural senses for evidence that our prayer has been granted is as ridiculous as trying to see with our ears or hear with our eyes. All of our six senses work independently of each other. You see what you can't hear. You hear what you can't see. Just so you have by faith what is at first non-existent to the natural senses. It is important to see that the contrary evidence of the senses is no reason for doubting, because the evidence upon which faith rests are still perfect. It is faith only when we are believing in the face of the contrary evidence of the sensed. Abraham received and believed the word of God in the face of nature's evidence to the impossibility. You must already have perfume before you smell it. You must already have food before you can taste it. You must already have the healing before you can feel it. Faith receives forgiveness and healing and praises God for them when there is nothing as yet to praise Him for, as far as the five senses can witness. Jesus said, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, when the raising of Lazarus was yet in an unmanifested form. Just so, it is before we see or feel any change that we are to believe that our prayer for healing is granted. We are to say, as Jesus did, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. The angels at Dothan were already present before they became visible to the servant of Elisha. The ability God gave him to see those angels did not create them. God works while we maintain the mental habit of faith, while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen, at God, at his promises, his faithfulness, and his justice. Faith has to do only with the unseen and unfelt. As soon as what we have taken by faith is manifested to the senses, it ceases to be faith. We must maintain the right mental attitude. No person who allows his mind to be ruled by his senses can have victorious faith. The mind that is ruled by the senses lives in a realm of uncertainty. Until God's word gains mastery over your mind, your mind will be swayed by feelings and by things you see or hear rather than by the word of God. The mind and thoughts of those seeking healing must be renewed so as to be brought into harmony with the mind of God as revealed in the Bible. 
Faith for God's promised blessings is the result of knowing and acting on God's word. The right mental attitude for the renewed mind makes steadfast faith possible to all. God always heals when he can get the right cooperation. I put a certain amount of money in Mrs. Bosworth's coat pocket and later told her. I asked her if she believed me. She said, of course I do, and thanked me for it. She actually had this money before she saw it. Why should we believe the word of others and demand visible proof from God? Continue to believe that God gave you what you asked for when you prayed, thanking and praising him for what he has given, and it will always materialize. This always puts God to work. So many are waiting for God to heal them. He is waiting for them to take what he is offering them. How trying it would be to a friend who offered you a gift for you to cry and beg for it, keeping him waiting for you to take it. Let me put this in another way. Jesus commands us to believe we have received the things that we prayed for at the time we prayed. Before they take visible form, it is clear that they exist in two forms. First, invisible. Afterwards, visible. First, believe that ye have received them in their invisible form, and ye shall have them in their visible or material form. We have them first in the faith realm, afterwards in the sense realm. So Jesus in Mark 11:24 commands us as soon as we pray to believe that we have received in its invisible form what we pray for before he changes it into its visible or material form. The angels at Dothan were just as truly present and, and real in their invisible form as when they became visible to Elisha's servant. The ten lepers each had their healing in its invisible form while they were on their way to show the priest their healing in its visible and material form. When Jesus said, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, the raising of Lazarus was complete in the faith realm before it was seen, a few moments later in the sense or material form. Just so, we are to believe that we already have our complete healing in its invisible form before God changes it into its visible or material form. The fact that faith is the evidence or title deed to things not seen proves that we must already have the things we pray for in their invisible form before God can change them into their visible or manifested form. The entire eleventh chapter of Hebrews records the actions of God's saints in the faith realm before the results of their faith took visible form. All the acts of faith are in the realm of the yet unseen. Believing that we have received the things we pray for at the time we pray is the confidence which is to be steadfast and unwavering until God changes the blessings we have taken from its invisible to its visible form. Walking by faith is walking by the kind of sight which sees and is occupied with eternal things, with God, with his promises, his faithfulness, and the many other perfect reasons for faith. It was believing without seeing that gave Peter joy unspeakable and full of glory. Nothing he had ever seen gave him as much joy as he now had by believing without seeing. The sacrifice of praise and the giving of thanks continually is done in the faith realm or before our blessings have been changed into their visible form. Jonah called his symptoms lying vanities and sacrifice with the voice of thanksgiving while he was still in the stomach of the great fish. The Israelites sang praises on their way to battle. Many people fail to receive what they pray for because of a lack of understanding about confession. In Hebrews 3.1, Christianity is called a confession. The Greek word here translated profession is the same as the one usually translated confession. What does it mean? This particular word in the Greek language means saying the same thing. It means to believe and say what God says about our sins, our sicknesses, and everything else included in our redemption. Confession is an affirmation of a Bible truth we have embraced. Confession is simply believing with our hearts and repeating with our lips God's own declaration of what we are in Christ. The Holy Spirit in 1 Peter 2.24 says, by his stripes ye were healed. We are to believe and say the same thing. When our affirmation is the word of God, he watches over it to make it good. Jeremiah 1.12 Confession is faith's way of expressing itself. In Hebrews 3.1, we are commanded to consider Christ Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. 
As our high priest, Jesus acts on our behalf according to what we confess, when it is in accordance with God's word. Paul tells us that he preached the word of faith, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord, and shall believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10 verse 8. There is a relation of confession to manifestation. Notice here that the confession, saying the same thing that God says, is by faith. It is believing and confessing before experiencing the result. The confession comes first, and then Jesus, our high priest, responds with the new birth. It is not salvation unto confession, but confession unto salvation. Confession comes before salvation. There is no such thing as salvation without confession. Faith is acting upon God's word, and this always puts God to work fulfilling his promise. What are we to confess? Few Christians today have recognized the place confession holds in God's plan for our appropriation of his blessings. Whenever the word confession is used, many instinctively think of confessing sin or weakness and failure. This is only the negative side of this great question. Our negative confession of sin was only to open the way for the positive confession unto salvation, a way to a whole lifetime of blessing with our heart and saying with our lips everything that God says to us in his promises. We confess unto salvation in its initial form and then in each of its successive forms, first in the form of the new birth, then in the form of every blessing promised to us in the word of God. The Christian is to act on every phase of his salvation that he knows about. We are to believe with the heart and confess with our mouth the word of faith which Paul preached. He preached all the counsel of God. He preached the unsearchable riches of Christ. He said that he kept back nothing that was profitable unto them. All that Jesus did in his substitutionary work is the private property of the individual for whom Jesus did it. So throughout our Christian life, God wants us to believe with our heart and say with our lips, all he says we are in Christ. We are not to ignore or neglect our legal standing in Christ, for it is the basis for the acts of faith which puts God to work, fulfilling his word in us. We are to confess or whisper in our own heart, in him I am complete. When we know that God in his word says, I am the Lord that healeth thee, we are to believe it and confess it with our lips. Christ will act as our high priest and make it good. We are to confess that Calvary was our emancipation proclamation from everything that is outside the will of God and act accordingly. We are to confess that our sicknesses were laid on Christ and that we are redeemed from the curse of disease. Let him that is weak say, I am strong, for the Lord is my strength. Our confession includes the whole of Scripture truth, all that his sacrifice provided, all that his high priesthood covers, the whole of God's revealed will. We are to confess that our redemption is complete, Satan's dominion is ended, Calvary has freed us. Like the slaves of the South, we are to believe that we are free on the basis of our emancipation proclamation, never on the basis of our feelings or on the evidences of our senses. Remission is the wiping out of everything connected with the old life. We are a new creation. The old things have passed away, and all things are become new. We are to make continual confession of our redemption from Satan's dominion. Of course, we're not to say to others that our healing is fully manifested before it is. God does not say that. But you can say to those who ask you, I'm standing on the word of God. We never rise above our confession. A negative confession will lower us to the level of that confession. It is what we confess with our lips that really controls us. Our confession imprisons us if it is negative or sets us free if it's positive. Many are always telling of their failings and their lack of faith. Invariably, they go to the level of their confession. Confessing a lack of faith increases doubt. Every time you confess doubts and fears, you confess your faith in Satan and deny the ability and grace of God. When you confess doubt, you are imprisoned with your own words. Proverbs 6.2 says, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. 
thou art taken captive with the words of thy lips. When we doubt his word, it is because we believe something else that is contrary to that word. Wrong confession shuts the Father out and lets Satan in. We are to refuse to have anything to do with wrong confessions. When we realize that we will never rise above our confession, we are getting to the place where God can use us. Disease gains the ascendancy when you confess the testimony of your senses. Feelings and appearances have no place in the realm of faith. Confessing disease is like signing for a package that the express company has delivered. Satan then has the receipt from you showing that you've accepted it. Don't accept anything that Satan brings. Give no place to the devil. 1 Peter 4.11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. In Ephesians 4.29 we are commanded to speak only that which is good to the use of edifying. We're not to testify for the adversary. We are to act faith speak faith, and to think faith. In Philippians 4.8, the Holy Spirit says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, and the word is, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. The Holy Spirit says in Proverbs, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, the Holy Spirit says, The weapons of our warfare are mighty, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We are to cast down reasonings and give the Word of God its place in our minds and in our lips. We are to have the mind of Christ. Jesus remembers He bore your sicknesses, and the Holy Spirit commands, Forget not all His benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. God's spiritual and physical transformations are to come to us by the renewing of our minds. Romans 12.1 says, Present your bodies, this is the home or the laboratory of the five senses, a living sacrifice, and be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A spiritual law that few recognize is that our confession rules us. It is what we confess with our lips that really dominates our inner being. Make your lips do their duty. Refuse to allow them to destroy the effectiveness of God's Word in your case. Some confess with their lips but deny with their heart. They say, yes, the Word is true, but in their heart they say, it is not true in my case. The confession of your lips has no value as long as your heart repudiates it. In the Revised Version, Hebrews 4, verse 14 says, Having then a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. What confession? The confession of our faith in the redemptive work that God wrought in Christ. I am told to hold fast to the confession of the work of Christ in all its phases. I am told to hold fast to the confession that God is the strength of my life. I am to hold fast to the confession that surely he hath borne my sicknesses and carried my diseases. By his stripes I am healed. God says this, and we are to believe and say the same things. We are to know our rights, as revealed by the word, and then hold fast to our confession of them. When you know that Christ took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses, hold fast to your confession of it. Then you read, Greater is he that is in you, than he that is in the world. Hold fast to this confession. We are to hold fast to our confession of what Christ has done for us in order that it may be done in us. We are to hold fast to the confession of our redemption from Satan's dominion. We are to hold fast to the confession in the face of all contrary evidence. God declares that by His stripes I am healed. I am to confess what God says about my sickness and hold fast to this confession. I am to recognize the absolute truthfulness of these words in advance of any visible change. I am to act on these words and thank Him for the fact that He laid my sickness on Christ the same as He did my sins. Healing is always in response to faith's testimony. Some fail when things get difficult because they lose their confession. Disease, like sin, is defeated by our confession of the Word. Make your lips do their duty. Fill them with the Word. 
Make them say what God says about your sickness. Don't allow them to say anything to the contrary. Believing God's word with our heart implies our having put off the old man with his habit of judging by the evidence of the senses. Faith regards all contrary symptoms as lying vanities as Jonah did. It puts the word in the place of the senses. Our only problem is to keep in harmony with God's word and not allow the senses to usurp the place of the word. We cease to live with doubting Thomas who says, except I see, I shall not believe. We are to prove Christ's own words. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. The word is lifeless until faith is breathed into it on your lips. Then it becomes a supernatural force. Make your lips harmonize with the word of God. Christ's high priestly ministry meets our every need from the moment of our new birth until we enter heaven. Why are we to hold fast our confession? The answer is in Hebrews 4.4, 4, because Christ is the high priest of our confession, because he is a great high priest, because he is a merciful high priest, because he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, because he ever liveth to make intercession for us. He is always ready to give us grace to help in the time of need. Our success is assured because Jesus is the high priest of our confession. When you confess that by his stripes I am healed and hold on to your confession, no disease can stand before you. Just thank the Father and praise him whenever a need confronts you that is covered by redemption and it's yours. Faith is thanking God from the heart for healing that has not yet been manifested. We are as sure of it as if it were manifested. The confession of your lips that has grown out of faith in your heart will absolutely defeat the adversary in every combat. Christ's words broke the power of demons and healed the sick. They do the same thing today when we believe and confess them. The word will heal you if you continually confess it. God will make your body obey your confession in his word for Luke 1 verse 37 says, No word of God is void of power. Psalm 34 or 10 says, But they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. If I dare say that that is true and stand by my confession, God will make good all I have confessed. Nothing will establish you and build your faith as quickly as confession. Confess it in your heart first. Confess it out loud in your room. Say it over and over again. Say it until your spirit and your words agree. Say it until your whole being swings into harmony and into line with the word of God. Christ's words are filled with himself. As we act on them, they fill us with Christ. We are to obey the word as we would obey Jesus if he stood visibly in our presence. When coming to God for salvation in its initial form, and then in every other form afterwards, our confession of and surrender to Christ's lordship is required. The Holy Spirit says in Colossians 2.6, As ye have therefore received Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. Romans 14.9 says, For this end Christ both died and rose, and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Appropriating faith for the fulfillment of any promise implies our surrender to his lordship. It is while we are surrendered to him as Lord over our lives that he is ready to heal us, to baptize us in the Spirit, to give us his Zoe or his life, God's own life in abundance, to be within us a fountain springing up into everlasting life, to make our legal standing our experience, to manifest his person in the form of every blessing promised, to be himself our strength, our portion, our all, to give us the unlimited use of his name, to enable us to cast out demons in his name, to anoint us for preaching, to enable us to lay hands on the sick for their recovery. Your success and usefulness in the world is going to be measured by your confession and by the tenacity with which you hold fast that confession under all circumstances. God can be no bigger in you than you confess him to be. In the face of every need, confess that the Lord is your shepherd and that you do not want. Without a divine revelation, I cannot tell a person the specific reason why their prayer for the fulfillment of a divine promise is delayed. I can, however, point you to a most wonderful truth, 
the most vital of all truths that God has revealed. It is the only cure for all of our ailments. A delay in receiving healing, for instance, is, in one sense, good news. It is the good news that we can have more of the life of God. There are four Greek words in the New Testament translated life. One of these means manner of life. Another means human life. Another, behavior. But the Greek word for the kind of life that Jesus brought into the world is zoe, translated eternal life, the life of God. Eternal life is the actual life of the eternal himself. The Gospel of John opens with the word zoe. This word is found in the New Testament 130 times. John 10.10 10 tells us that a man was to have a right to an abundance of a new kind of life, God's own life. It is new, of course, only in the sense of human possession. Zoe is the life that lives itself. Many ministers today major in the manner of life and behavior rather than Zoe, the life of God, Zoe, when received in sufficient measure, lives itself. Paul prayed for Christians already filled with the Spirit, that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. This shows that Zoe is God Himself. All we have of it is an unsevered part of the life of God. The way to be full of faith is to be full of that kind of life which believeth all things. The way to be full of a divine love is to be full of the life of God, who is love. All things are possible to Zoe. When it is received in sufficient measure, it can fulfill in us any promise or requirement in the Bible. To fulfill in us all that the Bible requires or promises is precisely what the life of God in us is to accomplish. By receiving more of the life of God, we can be made more than conquerors spirit, soul, and body. God wants to do in us all that He did in Christ for us. Zoe, received in sufficient measure, transforms us from glory to glory into the image of Christ. It turns belief into knowledge. It is the source of all divine graces. It gives us God's wisdom. It overcomes the world, the flesh, and the devil. It works in us that which is well-pleasing in His sight. It is by filling us with His own life that God Himself becomes our life, our peace, our righteousness, our purity, our strength, our health, and the preserver of our whole spirit, soul, and body. He becomes our zeal, our joy, our faith, our guide, our teacher, our satisfaction, our everything that pertains to life and godliness. God's blessings are a part of Himself. By filling us with more and more of His life, God wants to manifest Himself in us in the form of every spiritual blessing He has promised. This is the miracle and the genius of Christianity. Romans 5.10 tells us that we are saved by His life. This is true for both soul and body. It is impossible to measure up to God's purpose for our prayer life without being full of that life that ever liveth to make intercession. In other words, it is when Zoe inspires our prayers that we can ask what we will and receive it. Zoe, the life of God, is the healer of soul and body. Divine healing, divine life, and divine strength is Christ Himself made manifest in our mortal flesh. The fullness of this new life is better than the healing it produces. David said, The Lord is my portion, the Lord is my strength. His blessings were God manifesting Himself in these various forms. God gives us each spiritual blessing by giving us Himself. Our blessings are a part of God. Jesus said, I am the vine, and ye are the branches. The life of the branches is a part of the life of the vine. It is Christ's will that all the branches shall be full of His own life. When we are full of Zoe, we are one with God, just as the bay is one with the ocean, because the tides flow into the bay. Paul says, They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit. That is to say, our spirit and His spirit are blended into one. 
This truth provides us with one of the answers to the question, Why am I not healed? I've heard Christians express their reasons for wanting to be filled with the Spirit. It seems to me that every Christian in the world would pray until they were filled with the Spirit if they knew the many glorious reasons why the Holy Spirit wants them to be filled with Himself. One of His reasons is that He wants to be unhindered in His wonderful work of continually quickening our whole spirit, soul, and body. In John 6, verse 63, Jesus said, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, or giveth life. He is spoken of in Romans as the Spirit of life. All life is due to the direct action of the Holy Spirit. It is His work to impart to us continually the actual life of Jesus. He is the true source of life for both the souls and bodies of God's children. When we are anything less than full of the Spirit, which is the condition of His perfect working, His work of quickening or increasing the divine life in our spirit, soul, and body is hindered or limited. Jesus said that He came not only that we might have life, but that we might have it more abundantly. We cannot have His life in the measure which He desires unless we are filled with the Spirit. The abiding which Christ commanded keeps us filled with the Spirit. It removes from us all hindrances to the Spirit's constant quickening. In the eleventh psalm, David uses the word quicken eleven times. He knew that more life is the cure, the only cure, for all of our ailments. It is well to know what we pray for. David desired quickening, more life, increased life. He therefore sought that blessing which is the root of all the rest. He prayed, Quicken me after thy loving kindness. We need never fear anything that loving kindness does. Nothing else is so good. Loving kindness itself cannot do us a greater service than by making us to have life more abundantly. In the 25th verse of Psalm 119, David prayed, Quicken thou me according to thy word. Thank God we can all pray with faith and get the answer every day to this comprehensive and inspired prayer. Quicken thou me according to thy word. Notice that the quickening is, as David said, according to thy word. The Holy Spirit inspired the word of God, and it is his own blueprint to which he works while carrying on his great work of quickening. So to be quickened according to God's word means to be full of his life in the entire range of our complex being body, soul, and spirit. God has made Christ the treasury of all that He is. In Him is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We can be full of everything that the vine contains. The abiding branch not only has life, but is full of life all the time. It is by the Spirit's fullness and the consequent unhindered quickening that we are preserved, as Paul says, spirit, soul, and body. Paul says the Spirit will quicken also your mortal body. In 2 Corinthians 4.11 we have the words, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. If you need healing from Christ, wait on God for the Spirit to quicken you to the extent that Mark 11.24 shall be fulfilled in you. This is exactly what the divine quickener wants to do for you. Let us pray every day. Quicken thou me, or give me more life according to thy word. That is, according to every revelation we find in the Bible, which shows us ourselves as God wants us to be. Every time you discover in the word more than what God requires, rejoice and be encouraged, because it is the work of the Spirit, not your work, to quicken you just to that extent. Let this prayer be your first prayer every day for it is the condition of a thousand other blessings. It is God's way of fulfilling in you all the good pleasure of His goodness. The Holy Spirit wants to quicken us to the extent that everything He has revealed concerning us in God's Word shall be fulfilled in us. In the 50th verse of this 119th Psalm, David says, Thy word hath quickened me. The Spirit quickens us according to our trust in God's Word according to the extent of every promise or command that we find from time to time in the Word of God. This quickening will be, as Paul says, from glory to glory. God's words are spirit and life to accomplish exactly what they reveal. When we pray to be quickened according to His Word, we know that we are praying according to His will, 
and can therefore obtain the answer. According to his word means according to both his promises and his commands. The more the word requires, the better, for the greater will be the quickening. What a glorious privilege it is that whenever we feel a lack, we can pray to the giver of life, Quicken thou me. Give me more life. We need quickening every day. While on earth Jesus said, Come to me and drink. From heaven he is still saying the last chapter of the Bible, Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. He wants to be an inexhaustible fountain of life within us, springing out and flowing out in the rivers of living water. I'd like to read from Moffat's translation of 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 to 9. I did the planting, Apollos did the watering, but it was God who made the seed grow. You are God's field to be planted. How can we obtain the fulfillment of God's promises? Every moral being on earth has been bought with a price to be the Lord's garden in which His imperishable seed is to grow and be cultivated and produce its wonders. Real Christians are God's farm, His husbandry, His field, His garden. A field belongs to its owner. So Paul says, Ye are not your own, ye are bought with a price. God holds the title deed. We are absolutely His. We belong to Him by right of creation and by right of preservation. But the greatest fact is that we belong to Him by right of redemption. He bought us with an infinite price to be His field. Paul said to the Corinthians, I did the planting. In the parable of the sower, Jesus said, The seed is the word. It is the imperishable seed. God brings about His wonderful harvest in the same way a farmer does. Jesus said He sent forth a sower to sow. It is God's word that lets us know what to trust Him for. Faith cometh by hearing, by our knowing what God's will is for us. Because they can accomplish such wonders, God wants all His seed planted. God's purpose in creating seed was that it might be planted in good ground, where it could germinate and grow and bring forth fruit. Paul said, I did the planting. Seed is powerless unless it is planted. The infinite price God paid for the field reveals the importance of planting the imperishable seed. All of God's wonderful works are potentially in the seed. David said, All his work is done in faithfulness, that is, in faithfulness to his promises. God's works are prevented until the seed is in good ground. His design for us all is that we spend our lives making possible the germination and growth of the imperishable seed. Nothing can take the place of the seed, not even prayer. Prayer is not the seed. The Word is the seed. The only purpose of God's promises is their fulfillment. They are all a revelation of what He is eager to do for us. The Holy Spirit, whose work it is to fulfill the promises, speaks of them as exceeding great and precious. Their greatness is seen in their suitableness to meet all of our needs and to fill all our capacities. Their immutability makes them exceeding great and precious because it removes all reason for doubt and gives us perfect reasons upon which to base our expectations. As seed, they cannot be changed. They therefore accomplish their wonderful results at any time and in any garden. It is the business of Christians to prove to the world by actual demonstration that the promises of God are true today as they were 2,000 years ago. They were given to be known and recognized, claimed and pleaded in prayer. They're to be sown and tilled by prayer. In Romans 4, verse 12, God speaks of Christians as those who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, meaning that we should all treat every promise God has made to us exactly as Abraham treated God's promise to him. Can it be that God is less real to men in this Holy Spirit dispensation than he was to those who lived in the shadows of these better things? Jesus said to some of the Jews in his day, My word hath no place in you. What place should the word of God have in us? 
I answer that it ought to obtain and retain an inside place in the thoughts, the memory, the conscience, and the affections. It ought to obtain and retain in us a place of honor, reverence, faith, love, and obedience. It ought to obtain and retain in us a place of authority. Millions of people sing that glorious hymn, Standing on the Promises of God. The fact is that most of God's promises are never claimed by most modern church members. Standing on the promises of God means to get them fulfilled. It means to appropriate the blessing that each promise reveals. It means to pray the prayer of faith for their fulfillment. Neglecting them is equivalent to undoing what their fulfillment would mean if it were already accomplished. Their preciousness should determine our love and esteem of them. Paul was glad to say, I did the planting. If farmers treated their seed as millions of church members today treat God's imperishable seed, the world would starve to death. In the seed there are infinite possibilities. This is why it should be said of every one, as it was at the beginning, they gladly received the word. In the plainest Bible text there is a world of blessing, just as in a little seed there is a potential tree a million times bigger than the seed. Just one verse of Scripture allowed to germinate in a human heart may grow into a harvest of thousands of conversions and eternal glory which follows. One kernel of wheat can in time cover a continent and feed nations. The results of cultivating the imperishable seed are as much greater and more desirable than the harvest of material seed as the heavens are higher than the earth. Only the imperishable seed can bring about imperishable results. The Bible says every seed bringeth forth after its kind. Each promise by its revealed blessing shows the nature of the harvest of fulfilled promises. Paul said, I did the planting, Barnabas did the watering. All the seed and all the plants in God's garden need watering. Jesus said of the stony ground upon which the seed fell, it had no moisture. He said the seed had no root. If the seed is to grow, the ground must be kept moist. It is always the lack of constant watering that many of God's plants are withered instead of growing. A garden is a place for growth. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, Your faith groweth exceedingly. Your love groweth. He commanded all to grow in grace. Therefore God says to every one of his gardens, Be filled with the Spirit. Keep the ground moist. The water is the Spirit, whom God hath given to them that obey him. The fullness of the Spirit is the condition of his perfect working. How did David water the seed? Every one of the 176 verses of the 119th Psalm shows David's attitude toward the Word of God. He joyfully acknowledges his obligations to keep God's precepts diligently. He promised, I will keep thy statutes. He said to God, Thy word have I hid in my heart. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. I have kept thy testimonies. I have chosen the way of truth. I will run the way of thy commandments. I will observe thy laws with my whole heart. I delight in thy commandments. I will keep thy law continually forever. I will speak of thy precepts. The proud have had me greatly in derision, yet have I not declined from thy law. Thy statutes have been my song. Thou art my portion, O Lord. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I have kept thy precepts with my whole heart. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Thy law is delight. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. I will never forget thy precepts. O Lord, how I love thy law! It is my meditation all the day. 
I have refrained my feet from every evil way, that I might keep thy word. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a lamp into my path. I have sworn, and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even to the end. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. I will have respect unto thy statutes continually. I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Thy testimonies are wonderful, therefore doth my soul keep them. Many are my persecutors and mine enemies, yet do I not decline from thy testimonies. My heart standeth in awe of thy word. I rejoice in thy word as one that findeth great spoil. All these statements and many more are in the, this 119th Psalm. They show us how David watered the word. Paul said, The planter and the waterer are equal. Watering the seed is as necessary as planting it. God can't make the seed grow unless we water it. And then Paul said, It is God who made the seed grow. He made his promises for this one purpose. He always makes the seed grow when it is kept in good ground and watered. The growing comes after the watering. Jesus also said, It bringeth forth fruit. It always brings forth fruit. The intensity of all holy desire is measured by the degree of divine love which one possesses. God's desire, therefore, is as much greater than ours can be as His love is greater than ours. His benevolence is so great that His eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth, continually seeking opportunities to bless those whose attitude of heart makes it possible. What God has promised belongs to us. The justice of God requires that He make the seed grow when it is planted and watered. John says, He is faithful and just. The word just means God would be unjust to withhold from us what He promises. We have a right to what He promises us. It is a hundred percent fact that God makes every seed grow when it is planted in water. We can all prove this to our present and eternal delight. God is the best farmer in the universe. He never fails. God's time is now. The work of the imperishable seed is supernatural, and it is God alone who makes the seed grow. They often produce their wonderful results the same day they're planted. God's promises are for today. His time is always today. Hebrews 4, 7 says, Today, if ye will hear His voice, harden not your hearts. If you delay the acceptance of God's promises, you may not be alive tomorrow. The promises of God belong to us today, and we're not sure of them any other time. The only way to be sure of God's promised blessings is to accept His time. And we read in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Since now is the time that God accepts, we should accept it as our time. He commands us to hear His voice today, and says, Harden not your hearts by waiting. In Mark 11:24, Jesus said, Believe that ye receive. Literally, take it when? Now, when ye pray. Faith says before the answer is manifested, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. When you cannot see or feel, say, This is the time to trust. The results are not to be manifested until after we believe our prayer is heard. Continue to believe and say to God, Thou art now working in response to my faith. I count on thy faithfulness. The matter passes out of our hands into God's hands the moment we make a definite committal of it to God. Paul said, He is able to keep that which I have committed unto him. But God does not promise to keep anything that is not committed to him. This is the way to receive everything God has promised to us. Were the gifts of God for soul and body merely promised gifts, we would have to wait for the promiser to fulfill his promises. The responsibility would be on Him. But all of God's blessings are offered gifts as well as promised, and therefore need to be accepted. 
The responsibility for their transfer is ours. This clears God of all responsibility for any failure. What was the effect of David's attitude toward God's word, of his watering the seed? This shepherd boy, by watering the word within him, became wiser than all his teachers. His attitude toward God's word made him a man after God's own heart. It made him the world's greatest psalmist. His psalms have blessed millions during the centuries which have followed. His watering of the seed made him a divinely inspired writer. As every seed planted in turn produces more seed, so David's words in the psalms became God's imperishable seed, which have for centuries germinated in human hearts all over the world. His words have been the text for thousands of sermons. David found that meditation chews our spiritual food and gets the sweetness and nutritive value of the word into our hearts and lives. Meditation has a digesting power and turns truth into spiritual nourishment. It is the word of God which Paul says effectively worketh in us all the divine transformations from glory to glory. David said, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. By observing in heart and life the precepts of the Lord, David early in life understood more than those who lived in earlier times learned in a whole lifetime by experience. David, who started life only as a shepherd boy, by meditating and practicing divine precepts, obtained such wisdom and knowledge that he was spoken of in 2 Samuel 14:17 as an angel of God, judging right and wrong. In the same chapter, his wisdom is compared to the wisdom of an angel. He said, Thy word hath quickened me. It quickened his whole being to the extent that God's word was fulfilled in him. His life was filled with praise and thanksgiving. How much better to be the Lord's garden than the devil's. The possibilities of the imperishable seed are infinite. Nothing can be so beneficial as being God's garden. Only God can know what the eternal harvest will be. Remember that throughout your Christian life, you are God's field to be planted. Since it is so clearly revealed everywhere throughout the scriptures that the Heavenly Father wills our healing, why do some in our day who seek healing fail to receive it? This is a question in the minds of many honest inquirers. There are several answers to this question, which we will mention briefly. By these answers, many who have failed to receive healing have been able to locate their own problem themselves, after which they have been gloriously healed. The first reason is this. Insufficient instruction. Ignorance concerning the healing power of the gospel. Paul tells us that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Many have sought healing from Christ before having heard or known enough of the word of God to produce in them the steadfast faith. The early church members were in one accord in the matter of proclaiming all the gospel. They kept back nothing that was profitable. They declared all the counsel of God. We have seen that God's way of producing faith for healing is the same as that of producing faith for salvation or for any other blessing. That is, for the needy one first to learn from scriptures what is God's will in the matter. The hand of faith cannot reach out and take from God what the eye of faith does not first see to be the will of God. Jesus said, Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It is the truth of the written word that sets us free. The truth known, understood, received, acted upon, maintained, and steadfastly believed with an appropriating faith. Paul tells us that it is the word of God which effectually worketh in them that believeth. The word of God is the precious seed, the imperishable seed, the seed that has the power and which never fails to do its own work when known, received, and kept in the good ground in which alone good seed can grow. Some fail to receive healing because they are trying to get results from the seed, the word concerning healing without knowing what the word is, without giving it its free place and keeping it in the good ground in which alone it can do its work. The seed cannot work in us unless it is in us by our having known and received it. Before saying, I am the Lord that healeth thee, 
and promising to take away all their sicknesses, God first said, If thou wilt diligently hearken and do all. This means to be diligent in the matter of knowing, understanding, and practicing what God has to say in his word on the subject of healing. We must know what God offers to us before we can expect it from him. The knowledge of God's will must precede faith, for that will is to be done. Multitudes today do not know that the perfect healing of their bodies is the fully revealed will of God in his written word, the Bible. To know this is the only sufficient evidence for appropriating faith. Unless those seeking healing can say when tested, it is written, and then can quote to the adversary a promise which settles the question of God's will, their faith cannot remain steadfast. Multitudes of sufferers who have prayed for healing for years without success, because of having used in their prayer the faith-destroying phrase, if it be thy will, have afterwards been healed through the truth of God's word contained and explained in this message. The early church members were in one accord in teaching this subject. Also, they lifted up their voices to God in one accord in prayer for signs and wonders of healing, praying the prayer of faith before the sick were brought into the streets of Jerusalem. It was not the faith of a single evangelist, but the faith of the entire company of believers that brought healing to everyone in the streets of Jerusalem after Christ's ascension. You can read this yourself in Acts 5, verses 14 to 16. The majority of ministers and church members of today, through their ignorance and traditions on the subject of the ministry of healing, are opposed to it as it was taught and preached and practiced in the early church. Instead of praying with one accord for these healing results as the early church members did, the present church members as a whole have not accepted our Lord's attitude towards sickness as revealed in the Gospels. In our day, opposition often takes the place of united prayer. Unbelief takes the place of united faith. Lukewarmness takes the place of being spirit-filled, as all the early church members were. So I will ask you the question, may not the blame for the failure of some to receive healing today be largely due to the unbelieving part of the church itself, since we are members one of another? I believe you will say yes to this. Suppose it were generally believed that the day of regeneration has passed, as we so often hear it said, the day of miracles has passed. How this would hinder the work of the ministry in that part of the gospel. Christian workers could have no success in saving souls except by getting people to give up the false tradition and putting the word of God in its place. On the other hand, suppose that from infancy up we had all been taught the healing part of the gospel as definitely as the other part. In this case, I am sure, very few would have any difficulty in evidencing faith for healing. It is the word of God which produces faith for healing. Hundreds have been healed while they were listening to the truth on that subject. Others have been healed while reading printed instructions, which answered their questions and removed hindrances to their faith. The second reason why some fail to receive healing is an enlargement on what we have already said. Christ planned to carry on his healing ministry during his absence by means of the whole church, which is his body, not through an obscure member of that body. He said, These signs shall follow them, the church, not him, the individual. It was not the faith of a lone or solitary evangelist, but that of a spirit-filled church as a whole. Healing was brought to all the sick in the streets of Jerusalem after Christ had gone away and sent his successor, the Holy Spirit. Some do not like public healing services. But here God, when he had his way, had the multitudes healed right on the streets. He wanted his compassion to be made known to the world as a basis for faith. God began his works in this dispensation as he wants them continued, and that is through the whole church with every member filled and kept filled with the Holy Spirit. The greatest number of conversions, for instance, are brought about by an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and through a church in one accord. This is the way that all were healed in the streets of Jerusalem. God's wholesale dealings with men, both in saving and healing, is the outpouring of his spirit and through a spirit-filled, united and praying church. His method is revealed by the promise, I will pour out my spirit, and the statement, they were all filled with the spirit. A spirit-filled and praying church produces an atmosphere in which it is easy for God to work. 
and hard for the devil to interfere because this atmosphere is the Holy Spirit himself. He is more than a match for the devil. In the revival belt during the Finney and other great revivals, sinners were put under conviction as soon as they would step off the train where a revival was in progress. Mr. Finney tells of such a unity in prayer that every adult person on a street three miles long was saved except one. The Christians unitedly prayed for that one, and he was saved. It is true that individuals here and there are saved and healed where there are no revivals. But God's regular way is for his people all to pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We read, These all continued in one accord in prayer and supplication. How seldom do we see such a thing now? Some of our theology today causes many people to anchor in past blessings. They lack a daily renewing of the fullness which constituted the initial blessing when they as Christians were filled with the Spirit. Unless the church is filled and kept filled with the Holy Spirit, it is impossible that the spiritual atmosphere of the meetings can be what it must be if God is not to be limited or hindered. In this atmosphere produced by the whole church being filled with the Spirit and all praying for the work of Christ, the power of God is present to heal as it was in the beginning. God's way is for the whole church to be filled and kept filled with the same Holy Spirit which saved and healed those multitudes in New Testament times. The results of the fulfillment of divine promises are the same in any age. If you want to know how the Spirit acts now, just read how he acted when he had full possession of the church. The book of Acts is a blueprint by which the Holy Spirit wishes to work throughout his dispensation. As the early Christians in Acts 4 were all filled with the Spirit and all prevailed in prayer for signs and wonders of healing, so in James 5 all Christians are commanded to pray for the healing of the sick. They are to do it as earnestly as Elijah prayed for rain. When this was done in the early church, the prayer of faith by the elders was but voicing the prayer of the whole church. John says, This is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. This was proven by the whole company of Christians in the fourth chapter of the Acts. Every Christian today is commanded to be filled with the Spirit, to pray for the outpouring of the Spirit, and to prevail in prayer for the healing of the sick. Every priest should be exercising his priesthood. The failure of the majority to do this in our day pollutes the atmosphere of the meetings and makes it harder for the sick to have faith for the Holy Spirit to work. The failure of the Christians to live and walk in the Spirit limits the Holy One of Israel. Our being filled with the Spirit is the condition for His perfect working. Instead of being surrounded by this atmosphere in our day, a poor afflicted wife often is surrounded with opposition from her own family, often from her own pastor and fellow church members. So she fails to receive healing, being too weak in mind and body to fight the battle alone. The very ones who are opposing her are the ones who ought to be praying in faith for her healing. We are all to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Usually today it is the very ones who are violating these conditions which were met by the early church who are asking why some fail to receive healing. The answer is because these very doubters are making it impossible for the church to be in one accord in prayer and faith for the sick. The church is out of tune with God's program. A remarkable document was signed by 20 bishops of the Episcopal Church in the Commonwealth of Australia. It is a wonderful report of the miracles of healing manifested in the cathedrals of that church in various cities in Australia. In this report they say, the faith which is needed is not merely individual, but corporate faith. The faith of the home, of the ministry, and of the whole church the body, not alone member of it, must cooperate with Christ, its head, if its sick members are all to be healed. The most marked groups after the mission came from parishes where the wave of intercession had been highest and swept farthest. The world today is waiting for a fresh revelation of the presence and power of God in the work of the church and in the life of its members. It has already seen and felt once more the wonder of divine healing. Today, a large part of the members of the church through ignorance are opposing that for which the early church prevailed in prayer. 
They have not accepted our Lord's attitude toward sickness and have not met the conditions for the healing of the sick which God desires. It is these very hinderers who are pointing out the failures for which they themselves are largely responsible. It is not uncommon today to find those who ought to be doing the works of Christ warning the sick to stay away from places where the works of Christ are being done. Would it not be better for them to warn the people against going where confirmation or baptism or church membership or reformation are put in the place of the new birth? The third reason why some fail to receive healing from Christ is community unbelief. Although in other places Jesus worked miracles and healed all that were sick, when he came to Nazareth, his hometown, where he had been brought up, he could do no miracles there because of their unbelief. Think of it. Christ himself, under the full anointing of the Holy Ghost, was hindered by community unbelief. Since this is true, is it strange that some in any city today should fail to receive healing? God would not then allow the gift of miracles to operate through Christ, whereby their unbelief the people were making him a liar. Why should he do so today? According to Acts 14, Paul, among the heathen, had better success in working miracles than Jesus had in his hometown. The traditions which the people of today have been taught to believe in the place of the plain word of God on the subject of healing have turned the whole world into a veritable Nazareth of unbelief. I mean by that that today community unbelief is almost general. Those who preach the full gospel and pray for the sick are obliged to labor in a Nazareth of unbelief. We can get results only so far as we can get rid of the tradition of the elders concerning healing by teaching the people what the scriptures actually teach on the subject. By doing this, I boldly say that Jesus Christ, not ourselves, has had greater success in working miracles in all the cities where our revival campaigns have been conducted than he had in Nazareth, his own hometown. Now, don't misquote me. I'm not saying that we have had success. I'm talking about what Christ has done. Whenever and wherever the people have been enlightened by our ministry so as to know their privilege in the matter of healing. Did the fact that Christ could do no miracle in Nazareth prove anything but the unbelief of the people? And in passing, if, as some are teaching, the sick are to be healed without their faith, why didn't Jesus go ahead and heal the sick in Nazareth? The Bible answers, because of their unbelief. If it is proper to account for the failure of some to receive healing by calling in question Christ's willingness to heal all sick persons, then why should we not call in question his willingness to save all sinners in order to explain the fact that so many in churches are unsaved? Upon a certain occasion, only one woman in a great throng touched Jesus with faith for healing. Later on, whole multitudes did. It is a matter of enlightenment and faith. After the nine disciples had failed to deliver the epileptic boy mentioned in the Gospels, some theologian of that day, if he were like many of the theologians of these days, might have seized upon that failure and said, There, now we have proof that it is not always God's will to heal. The father wanted the boy to be healed. The boy himself wanted to be healed. And the disciples, divinely commissioned to cast out devils and heal the sick, wanted him to be healed. Under similar circumstances today, someone would say, because of such failure, it is not God's will that such a one should be healed. They would make theology out of the failure. But Jesus came down from the mountain and delivered the boy, thus proving it to be God's will to heal even when his accredited representatives have failed to heal. Why not make theology out of this? When the father of this boy said to Jesus, If thou canst do anything... Jesus refused to take the responsibility for any failure. He said, If thou canst believe. Then the father cried, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Of course, he received the help asked for and succeeded where the apostles themselves had failed, for Christ delivered the boy. Considering the fact that in the healing ministry we are compelled to labor in the face of almost universal unbelief, and that those who preach only the soul salvation part of the gospel are laboring in the midst of the almost universal acceptance of that doctrine, I think that God is giving proofs of divine healing as bright and as convincing as the proofs of regeneration 
and that with not nearly as much teaching to produce the faith. When I consider the lack of teaching on divine healing, the unspiritual condition of the churches and their general attitudes toward this part of forgotten orthodoxy, instead of wondering why some are not healed, I marvel at the success God is giving to those who pray for the sick. I have seen many deaf mutes heal when scarcely a person in the audience expected the healing. Are not the thousands who now testify that they have been divinely healed in as good health physically as the general average of professing Christians in any church are spiritually? Would not the physical health of those who testify that they have been divinely healed compare favorably with the spiritual health of those who oppose the gospel of healing? Is the average professed Christian any better proof of the doctrine of regeneration than those who testify to having been divinely healed are of the doctrine of divine healing? They ought to be because they have heard the, that part of the Word of God all their life, whereas the majority of those who we pray for, who are healed, have heard the plain teaching of the Word of God concerning divine healing for only a few days. There are many today who have been divinely healed after having been deaf and dumb from birth, who can hear better physically than the average church member can hear spiritually. I have seen many who could not walk a step until after they had been prayed for, who are now walking better physically than the average church member and Christian is walking spiritually. The average Christian all of his life has heard the word of God which teaches the healing of the soul, whereas these others have heard only a few times the word of God which teaches the healing of the body. Are all who have been baptized washed from their sins? No, but those who have faith are. And what water is in the ordinance of Christian baptism Oil is in the ordinance of anointing the sick for healing. Suppose someone should say to me, so-and-so was anointed and was not healed. I would answer, so-and-so was baptized, but was not saved, was not healed from the disease of sin. If a man should say to me, I know a man whom you anointed whose body was not healed, I would say to him, I know a man who you baptized whose soul was not healed. Thousands who have been baptized have never been regenerated. And this is infinitely worse than for a Christian to fail to receive healing for his body. Some say, if so-and-so should be healed, I will believe in divine healing. Why not be consistent then and say, if so-and-so should get saved, I will believe in salvation. This is the same as to say, I will believe so-and-so's experience in preference to God and the Bible, and the experiences of all the other thousands who have been saved and healed. After God has healed thousands from all their afflictions, why not say to him, I will not believe unless you heal one more? Would you reject the doctrine of consecration because some church members are not consecrated while thousands of others are? I heard a minister say concerning the work of another evangelist, so-and-so was anointed and prayed for, but died without being healed. Yet the same minister baptized so-and-so and took him into the church, thereby proclaiming to the world that his soul had been healed from the disease of sin, but the man died without the new birth, and his soul was lost. This is infinitely worse than for a sick person to fail to be healed, and so to die and to wake up in glory. Suppose the testimony of those of us who say we have been healed is to be rejected because, after a careful examination by a medical expert, it could be shown that we fall short of physical perfection. To be consistent, why should we not have a spiritual expert with spiritual discernments, such as the Apostle Paul had, examine those in the modern church who oppose the gospel of healing? Should the testimony of all those among those who do not measure up spiritually to what the Bible represents a healthy soul to be, be rejected? After witnessing the miraculous healing of thousands, I am convinced that the proofs of healing are as bright and convincing as are the proofs of regeneration. I do not base any doctrine on these answers to prayer. I, for one, will preach all the gospel if I never see another man saved or healed as long as I live. I am determined to base my doctrine upon the immutable word of God, not upon phenomena. No minister can get results until by preaching the word of God he can produce faith for what that word offers. 
60,000 churches in the United States reported no conversions in a whole year. But I'm not going to offer this fact as a reason for fighting the doctrine of regeneration or any other part of the gospel. Some say, we believe in healing, but we do not believe in parading it. I have noticed that some who fail to rejoice with those who succeed in receiving healing from Christ are quick to par parade a failure while saying nothing about the successes. To me, it is a mystery how any Christian can fail to rejoice when a poor afflicted person has been healed by Christ. I not only rejoice when a sufferer has been healed by Christ, but I'm glad to parade God's mercy to the world. Make known his deeds among the people is the command of God. Jesus commanded the demoniac out of whom he cast the devil to go back to his own country, to his community, and tell them what great mercy Christ had shown him. The scriptures tell us that he published throughout Decapolis this mercy of Christ. In the next chapter, we read of multitudes in Decapolis being healed by Christ. The multitudes glorified the God of Israel. Fourth, the healing part of the gospel is hindered and even made void by the traditions of men. Jesus said to the Jewish teachers of his day, Ye have made void the law by your traditions. In our day, most preachers have done worse, for they have made void a part of the gospel by their traditions. I'd like to mention seven erroneous teachings. First, one tradition is that God is the author of disease and that he wills the sickness of some of his worshipers. It is a mystery to me how anyone can hold this view in the face of the scriptures and the ministry of Christ. For three years he healed all that were oppressed of the devil, or at least all such as came to him for healing. If sickness is the will of God for his worshipers, then every physician is a lawbreaker, every trained nurse is defying the Almighty, every hospital is a house of rebellion instead of a house of mercy. If God wants one to be sick, it is a sin for that one even to want to be healed, because we are to love the will of God, whatever the will might be. Another tradition which is responsible for thousands dying a premature death after years of physical agony is the teaching that we can glorify God more by remaining sick and exhibiting patience than we can by being divinely healed. An honest but unenlightened minister will often kneel at the bedside of one suffering with arthritis or cancer or some other dangerous disease and pray, Lord, since in thy loving providence thou hast seen fit to lay thine afflicting hand upon our dear sister, give her fortitude and patience to bear this affliction. This he does instead of obeying the plain command of James 5.14 to anoint any sick in the church and to pray the prayer of faith for their healing. John Wesley said this was the only process of healing in the church until it was lost through unbelief. Now, if this is true, as many are taught, that one can glorify God more by remaining sick than by being healed, then Jesus did not hesitate to rob his father of all the glory he possibly could by healing everyone that appealed to him for help during his entire earthly ministry. And his successor, the Holy Spirit, who was sent down to augment what Christ had begun to do and teach, did not hesitate, according to Acts 5, verses 15 and 16, to rob God of all the glory he could by healing everyone in the streets of Jerusalem. Paul did not hesitate to rob God of all the glory he could by healing all the other sick on the island of Melita. The most common and threadbare tradition is the worn-out statement that the age of miracles is past. Of all the present-day traditions of the elders or ministers, this is the most foolish, illogical, and unscriptural of any that I know. The Holy Spirit, in whose age we are now living, is God's only miracle worker, the only administrator of the Father's will. He is the one who healed all the sick multitudes who came to Christ for healing during the days of his flesh. All the miracles ever wrought until the day of Pentecost were accomplished by the Spirit, the miracle worker, before he had entered officially into his own dispensation. The age in which we live was intended by our Heavenly Father to be the most miraculous of all the dispensations because it is the miracle worker's age, the Holy Spirit's dispensation. During this age, the great promise is that God will pour out the Holy Spirit, the miracle worker, upon all flesh. This is the only age in which the miracle worker would incarnate himself. 
This is the only age in which the nine gifts of the Spirit, including the gifts of faith, healing, and miracles, were to be distributed to every man severally as he, the Holy Spirit, would will. Jesus declared that the works which he was doing would be continued and that even greater works would be done by the Holy Spirit, the miracle worker. He would enter office during Christ's exaltation, during the Spirit's dispensation. How absurd and ridiculous for any professed Bible teacher to pick out this, the miracle worker's age is the only age when miracles are not to be done. How absurd for such a one to teach that the Holy Spirit will work miracles in every age but his own age. This age is a better dispensation, with a better priest, a better covenant, better promises, and better everything than any previous age. Some talk as though the present age is not the Holy Spirit's age. There is but one Spirit dispensation, and that one lies between the first and the second advents of our Lord. It is true we are living in the Laodicean or lukewarm warm period of the Spirit's dispensation. At the beginning of the age the church was in her Spirit-filled period, and we are now in the lukewarm period of the same age. But for one, and thank God there are many others like me, I'm going to base both my preaching and my practicing on the preaching and the practicing of the church during her Spirit-filled period, rather than the preaching and practicing of the church during her lukewarm period. I would rather labor to lift the true church up to the Bible standard of the first century than to try to make the Bible fit the standard of the lukewarm church of the twentieth century. In previous discourses we've seen that God has worked miracles in each of the centuries since the closing of the scriptures, down to our day, and that this worn out tradition which we are considering is entirely set aside by the facts of history. Another tradition is that it is not God's will to heal. We have answered this objection from every conceivable angle. If it is God's will to heal only some of those who need healing, then none have any basis for faith until they shall have received a special revelation that they are among the favored ones. If God's promises to heal are not for all, then no man can ascertain the will of God for himself from the Bible. Are we to understand from such teachers that we must close our Bibles and get our revelation directly from the Spirit before we can pray for the sick, because the will of God in this matter cannot be ascertained from the Scriptures? This would be virtually to teach that the whole of divine activity on the line of healing would have to be governed by direct revelations from the Spirit instead of by the Scriptures. Still others are hindered from receiving healing by being taught to add to their prayer for healing the faith-destroying phrase, If it be thy will. There is only one case given in the New Testament of one asking for healing in this way. That's the case of the leper who said, If thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. This man could not have prayed otherwise because he was not yet informed as to the will of God in this matter. Jesus did not heal this leper until he had added to his faith that Jesus would heal him. The I will of Jesus canceled the if of the leper. It is impossible for one ever to pray with faith until the if has been removed from his prayer. To have real faith is to be fully persuaded that God will do what he has promised to do. No one is ever fully persuaded when he adds to his prayer, if it be thy will. Since God has revealed his will in this matter by his promises, for us to say, if it be thy will, when praying for healing is the same as to say, if it be thy will, keep thy promise. Another unscriptural premise that has sent thousands of sufferers to premature graves and kept multitudes of others from receiving healing is the modern teaching that Paul's thorn in the flesh was some kind of physical trouble. The falsity of this position is shown in the message on Paul's thorn in the flesh. The expression thorn in the flesh is not once used in either the Old or the New Testament except as an illustration. The figure of the thorn in the flesh is not in one single instance used in the Bible as a figure of sickness. Every time the phrase is used in the Bible, it is specifically stated exactly what the thorn in the flesh was. For instance, in Numbers 33, verse 55, Moses told the children of Israel, Before they entered the land of Canaan, If ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and shall vex ye in the land wherein ye dwell. 
Here the scripture itself plainly tells us that the pricks in the eyes and the thorns in the sides of the Israelites were the spared inhabitants of Canaan, not eye trouble or sickness. God was only illustrating to show that as a thorn sticking in the flesh is annoying, so the Canaanites, if allowed to remain in the land, would be a constant annoyance to the children of Israel. And so in all the other places in the Bible where this expression is used, the thorns are personalities. As in each of the other instances, the Bible definitely states what the thorn was. So in this particular instance, Paul as definitely states what his thorn was. He said it was the messenger, the Greek word here is angelos, of Satan, or as translated by others, the angel of the devil, or Satan's angel. The Greek word angelos appears 188 times in the Bible. It is translated angel 181 times, and messenger the other seven times. In every one of the 188 times where this word is used in the Bible, it means a person, not a thing. Hell was made for the devil and his angels, and an angel or a messenger is always a person that one person sends to another, never a disease. Paul not only tells us that his thorn was an angel or messenger of Satan, but he also tells us what the angel came to do, that is, to buffet me, as when the waves buffeted the boat, and as when the soldiers buffeted Christ. Accordingly, Weymouth translates this passage in this way, Satan's angels dealing blow after blow. Since buffeting means giving repeated blows, if Paul's buffeting was a physical one, it would have had to be a succession of diseases, or the same disease many times repeated, or he could not have termed it buffeting. In speaking of this messenger or angel, Rotherham's translation uses the pronoun he. Weymouth's translation says, As to this, three times I besought the Lord to rid me of him. These two pronouns, as well as the word angel or messenger, prove that Paul's thorn was, as he himself plainly shows, a satanic personality, not a disease. Paul could not have used the personal pronoun he and him when speaking of a disease, because there's no personality to disease. Paul enumerates almost every kind of trouble one can think of as his buffeting, but disease is not on the list. In doing the unchanging will of God, Jesus healed every sick person that ever appealed to him for healing, but did not promise to take away the buffetings or persecution. Another tradition that has hindered the ministry of healing is the teaching that Jesus healed the sick as the Son of God, not as the Son of Man. Such teachers believe that as we are not Christ's, we cannot expect such works today. The Scriptures teach us that Jesus, the Son of God, emptied himself and became like unto his brethren in all things, except as to sin. He speaks of himself as the Son of Man about eighty times. As the Son of Man, he said, I can of mine own self do nothing. This certainly was not true of him before he became the Son of Man, because all things were made by him and for him. We have already seen that Jesus did his works in reliance upon the Spirit. He began both to do and teach until the day he was taken up, what he himself promised in John 14:12 to continue. In answer to the prayers of the church, when he was glorified, he did the same things. The very words here quoted from Acts 1.1, Jesus began both to do and to teach, prove that what the Lord began both in doing and teaching was to be continued by the Holy Spirit operating through the church. I assign for the failure of some to receive healing the breaking of natural laws. Let it be remembered that natural laws are God's laws and that they are as divine as are His miracles. Nature is God in action, but not miraculously. Because of their ignorance of natural laws, some are not supplying their bodies with the required nourishment. Others may be overeating while asking God to heal them of stomach trouble and thereby hindering the answer to their prayers. After God had revealed Himself as Jehovah Rapha, our healer, the conditions He imposed were that the people observe His laws of health. There are times when sufferers who are ignorant of dietetics and other simple requirements need the advice of someone who is qualified to give advice in such matters as this. 
Some are not healed because of unbelief on the part of the elder or minister who prays for them. Christ's disciples, although divinely commissioned to cast out devils and heal the sick, failed to deliver the epileptic boy. When Jesus came down from the mountain, he delivered the boy and rebuked the disciples for their unbelief. Some are not healed because their affliction is the work of an evil spirit, which must be cast out. Jesus did not heal the epileptic disease, but cast out the epileptic spirit. He also cast out the deaf and dumb and blind spirits. He says of those who believe, In my name they shall cast out demons. Many times we have seen people instantly delivered when we rebuked the afflicting spirit, merely speaking representatively in Christ's name or by his authority. Some fail to receive healing because they regard iniquity in their heart. Such ought to learn to say with David, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. God has not promised to destroy the works of the devil in the body while we are clinging to the works of the devil in the soul. Unconfessed sin hinders people from receiving God's mercy. His word tells us, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall obtain mercy. In this Laodicean period of the church, lukewarmness is one of the great hindrances to healing. After Christ was glorified, he sent down the message, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The best thing for us is to be red hot for God. The next best thing is to be cold. But it is fatal to be lukewarm. For the Lord said he would spew out the lukewarm. Lukewarmness is a much worse disease than cancer. Therefore God wants to heal lukewarmness first. He has promised and is waiting to heal our backsliding and flood our hearts with his love. God says of the man whose heart is hot with love for him, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. Serving God with gladness and cheerfulness of heart was the condition for healing in the Old Testament times. Surely the standard ought not to be lowered in this day of grace. Another reason. Sickness and affliction are permitted to remain on some as a halter with which God leads them into the center of his will. And when this has been done, he removes the halter. If God were to take the halter off too soon, many would run away, and so would deprive themselves of the pleasure of living out the divine program. It is impossible to pray the prayer of faith to get the halter off from those who are unwilling to be led into the glorious center of God's will. Another reason why people are not healed an unforgiving spirit or holding a grudge hinders some from receiving the Lord's healing. Jesus said, If ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. The first thing we need and the first thing God wants to grant us is the forgiveness of our sins. But God cannot forgive us when we will not forgive others. And if he cannot forgive us, he certainly cannot heal us. Many times we have seen the afflicted healed in the twinkling of an eye when they were ready to forgive those who had wronged them. Another reason? Wrongs unrighted hinder the faith of some to receive healing. Those who have wronged their neighbor in any way must ask his forgiveness. We have known many who terribly afflicted were healed as soon as this was done. Another reason? Some have no purpose and no diligence when seeking God for healing. God is the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We've known sufferers to undergo as many as a dozen or more operations without any positive promise of being healed. Yet in coming to God for healing, which He positively promises to give, many do not come with anything like the diligence shown by those who apply for help from men. Here's another reason. Because of not being properly instructed, many fail to be healed because they endeavor to confine God to miracles. Because they are not made well and strong in an instant, these people cast away their confidence. 
God differentiates between a miracle and a healing. If every man wasted with disease were made strong and well in a moment, there would be no healings, for they would all be miracles. When enumerating the spiritual gifts, Paul speaks of gifts of healing and also of miracles. Christ could do no miracle in Nazareth because of the unbelief of the people there, but he did heal a few sick folk there. Confusing healings with miracles is a very common hindrance to healing in these days, when there is so little clear teaching on the subject. Another reason, some wax weak in faith by watching their symptoms. Instead of doing this, like Abraham of old, they should be waxing strong in faith by looking unto the promise of God. These people make their feelings the basis of faith rather than God's word, which he has made its only basis. Sixteenth reason why some people fail to receive healing is this. Others fail to receive healing because they do not act their faith. Faith without works is dead. It is not God's turn to move until we have faith with corresponding actions. The literal translation of Mark 11.22, have faith in God, is reckon on God's faithfulness. The full exercise of faith means that we think faith, speak faith, act faith. To the blind man, Jesus said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. This act gave the man an opportunity to exercise faith in heart, mind, and body. He was not healed until he had first given this visible expression of his faith. He believed the healing was his before it was manifested. It was the same with Naaman the leper, and also with the ten lepers to whom Jesus said, Go show thyselves to the priests. The record is, as they went, they were cleansed. A visible expression of faith, including their heart, mind, and body, was required before their healing was manifested. Some miss being healed by reversing this divine order. Others, when tested, cast away their confidence, failing to see, as with Abraham, by the test their faith should be perfected, not destroyed. According to Hebrews chapter 10 verse 35, we are made partakers on the condition that we would hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. If the word of God is the reason for our faith, then it is never right to cast away our confidence in it. Another reason, some fail to receive healing by neglecting to receive the Holy Spirit who has been sent to impart to us the blessings of redemption. In Romans 8 verse 11, Paul tells us that our mortal, not actually, although judicially, dead bodies, are to be quickened by the Spirit that dwelleth in us, not outside of us. Since our bodies are the temples of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost applies the healing, we might say he is the carpenter who repairs the house. Some are consciously keeping the carpenter outside the house while asking him to repair it on the inside. Paul said, the body for the Lord, before he said, the Lord for the body. We must present our bodies a living sacrifice and let them become the temples of the Holy Ghost if we want them healed. This reason for failure does not usually apply to those who are untaught as to their privilege of being filled with the Spirit. The nineteenth reason some are not healed is because they substitute their belief in the doctrine of divine healing for personal faith to be healed. Some are not healed because of their failure to receive the written promise of God as his direct word to them. They fail to recognize that to faith the word of God is the voice of God. In Psalm 138 verse 2 we read, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Another reason, some will not believe that their prayer for healing has been heard until they have experienced and seen the answer. Christ has not promised that our healing shall begin before we believe that he has heard our prayer. Some suppose they must keep on praying and not believe that their prayer has been heard until they are well. This is exactly the opposite of what God requires. In Mark 11:24, Jesus tells us exactly the conditions he requires for our appropriation of the blessings he has promised. He says, What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. That is, ye shall have them after you believe he has heard your prayer. As Jesus said, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, while Lazarus was still dead. We should be able to say, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, 
while we are still sick? Ye shall have them is your answer from Jesus, and it is also your proof that your prayer has been heard. As we have already remarked, to faith the word of God is the voice of God. God has not promised that our healing shall begin before we believe that he has heard our prayer. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. If this is true, then we must believe that our prayer has been heard when we really pray. We must be able to say, we know we have the petition that we desire of him, not because we see the answer, but because God is faithful, who also will do it. Abraham did not keep on praying for the birth of Isaac until the child was born. Instead, he kept on believing and glorifying God for his word on the matter. More than once we have read that it was after Solomon had made an end of praying that the blessing came. Jesus, at the grave of Lazarus, had made an end of praying and had said, I thank thee that thou hast heard me before Lazarus came out from his tomb. Jehoshaphat and the children of Israel made an end of praying and were all praising God with a loud voice for the answer to their prayers before they went out to do battle with the three great armies. Their faith was the evidence or assurance of things not yet seen. One hundred and twenty had made an end of praying and were all continually praising and blessing God when the Spirit was poured out upon them. It is supposed to be the end of praying when one has been anointed for healing. And if one who has been anointed really has faith, he will hear nothing from him but thanksgiving until he has been healed. When a child teases her mother for a new dress, the mother says, I will get it for you. The child makes an end of teasing before there is any dress in sight. Instead of continuing to say, please give me a dress, she says, goody, goody. In other words, she believes she's going to have it. Perhaps I should say here that after commitment, one must not become indifferent. One's trust must remain active, like that of the children of Israel when they marched around the walls of Jericho and blew the ram's horns and like that of Jehoshaphat and his men, who after they had made an end of praying went out to battle, singing praises to God. The healing of the ten lepers came while their trust was still active. God said to the dying Israelites, Every one that looketh shall live. This word looketh is in the continuous present tense. It is not a mere glance, but a continuous stare. Moses endured by seeing, continuously seeing him who is invisible. It was a steadfast faith that brought the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Abraham waxed strong in faith by looking continuously unto the promise of God. If we allow our trust to become inactive, it will weaken. If we keep it active, it will continually grow stronger. Our final and our twenty-second reason why some fail to receive healing from Christ is some hinder God by basing their faith on their improvement after prayer rather than upon his promises. They do not realize that there is no other reason for faith as good as the word of God and that God wants to train every Christian to believe him when everything they see except his promise is to be contrary. Amen and amen. I read from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in the infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. One of the most prevalent objections raised today against the ministry of healing is Paul's thorn in the flesh. One traditional idea has led to another. There is widespread teaching that God is the author of disease, and that he has desired that some of the most devout of his children shall remain sick and glorify him by exhibiting fortitude and patience. 
No doubt this has led to the idea that Paul had a sickness that God refused to heal. We do not believe that anyone who would take time to read all that God has to say on the subject of healing could ever form such a conclusion. I am quick to admit that equally devout men may hold contrary views, not only on this point, but on the whole subject of divine healing. It is merely a matter of study and investigation. Many good men whose teachings have been that the age of miracles is past while reading the scriptures have thoughtlessly passed over the Bible teaching on healing, believing it was not applicable for our day. Before considering the subject of Paul's thorn, we quote the following from a stenographic report of an absurd sermon preached by a prominent New York clergyman. Quote, the fact is, Paul was sick. He was the sickest of men. He had one of the worst and most painful oriental diseases. He had ophthalmia, a disease of the eyes. The proof that he had it is overwhelming. He tells us that he had a thorn in the flesh. When Paul stood before them, his eyes filled with unspeakable pus, unspeakable looking matter running down over his face. Why would they have digged out their eyes for him except that his eyes, as he stood before them, were a pitiable and appealing sight to them, as the eyes of anyone with ophthalmia are? The particular pain of this disease is that it is like a stake in the eyes. It is beyond dispute that Paul was a sick man. He says so himself. Paul did not get his disease by infection. How did he get it? Jesus Christ gave it to him. Paul did not want to be sick. He prayed for the Lord to heal him from this sickness. He prayed not once nor twice, but three times. He received no answer to his prayers. In spite of all his praying, he got no healing. His thrice offered prayer brought him no cure, not even the hint of healing. That is not all. The Lord said to Paul a very startling thing. He said, My grace is sufficient for thee. He tells Paul it is better for him to be sick than to be well. He tells Paul it is the divine will he shall not be cured. He tells Paul divine power can and will operate in and through him better with ophthalmia and sickness than without it. Hear what Paul has to say in response to the Lord concerning his infirmity and the will of the Lord that he shall not be cured. These are his words. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Here is Paul saying just this, I will glory in my ophthalmia. My eyes may be full of repulsive discharges. I may be the object of pity. No matter, I will glory in it. I will rejoice in my sickness. In the quivering flesh and painful suffering of his apostle, the Lord has written his divine protest against this unspeakable doctrine, this brutal transmutation of the cross of Christ into a center of physical healing. Now, in answering our brother's arguments on this point, we will state first that the expression thorn in the flesh is not once used in either the Old or the New Testaments except as an illustration. The figure of the thorn in the flesh is not in one single instance used in the Bible as a figure of sickness. Every time the expression is used in the entire Bible, it is specifically stated exactly what the thorn in the flesh was, as we shall see. For instance, in Numbers 33, verses 55, Moses told the children of Israel before they entered the land of Canaan, If ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Here the scripture itself plainly tells us that the pricks in the eyes and the thorns in the sides of the Israelites were the inhabitants of Canaan, not eye trouble or sickness. These teachers contend that Paul's thorn must have been a bodily affliction because Paul says that the thorn was in the flesh. I answer that in the case of these Israelites, the scripture says pricks in your eyes and thorns in your side. <laughs> but this does not mean that God was to stick Canaanites in their eyes and sides, with their heels dangling outside. God was only illustrating to show that as a thorn sticking in the flesh is annoying, so the Canaanites would, if left remaining, 
be a constant annoyance to the children of Israel. Again, Joshua, eight years later, says in the twenty-third chapter concerning the heathen nations in Canaan, They shall be scourges in your side and thorns in your eyes. So we see again that the scourges in their sides and the thorns in their eyes were Canaanites, and not sore eyes or sword sides. It is here again, as in all other instances, plainly stated what the thorn was. Among the last words of David we read, The sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns. Without an exception, in all these cases the thorns are personalities. As in each of these instances it definitely states what the thorn was, so Paul definitely states what his thorn was. He says it was the messenger, the Greek word angelos, or Satan, or as translated by others, the angel of the devil, or Satan's angel. This Greek word, angelos, appears 188 times in the Bible and is translated angel 181 times and messenger the other seven times. In all the 188 times in the entire Bible, it is in every case a person and not a thing, without a solitary exception. Hell was made for the devil and his angels, or messengers. And an angel or a messenger is always a person that one person sends to another, never a disease. Paul not only tells us what his thorn was, an angel of Satan, but he also tells us what the angel came to do, to buffet me, or as Rotherham translates it, that he might be buffeting me. Now the word buffet means blow after blow, as when the waves buffeted the boat, and as when they buffeted Christ. Accordingly, Weymouth translates Satan's angel dealing blow after blow. Since buffeting means repeated blows, if Paul's buffeting was a disease, it would have had to have been many diseases or the same disease many times repeated to be called buffeting. In speaking of this messenger or angel, Rotherham's translation uses the pronoun he, and Weymouth's translation states, as for this, three times I besought the Lord to rid me of him. Both of these translators use the personal pronouns he and him when speaking of Paul's thorn. So these two pronouns, as well as the word angel or messenger, prove that Paul's thorn was, as he himself plainly shows, a satanic personality, not a disease. We could not use the personal pronouns he or him when speaking of ophthalmia or any other disease, because there's no sex to ophthalmia. Suppose I should ask a man how his cancer was. <laughs> what would you think if you heard him reply, him is lots worse and I'm suffering terribly? Now since Paul distinctly states that his thorn was the angel of Satan sent to buffet him, a demon spirit sent from Satan to make trouble for him wherever he went, why should we say that it's something else. Soon after Paul's conversion, God said to Ananias, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake, not by sickness, but by the persecutions which Paul enumerates as his buffetings. Paul had persecuted the Christians from place to place, and now he himself was beginning to experience the same and greater persecutions. Specifying the buffetings instigated by Satan's angel, Paul goes on to say, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Paul first mentions infirmities, for he realized, and every Christian should realize, his weakness and inability in his own strength to stand up against a satanic messenger and to pass triumphantly through reproaches, necessities, persecutions, distresses, and all the other buffetings he elsewhere catalogues. This is why he besought the Lord three times to be rid of him, the messenger, who was buffeting him so severely and in so many ways. Christ responded to his thrice-repeated prayer, not by removing the satanic messenger, but by saying, My grace, which is for the inner man, is sufficient for thee for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When Paul saw that the grace of God was sufficient to strengthen him and to bear all these things, he exclaimed, Therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities or weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me, 
for when I am weak, then am I strong. How could it be that Christ's strength was made perfect in Paul's weakness if he was left weak? Or unless Paul was an actual partaker of Christ's strength, which would remove the weakness, whether it was physical or spiritual? Without God's strength being imparted to him, is a man powerful when he is weak, either physically or spiritually? Paul saw that the grace of God given him made his very buffetings, even his imprisonments, to work together for his good and to turn out for the furtherance of the gospel. What servant of God has not learned, and probably more than once, that it is when he is most conscious of his own weakness in himself that he is the strongest because of depending not on his own but on divine strength? Paul is clear in teaching that it is the life of Jesus which is made manifest in our mortal flesh. But it is nowhere stated in scriptures that God gives grace to our bodies. The very word grace shows that it was the inner man that needed help, because the grace of God is imparted only to the inner man. Paul says in his case that the inner man was renewed day by day. In other words, grace is for spiritual infirmities not for physical. While the terms in the Old Testament pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides were used, Canaanites were not an annoyance to the Israelites in the sense of inflicting any physical disease or infirmities upon their bodies. As the annoying Canaanites were outside the bodies of the Israelites, so Satan's angel was outside of Paul's body. Surely the apostle had no demon inhabiting his body. God's grace and mercy have always been given to enable us to bear our persecutions and temptations, but not to bear our sins and our sicknesses, which he bore for us. God has never promised to take away from Christians their external buffetings, afflictions, and temptations. He gives us grace to bear them. But throughout history, he has ever been ready to take away the internal or bodily oppressions of the devil as well as our sins. Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. God tells us, they that will live godly in this present world shall suffer persecution, but he has never said, they shall remain sick, according to the unscriptural views held by many today. This view denies all scriptural precedent. No doubt Paul got the expression thorn in the flesh from reading the Old Testament scriptures, and because the term illustrated their external and not their bodily annoyances. He used the same expression to illustrate his own buffetings. If the infirmities or weaknesses of which Paul here speaks were physical, and Paul was the sickest of men, and God would not remove the thorn, how could he labor more abundantly than them all? If the sickest of men can accomplish more work than a well man, then let us all pray for sickness in order that we also might do more work for God. After realizing that God's strength was made perfect in his weakness, then Paul could take pleasure not only in his infirmities but also in the buffetings which he mentions, reproaches, necessities, persecution, and distresses. Note here, among other things, that Paul mentions necessities, meaning his financial buffetings, which he also refers to in his first letter to the Corinthians written a year before. He says in 1 Corinthians 4.11, Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst. We are naked and buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. This shows that Paul's idea of buffetings was not a permanent sickness. Paul enumerates his buffetings. If Paul's thorn was ophthalmia or sore eyes, which he does not mention, instead of these reproaches, which he does mention, why does he not say he takes pleasure in the former instead of in the latter. Not only here, but elsewhere in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul enumerates in detail his bufferings instigated by Satan's angel. In addition to the reproaches, necessities, persecution, and distresses mentioned in our text, the sixth chapter of this same letter, he mentions stripes, imprisonments, tumults, labors, watchings, fastings, dishonor, evil report, deceivers, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, 
as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, but possessing all things. In the eleventh chapter, stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A day and a night in the deep. In journeyings, often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, reviled, persecuted, defamed, made as the filth of the earth, the off-scouring of all things unto this day. Here are some questions worth considering. Who but Satan's angel could be responsible for all these sufferings? In enumerating them, we see that Paul mentions almost everything that one could think of except sickness or ophthalmia. The one thing which he does not mention and which is conspicuous for its absence, tradition seizes upon and says, this was his thorn. Why do these opposers substitute sore eyes or sickness, neither of which Paul mentions, for all these buffetings which he does mention? Although it is believed by many good men, one writer remarks that this widespread perversion of the scriptures dealing with Paul's thorn in the flesh is certainly inspired by Satan, because it gives him the privilege of carrying on his evil work of afflicting and tormenting the bodies of humanity. Since healing is an essential element of the gospel, how could Paul enjoy the fullness of the blessing of the gospel as he did and remain sick? Is not healing a part of the blessing of the gospel? Even such conservative scholars as those constituting the Episcopalian Commission on Healing agree that bodily healing is an essential element of the gospel. Suppose that Paul was the sickest of men, suffering with ophthalmia. Is it not strange that when the Ephesians saw the pus running down Paul's eyes and found that God would not heal him, this sight gave them faith for special miracles to be wrought in their behalf? It is stated in Acts 19, 11 and 12 that God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out. The scriptures never speak of special miracles in connection with any but this sickest apostle. Today, if handkerchiefs were brought from one suffering with ophthalmia, Rather than laying them on the sick for healing, we would burn them to keep from spreading the infection. Again, when the heathen cripple at Lystra heard Paul preach the gospel and got a glimpse of Paul's eyes, which according to some had repulsive discharges, the sight at once gave him faith to walk for the first time on earth. Paul, perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and he walked. This heathen cripple had never witnessed a miracle nor ever heard the gospel preached until he heard it from the sickest of men whom God wills shall not be cured. Again, is it not marvelous how Paul with unspeakable pus, unspeakable looking matter running down his face, the sickest of men, suffering with the worst and most painful of oriental diseases, a pitiable and appealing sight to them, and Jesus gave it to him, telling him, It is the divine will, he shall not be cured. I say, Is it not marvelous how Paul, in this condition, could make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, from Jerusalem round about unto Illyricum? Romans 15, verses 18 and 19. Again, on the island of Melita, after seeing Paul's unsightly disease, which must remain because divine power can and will operate in and through him better with ophthalmia and sickness than without it, first the father of Publius and then all the other sick on the island came and were cured. Acts 28, verses 8 and 9 from Weymouth's translation. Do the sick glory in sickness? In the report we quoted, the brother says, 
Paul is saying just this, I will glory in my ophthalmia. My eyes may be full of repulsive discharges, I may be the object of pity, no matter I will glory in it. I will rejoice in my sickness. Since these men teach it is right for Paul to glory in his being the sickest of men, why do they not also glory in their sicknesses instead of doing their best to get rid of it? If they glory in their thorn, why have some gone to a surgeon to have it cut out? Some teachers hold that Paul's thorn was a partial blindness caused by the brightness of the divine light that shone upon him at his conversion. He himself tells us in the year 60, when he wrote this epistle, that it was above 14 years ago that he received the abundance of the revelations which occasioned the giving of the thorn in the flesh. This made it 12 years after his conversion that the thorn was given, this epistle having been written 26 years after his conversion. And again, it would be well-nigh blasphemy to speak of a partial blindness caused by a personal glimpse of the glorified Christ as the messenger of Satan. Why did Paul have a thorn? Paul distinctly states that his buffeting by the messenger was given him lest he should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. Is it because of the abundance of their revelations that the sick everywhere today must be taught to regard their sickness as a thorn which must remain lest they be exalted? Since Paul's thorn was no hindrance to his faith, for healing of all the other sick people on the island of Melita and elsewhere, why should it hinder ours? Why should it be taught today everywhere as a hindrance to what little faith for healing the sick may have received? The Bible says faith cometh by hearing, but in these days faith leaveth by hearing, hearing these foolish doctrines. The widespread error concerning Paul's thorn in the flesh severs the gospel and entirely removes the foundation upon which for faith for healing must rest. The sick one must seemingly receive from the Spirit and not from the Bible a special revelation that he is to be healed. We have noticed from the writings of these teachers that they are quick to mention the slightest physical defect in those who teach healing and are seeing the sick healed. Yet they themselves, and it was proper for Paul, who is the most outstanding New Testament teacher of all, to have, as they contend, the thorn of bodily affliction. If we could duplicate Paul's wonderful ministry of healing, while unspeakable pus was all the time running from our eyes, would not this be seized upon by these very teachers as a ground for ridicule? The scriptures show that Paul's thorn did not hinder him from laboring more abundantly than all others. But those who are taught that their sickness is a thorn that must remain are often incapacitated by their thorn from any labor. They are often not even able to care for themselves, but must increase other people's labors by having to be waited upon. It was the Apostle Paul who wrote that we may be prepared under every good work, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, zealous of good works, careful to maintain good works, and perfect in every good work to do his will. How can the multitude of Christians confined to their sick rooms by a thorn in the flesh abound unto every good work? Do these several scriptures belong only to well Christians? If Christ's words, my grace is sufficient, mean that he is telling Paul to remain sick, it would be the first and the only instance in the Bible in which God ever told anyone to keep his disease. The very fact of it being a solitary exception would prove the rule, and what the scriptures abundantly show that he healed all others. Why do so many teachers today reverse the scriptures and make Paul's thorn the prominent point when discussing healing, and keep on the background the universal policy of healing revealed throughout the history recorded in the Bible? Paul's thorn did not hinder him from finishing his course for God, 2 Timothy 4.7. While present-day teaching concerning Paul's thorn has sent multitudes, often after many years of terrible suffering, to premature graves with their course only half run. This is a constantly recurring and horrible tragedy. If the afflicted who believe this latter-day teaching will follow Paul by praying until God speaks to them and tells them, as they think he did Paul, that he wants them to keep their afflictions and gives the reason for it, we would quickly say, Amen.
we love the will of God. In Galatians 4.13, Paul does say, You know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. Probably the infirmity here was physical, but at the first does not mean that he remained sick. Does it not mean the opposite? Else why would he say at the first? Probably, as some scholars believe, this was just after his stoning at Lystra. After Paul, in the plainest word, tells us what his thorn was, how strange that ministers today should say it is something else and use it against the scriptural doctrine of healing. Paul himself was the greatest teacher on this subject among the apostles and other writers of the New Testament. Paul's preaching stimulated faith. For instance, it was the gospel Paul preached in Ephesus that gave faith for the special miracles of healing we have mentioned. He said concerning his own preaching there, I have kept back nothing that was profitable to you. If all preachers today would keep back nothing that was profitable, they would surely all be teaching healing. In Romans 15, verses 18 through 20, it was Paul who said he fully preached the gospel of Christ. He preached the full gospel and made the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, from Jerusalem round about unto Illyricum. Twenty-five years after he had become an apostle, he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11.30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you. If Paul's thorn was physical infirmity, or he was sick, they would probably write back to him asking, For what cause are you weak and sickly? It was Paul who wrote in 2 Corinthians 4.11, Know ye not that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Ghost, the members of Christ, members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, that we have the first fruits of the Spirit and first fruits of our spiritual and physical salvation, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. He says in Romans 8, verse 11, that the Spirit shall also quicken your mortal, not dead bodies. He is the Savior of the body, the Lord for the body, and the body for the Lord. Paul is the apostle who wrote unto the church of God which is at Corinth, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. God hath set some in the church, miracles, gifts of healing. These gifts and callings of God are without repentance, that is, they are not revoked. All are commanded to covet earnestly the best gifts. Paul did not believe, as men are teaching today, that these blessings were confined to Israel. He did believe that the middle wall of partition was broken down, that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, but that we are all one in Christ Jesus. Accordingly, he heals the Gentile at Lystra, crippled from birth, the same as Peter and John did the Jewish cripple at the beautiful gate. Paul also believed that the Old Testament types were written for our admonition. He believed that to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, that if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3, verse 29. It was Paul who taught that it was in him that all the promises of God are yea and amen, to the glory of God by us. In other words, that all the promises of God, including all of his promises to heal, owe their existence and power to the substitutionary work of Christ for us. That the redeeming work of Christ was for all. Accordingly, the very last chapter of Acts, Acts 28, verse 9, shows us that Paul believed and proved that it was God's will to heal not some of them, but all the sick people on the island of Melita. Paul differentiated between miracles and healing, and therefore did not believe in every person being instantly made whole. He left Trophimus at Miletum sick, and Epaphroditus was sick nigh unto death for the gospel's sake or from overwork. He did not recover instantaneously. Paul was not a fanatic concerning the natural laws of health, which are as divine as God's miracles. He did not hesitate to recommend the fruit of the vine in the place of water alone for Timothy's stomach trouble. Paul believed in the sick themselves having faith for healing. He did not say to the cripple, Stand upright on thy feet, until he had perceived that he had faith to be healed. Jesus himself could do no miracle in Nazareth because of community unbelief. Let us look at a resume of these facts. 
Is it not strange how any minister can set aside the whole Bible as far as the subject of healing is concerned, keeping in the background God's redemptive and covenant name, Jehovah Rapha, God's covenant of healing, the teaching and promises of healing in the Old Testament types, the universal precedent of healing set throughout the history of the Old Testament, the words, teaching, commands, promises, and healing ministry of Christ by which he revealed the will of God for our bodies, the gifts of healing set in the church, the church ordinance of anointing which is commanded, the fact that Christ bore our sicknesses as well as our sins on Calvary, the multiplied thousands of those healed since the days of the apostles, down to and including our days in particular. Is it not strange that they can set all of this aside and when speaking on the subject of healing, choose as their text the scripture concerning Paul's thorn which scholars admit they cannot prove has any reference to either sickness or healing. In this fifteenth and final lesson on Christ the Healer, we would like to ask thirty-one questions concerning the gospel of healing. 1. Since the seven compound names of Jehovah, one of which Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that healeth thee, reveal his redemptive relationship toward each person, do they not point to Calvary? 2. Since all the promises of God are yea and amen in him, do not these seven names, including Jehovah Rapha or the Lord our healer, owe their existence and their power to the redeeming work of Christ on the cross? 3. Has not every believer the same redemptive right to call upon Christ as Jehovah Rapha, the healer of his body, as he has to call upon him as Jehovah Tzidkenu, the healer of his soul? Is not his name given for healing as long as it is for salvation? 4. If bodily healing is to be obtained independent of Calvary, as opposers teach, why was it that no blessing of the year of Jubilee was to be announced by the sounding of the trumpet until the Day of Atonement? 5. If healing for the body was not a part of Christ's redeeming work, why were types of the Atonement given in connection with healing throughout the Old Testament? 6. If healing was not in the Atonement, why were the dying Israelites required to look at a type of the Atonement for bodily healing? If both forgiveness and healing came by a look at the type, why not from the antitype? 7. Since their curse was removed by the lifting up of the type of Christ, was not our curse of disease also removed by the lifting up of Christ himself as seen in Galatians 3.13? 8. In the passage of Isaiah 53.4 where it says, Surely he hath borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Why are the same Hebrew verbs for born and carried employed, as are used in the verses 11 and 12 for the substitutionary bearing of sin, unless they have the same substitutionary and expiatory character? 9. If healing was not provided for all in redemption, how did the multitudes obtain from Christ what God did not provide? 10. If the body was not included in redemption, how can there be a resurrection? How can corruption put on incorruption or mortality put on immortality, were not the physical as well as the spiritual earnests or foretastes of our coming redemption enjoyed by God's people throughout history? 11. Why should not the last Adam take away all that the first Adam brought upon us? 12. Since the church is the body of Christ, does God want the body of Christ sick? Is it not his will to heal any part of the body of Christ? If not, why does he command any sick in it to be anointed for healing? 13. Are human imperfections of any sort, be they physical or moral, God's will, or are they man's mistakes? 14. Since the body is for the Lord, a living sacrifice unto God, would he not rather have a well body than a wrecked one? If not, how can he make us perfect 
in every good work to do his will, or have us thoroughly furnished unto every good work. 15. Since bodily healing in the New Testament was called a mercy, and it was mercy and compassion that moved Jesus to heal all who came to him, is not the promise of God still true, he is plenteous in mercy unto all that call upon him? 16. Does not the glorious gospel dispensation offer as much mercy and compassion to its sufferers as did the darker dispensations? If not, why would God withdraw this mercy and this Old Testament privilege from a better dispensation with its better covenant? 17. If, as some teach, God has another method for our healing today, why would God adopt a less successful method for our, our better dispensation? 18. Since Christ came to do the Father's will, was not the universal healing of all the sick who came to him a revelation of the will of God for our bodies? 19. Did not Jesus emphatically say in John 14, verses 12 and 13, that he would continue his same works in answer to our prayers while he is with the Father? Is not this promise alone complete answer to all opposers? 20. Why would the Holy Spirit, who healed all the sick before his dispensation began, do less after he entered into office on the day of Pentecost? Or did the miracle worker enter office to do away with miracles? 21. Is not the book of the Acts of the Holy Ghost a revelation of the way he wants to continue to act through the church? 22. How can God, according to Galatians 3.13, justify us and at the same time require us to remain under the curse of the law, which Jesus redeemed us from by bearing it for us on the cross. 23. Since the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil, has he now relinquished this purpose which he retained even during the bloody sweat of Gethsemane and the tortures of Calvary? Or does he now want the works of the devil in our bodies to continue that which he formerly wanted to destroy? Does God want a cancer, a plague, a curse, the works of the devil in the members of Christ? In 1 Corinthians 6.15 we read, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? 24. Are the proofs of divine healing, numbering over 200,000 who have testified through the years of our ministry, less bright and convincing than the proofs of spiritual redemption among professed Christians today? Are not these who have been healed in better health physically than a like number of professed Christians are spiritually? Would not the physical health of those compare favorably with the spiritual health of even the same number of ministers of our day? 25. Would not the argument commonly employed against divine healing, drawn from its failures, if employed against justification, regeneration, and all the rest, be simply overwhelming? 26. Does not the fact that Christ could do no miracle at Nazareth prove anything except the unbelief of the people? Would it be right to conclude because of the failure of Christ's disciples to cast out the epileptic spirit from the boy that it was not God's will to deliver him? Christ proved by healing him that it is God's will to heal even those who fail to receive it. 27. Is not God as willing to show the mercy of healing to his worshipers, as he is to show the mercy of forgiveness to his enemies, according to Romans 8, verse 32? 28. If Paul, as a New York minister said, was the sickest of men suffering from ophthalmia of the eyes, or if, as others teach, his thorn in the flesh was physical weakness instead of what Paul himself says it was, Satan's angel inflicting the many buffetings which Paul enumerates, how could he labor more abundantly than all the other apostles? Since he had strength to do more work than all the others, how could his weaknesses be physical? Since Paul's thorn did not hinder his faith for the universal healing of all the rest of the sick uh, on the island of Melita, why should it hinder ours? Would not Paul's failure to be healed, if he was sick, hinder the universal faith of these heathen for their healing? Why do traditional teachers substitute ophthalmia of the eyes or sickness, neither of which Paul mentioned, for the reproaches, necessities, persecution, distresses, 
and all the other buffetings at the hands of Satan's angel, which he does mention. If the former constitutes his thorn, why does he not say he takes pleasure in the former instead of in the latter? How could Paul, sick in body or with the unsightly disease of ophthalmy of the eyes, and unable to be healed, make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed through mighty signs and wonders? Romans 15, verses 18 and 19. If sickness is the will of God, then would not every physician be a lawbreaker, every trained nurse be defying the Almighty, every hospital a house of rebellion instead of a house of mercy, and instead of supporting hospitals, should we not then do our utmost to close them? Since Jesus in the Gospels never commissioned anybody to preach the Gospel without commanding them to heal the sick, how can we obey this command if there is no Gospel? or good news of healing to proclaim to the sick as a basis for their faith? Or since faith is expecting God to keep His promise, how can there be faith for healing if God has not promised it? And since the Bible is full of promises of healing, are they not all gospel or good news to the sick? Since faith comes by hearing, the Word, how can the sick have faith for healing if there is nothing for them to hear? 31. Could the loving heart of the Son of God, who had compassion upon the sick, and healed all who had need of healing, cease to regard the sufferings of his own when he had become exalted at the right hand of the Father? This concludes this tape and this series of messages. May God bless his word to your heart, and may your faith increase from glory unto glory.